be me. Eight to ten years old or so. Dad is taking me to meet some of his colleagues. It's a kind of hoity-toity business gathering at a nice library. I wasn't supposed to come along, so Dad warns me to be on my best behavior. I was worried I wasn't dressed fancy enough. It's pretty boring, but the people are nice enough. Dad introduces me to a few people he knows. One guy in particular stood out, as he was wearing an emerald green suit. The people around were dressed in nice clothes as well, but this guy had a green suit on. Dad tells me that this man is probably the smartest and wealthiest person in the room. The green man takes a great interest in me, because I was known for being a bit precocious, and I was pretty articulate for a kid, I guess. He asked me a litany of strange questions about history and science, and my opinion on some geopolitical topics. It was absurd, but I was the kind of kid that knew about these sort of things, and I absorbed information like a sponge. I was basically repeating back to him things I had read in a book or seen on TV that seemed to be authoritative. If he asked me about something I didn't know about, I told him as much. That seemed to please him, since I wasn't pretending to be more knowledgeable than I was. He continues questioning me, but then something strange happens. I can hear his voice saying something different than what his mouth is saying. I can hear his voice in my head. I'm very confused. As precocious as I was, I had no idea people could do that, so I was a bit surprised. None of the adults freaked out, so I assumed I was just a little slow on the uptake. The green man smiles at my confusion, but then excuses himself in a bit of a hurry. The gathering ends and we end up leaving. On the drive home, I ask my dad about the man in the green suit, and he has no idea what I'm talking about. I try to explain that he literally introduced me to a man dressed in a green suit, but dad doesn't recall this. I'm left wondering how he could forget that. Be me, 11 years old, at friend's birthday sleepover party, morning of the second day, watching a movie, pause movie to fuck around, making jokes and talking. Suddenly get this terrible feeling, overwhelmed by a sudden overwhelming sense of cosmic horror. The sound of my friends laughing and talking fades away like they're underwater. This is wrong. Everything is wrong. This isn't real. The world isn't real. Something horrible is coming. It's going to kill us all. I have to warn them. But how? I don't even know what is coming. It's pointless anyway. Our end is inevitable. Feel like the entire world is falling away all around me. Oh God. Nobody knows. I'm the only one who knows. I can't save anyone. My dad is going to die. What do I do? Burst into tears because it's all I can do. Come to with my friends huddled around me, asking if I'm okay. I'm not okay, but I do feel a little better. The world feels real again. Call my dad and ask him to take me home ASAP. Very quiet until he shows up, not feeling very festive anymore. When dad asked me why I wanted to come home early, I didn't even know where to begin. I just felt sick and wanted to come home. I'm pretty sure this was just a panic attack or something. I was an anxious kind of kid, so it's not unlikely. Still, it fucked me up so badly that I remember it clear as day, 16 years later. It makes me want to go back in time and hug little me. Poor kid got all kinds of fucked up by that experience. First story. Be me. 13 or so and start creating horror stories. Create a pantheon of evil beings and so much more. Create one who is basically a nymph who was discarded by the gods. Wore a white mask, red dress, and white mask decorated in blood. 
basically a symbol for sin itself. Become obsessed with said being. Over the years, become more and more obsessed. Had two moments where my mind breaks and feels like she is physically there. Be me now 18 and she is basically on my mind day after day. I hate her and the more I look into, the more I fear I created an actual being. Second story. Be me like eight. Camping in some park in Texas. Think it was maybe Garner, I don't know. Go down smaller trail. Parents bought me a bug vacuum since I've always been obsessed with capturing bugs. It's by a river, so the entire time I look at said river. Try catching all sorts of bugs with vacuum and fail horribly, cause well, not what it was designed to be. It's cheap and sold in masses. Eventually see a dragonfly. Look closer and notice it's in a humanoid shape. Picture a blue dragonfly, but in a human-like shape, and its head is replaced with a human, featureless face. I am mesmerized and eventually snap back to reality and try catching it with my vacuum. Fail horribly, of course. Tell parents and they just laugh it off and make jokes the entire time. Years later, see a video of a family in their backyard. Find an exact replica of said creature, but it's in a more stick bug like appearance. Food story. Be me. Lived in a huge neighborhood in rural Texas by a national park. See all types of weird shit. Large glowing light that just pops up and slings itself into the air, fading away by my house. UFO sightings all the time. White like creature on the tree. Usual spoopy sounds in the forest. Emu that just shows up in my neighbor's yard. Weird colored feathers that just show up. Blue with some purple on it. And so much more. And that's not counting what my dad saw growing up in that area. Two moments stick out the most. Rand and Arica become a huge hit app. And I don't know, basically you say a thing and it will take you to it. Use it with my sister. We decide to do nothing spooky and just try normal shit. And you know what? It worked. But when we used it for spooky shit, I decided to do demon and it sent us outside. So I went outside by myself. Sister was called to do something by my mom. And right where it told me to go, I see a blood red light shining. Instantly book it and run inside. Tell sis and she looks outside and sees nothing and neither do I. Afterwards, get a borderline addiction with app. Use it again at church, same forest, and decide to do evil, and it places right outside the border of the church. Do it again, but say skinwalker, and again, places it out of border, but close to the other side, and keep repeating skinwalker, and does a literal circle around the church. Eventually, stop, since we were all called in for church. Be me at 16. A friend invites me to smoke. Friend suggests we go to a cut. I don't know where it is, so I agree and follow. We walk across town and stop at an abandoned house by my old middle school. Instant bad feeling. There were lots of rumors about the house. The home owners allegedly took their own lives. A girl from another school went missing some years prior. Last seen by the house. I'm already creeped out, but I want to get high, so I go in anyway. The inside is dark. All the windows and doors are boarded. We had to get in and out by climbing through a hole in one of the walls. Graffiti and broken glass everywhere. We sit amid the debris and smoke. While we're there, I can hear noises from inside the darkness. Scratching. Creaking. We shine a phone light down the dark hole, but something weird happened. The house was small, but the darkness inside was deep. The hallway beside the room where we were looked like it went on forever. More noises. More scratching. Louder than before. I'm starting to freak out, but say nothing 
because my friends would talk shit. My friend says we should explore the house, see if there's anything valuable in it. I'm at my limit, too creeped out. I make up an excuse and say I need to go home, and we leave. While we're walking back, I ask him if he heard the sounds in the house. What noises, man? I didn't hear anything. I dropped the matter, and we part ways. Neither of us went to the house again after that. OP here. I'm on mobile, so deal with it. Be me. 7 to 8, early 2000s. Visit some butt fuck nowhere with dad. Mom is in a wheelchair, so we rarely took her on stuff like that. First day was normal. We go to eat waffles and take a swim in the nearby lake. On our way to the hotel, see a clown. Don't really think about it much. Go to sleep. Wake up at like 3am and hear creepy laughter. Be too much of a bitch pussy to check it out. Just pretend everything is fine and go back to sleep eventually. Day two was actually normal. Day three as well. But on the way back from the lake, we stopped at a McDonald's for food. While shoveling this crap into my mouth, I notice a clown next to our car. Tell dad. He gets spooked hard and calls the cops. They tell him to fuck off because they don't care about a fucking clown. Eat and go to car. Notice that the fucker left a note. My face went. It's a party invitation. My face went. It has my name on it. My face went. Party is tomorrow. In the woods. Next to our hotel. Now originally, we were supposed to have five days of fun and return in the early morning of day six. But we decided to pack up and fuck off from there on the morning of day four. Night from day three to four. Hear creepy shit. Like nails on a chalkboard and some weird screeching. Can't sleep all night because of that. Morning of day four. We are putting our suitcases in the car. Dad goes to take a shit and tells me to stay in the car. Sit there, looking through the windows. Suddenly, a massive congregation of creepy clowns of all shapes and sizes emerges from the woods near the hotel and just stand there. Pretty sure they can't be human. One fucker is like a good seven foot tall and another is normal height, but his arms are twice as long as his legs. They all sing some weird nursery rhyme. Getting ready to fucking die. Suddenly, dad runs up and we bolt the fuck out of there. Never been happier to see that fucker in my whole life. I honestly forgot about this whole ordeal, thinking it was a dream until dad reminded me last year. Probably the spoopiest thing I experienced. Be me around 23 years old. 4th of July, me and a group of buddies go to a hunting cabin in Bumblefrick, PA, close to a little town with good fireworks. Four to five of us, middle of nowhere, no cell service. This time, friend brings another friend of his who I didn't know along. Guy seems off, dot JPEG. Something about him just, no. He's not rude, just off. Seems slightly disassociated. Anyway, later that night at cabin, everyone drinking beer except me. Decided not to drink this time. Completely sober. Eventually, everyone goes to bed. Laying in bed. Suddenly overwhelmed by a terrifying cosmic horror. Worse than anything I've ever felt. I get up. Still a black horror, even with light on. Tell another good buddy who is in the room with me. He doesn't feel anything. I don't care, dot JPEG. I conscript him to start praying anyway. Eventually the horror leaves. Barely sleep. Next AM, me and him nope out of there early, before anyone else. It's a Sunday morning. Go to church. Part of me wonders if that weird kid didn't have a demon attached to him or something that I was able to sense. 
I've never felt anything like that before or since. Be five years old. Often have strange dreams. One keeps reoccurring every now and then. I fall asleep and find myself in an empty city. No sign of human presence other than the buildings themselves. I hear a voice call my name in a childlike, playful tone. Over here and on, I look towards the voice and see a geometric anomaly covered in eyes. Pick related, but more cartoon-like, with many eyes. Follow me, Anon. It shapeshifts into a giant arrow and points down an empty street. I follow it. We walk for a while and stop at what appears to be a train station. The map. The map. It gives me a map and urges me to look at it. My heart begins to pound because I know what happens next. Tunnel vision as I focus on the map. A monstrous reptile, like a dinosaur, but more horrific, crawls out of the map and begins to chase me. I run around the train station, trying to escape the monster. Dream ends. Move to a different city. The reoccurring dream stops happening. Decades later, my mom casually mentions I used to sleepwalk when I was five, before we moved, and she would find me standing up asleep, shaking in fear in random parts of the apartment. Okay, so here is how I almost died four days in a row. Mind you, this one is kind of weird. 15 year old dumb shit, super depressed after my first breakup. Parents probably giving a fuck about you for the first time since ever because big sad. Unironically think about taking my own life. Decide to do it. Day one of how I almost died. Swallowed like 20 sleeping pills. Prescription ones, but nothing strong since they're meant for kids and adults alike. Just vomit all night. After that, I began to feel weird. Not like depressed weird, or my fucking liver is dying weird, but like I'm being watched by something weird. The feeling continues through this whole experience. Day two, weirdly enough, I'm still alive kind of shaken by this whole thing, and the fact that now my stomach just hurts a bit, and that's all. Be walking down the street with friend. One across the road, when suddenly, some middle-aged woman grabs me and tells me to watch out. She saved my life as I almost walked right under a speeding delivery van. Get spooked and run home. Day three, freaking out about near-death experience. Stay in room all day, except when I have to walk the dog. Evening walk. Zoning out to some perturbator. Suddenly, a fucking street light collapsed right next to me. We're talking like 0.5 meters to my right. Almost have a fucking heart attack because of it. Run home. Day four, I'm freaking out like a schizo, thinking the universe wants me dead or some shit. Didn't eat all day, so I'm really hungry by 4 p.m. Decide to grab pizza from nearby. Avoid the crosswalk from day two. See some sketchy dude near pizza place. Right as I make the order, I hear a scream outside. This dude beat some kid so hard he almost fucking died because of brain damage. Perp was high on meth or crack from what I remember. TLDR, I had to almost die four times just to get over some stupid bitch. Also, didn't get to order my pizza. Still crying about it. Be me. My girlfriend and I were driving from a date in Atlanta a couple years ago. Apple Maps told me there was a traffic jam blocking the interstate from Chattanooga to Nashville. We decided to take the highways home. I was driving on Highway 8 toward McMinnville at 11.30 p.m when a blinking cone of light appeared across the night sky on my left. The light was huge, spanning miles in length. It was probably only 5,000 to 10,000 feet up in the air. It was a semi-cloudy night, and it was below the clouds, but way above the trees. The cone of light was not that wide, but extremely bright and aimed forward in the sky, not at the ground, but straight forward.
forward. I woke up my girlfriend, who had been sleeping at that point, and she also sees this strange blinking cone of light that seems to be approaching us. The blinking was on for two seconds and off for two seconds. As we passed the craft, both of us got a good look at what it was. We were expecting to see some kind of airplane or radio tower, but what we see is something else entirely. My girlfriend described it as a hanging lamp. It passed us going no faster than 100 miles per hour. One thing about it that we both agreed on was that the craft was very large, larger than an airplane. It was about the length of four passenger airplanes. We did not turn around to follow it, as it was going the opposite direction. It was going in the direction of its headlight and had no visible wings or means of propulsion. Friend and I, roughly 12, don't remember much from childhood except our time together. Lived in a woods. Literally only went home when parents made us. Neighborhood had a small patch of woods. Funnels into a small area of no homes, then into a massive forest. Stay mostly in a woods by the neighborhood. Small streams and such. Hiking, riding bikes, etc. One day, get a bright idea to follow a creek to its end. Stay beside or in the water the entire way. Walk for well over an hour. Realize we've entered the forest. Creek empties into a river that we didn't know about. Turns out, several kids drowned in that river through the years. Bodies never found. Happened over decades. We didn't know that at the time and only found out years later when we built up the nerve to ask his dad about it. Getting late afternoon and hungry, we head back. Walk near the creek, but a little further away this time. See a large mound of earth that we missed earlier. Large oak tree sitting on top. Not quite a hill, but a good 15 to 20 feet high. Decide to inspect. Notice a small opening on the side facing away from the creek. Probably a small animal then. My friend was always more adventurous than me. Let's investigate it now. Whatever. He starts poking around inside. Hey, it's pretty big in here. Starts digging around at entrance. Hole large enough to squeeze in. He wasn't kidding. We both fit inside. Hey Anon, when we get home, let's grab some tools to dig this out. Why not? Get home, get grub, get tools, and we're off. The cave becomes our after school project. Head directly there every day after school. After a couple weeks, shit was legit. Two beds made of wood and pine branches. Two chairs dug into the walls. We could both stand, arms raised and not touch the top. It was like an underground clubhouse. Shit was cash. Hey Anon, wanna stay here Saturday night? Fuck yeah. Tell both parents we're staying at the others overnight. Saturday night, we have snacks, board games, flashlights, Slingshots, 12-year-old weapon of choice. Make a fire and roast marshmallows. Fuck around in the creek. Kids being kids and loving it. Climb inside at sunset. Found a round wooden tabletop we used to roll in front of the opening for a door. Used a length of pipe to push some holes through one side and the top for ventilation. Settle in. Fire goes out. Reading comic books by candlelight inside. Boom. Sounds like a fucking cannon fired. Loud ass snap and a ground shaking thud. What the fuck was that? Silence. Dead fucking silence after that. Let's check it out Anon. Are you fucking serious? Slide tabletop just a bit so we can peek outside. Friend whispers. Did you see that? I couldn't talk. I was in front of him. He's basically looking over my shoulder. Saw this thing silhouette. It was cloudy, but the moon was nearly full and gave some light. It was massive. Walked on four legs. Size of a horse, 
but moved like a cat. If it had fur, I couldn't tell. It looked smooth and possibly grey. It was walking past the mound towards the creek. It stopped. Oh fuck, oh fuck, oh fuck. I swear, it looked right at us. Its eyes weren't visible in the dark, but they had that creepy ass shine from catching the light. Slowly, so fucking slowly, I started to roll the tabletop back over the opening. Friend hasn't moved. I don't think either of us took a breath. The opening was nearly closed when it let out this sort of gurgle. I don't know how else to describe it. It sounded almost like a snake hissing underwater. One more push and it's closed. One more peek. It fucking turned. It's coming this way. Quickly, but as quiet as possible, we tried to barricade the door with wood, rocks, anything heavy that we could find. Another gurgle, much closer. I could hear it sniffing near the door. Not sure if at the door or the fire pit. Somehow friend and I never made a fucking sound. Sitting in the center of the cave, armed with cheap slingshots and steel balls. Terrified. Suddenly, several large bumps on the mound. It was climbing up. No idea what time it was. Minutes felt like hours. Faint sniffing and gurgling noises. It was sniffing through the vent holes. Oh no, 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 no. We were trapped and this thing knew we were near. Now sniffing and gurgling from the other vent hole. We're gonna die tonight. Scratching at the door. This went on for what felt like days. Door, top vent, side vent, repeat. Looking for a way in. Looking to kill what it smelled. Not sure if shock or exhaustion, but both our dumbasses fell asleep. Woke up. Could have been hours or minutes. No noise. Could hear birds. Woke friend up. Anon. What are we going to do? I don't fucking know, man. Can't stay here forever. Open the door. I ain't opening that shit. We sat in silence for what felt like hours. Fuck this. I'm going to look outside. Takes a while to unbarricade the door. Finally do. Move it back a couple of inches. Daylight. Thank you, Jesus. Seems clear. Count to three, Anon. We open door and run like hell. One. Two. Three. Door rolled open and running like fucking Usain Bolt on coke. Gurgle hiss. Blood curdling gurgle scream. This is it. This is how we die. Just keep running. Never stop running. Friend screams. Keep running. Everything goes blank. Uh, Anon, are you okay? Mom? Oh my god, Anon, what happened? I... I d don't know. Where is your friend, Anon? He's inside. He's badly hurt. Anon, what the hell happened? Begin telling Mom everything. Stop crying. Just want to see my friend. His dad's on the way. His leg is all ripped up and bleeding. Go inside sobbing. Dad's patching up friend's leg. Anon, I'm so fucking sorry. Don't be, bro. You did what I would have. We knew we couldn't stop. What happened? I don't know, Anon. I was running behind you, and something grabbed my leg. I pulled away and kept running. Didn't even realize I was bleeding. His leg looked like shark bites that I've seen. Shredded. Don't know how he managed to last the few hundred yards. Told parents everything. Dads grabbed guns and headed back. Saw nothing. Said the top of the mound was all dug up. Another couple of inches and it would have opened up. Found huge sets of paw prints deep in the mud. Massive tree branch on the ground where we first saw it. Think the thing was in the trees watching us. Never went back. Often wonder if the boys who drowned in the river through the ears really drowned. Bodies never 
found. Only really spooky if you were there, but I'll share. Be me, back in middle school, visiting a friend's house who lives out in the countryside. Closest neighbor was a little over a mile down a serpentine road in either direction. Five of us were there without supervision because house bro's parents weren't home. Mainly spending the night playing video and talking. After a while, three of the group are asleep aside from me and one of my swim teammates, Ben. It's a new moon and it's cloudy, so it's completely pitch black outside. House borders on a thin strip of wooded area a few meters away. So thin, you could probably walk edge to edge in 15 minutes. Ben and I are sitting on a second story balcony that faces parallel to the tree line. We're talking about stupid shit and he starts idly messing with this cheap laser pointer that looks like a laser tag pistol on his keychain. He's just waving it around back and forth across the tree line and the lawn of the house. We continue talking and after a few minutes, there's a blue dot on my arm. Both of us are confused. Realize it's the light from a laser pointer, but it's coming from the woods. The dot runs across my arm and shirt a few times before disappearing. Find it kind of funny for a second before realizing that means someone is in the woods watching us. We try to play it cool and pretend like we didn't even notice it as we went back inside. In hindsight, that was completely fucking stupid because we both looked right at it and clearly reacted to it. Get back inside and wake Housebro up. The other two would have probably lost their shit and called the cops, so we just let them sleep. Try to figure out what to do, if we should call one of our families, etc. Decide to just hunker down for the night. I wasn't planning on sleeping during this day regardless, so it wasn't too bad on me. Night goes smoothly. Nothing else happens or ever came of it. B8. Mother is a pathologist. Visit her at work after school sometimes. She has to do something. Leaves me in her office. Decide to go see the corpses. Ghost of old guy standing next to his. Grins at me. Ask me if I'm the youngest doctor here. Politely tell him I'm not, but my mother is. He says he can see the resemblance. She did a good job on him. Wants to offer me candy, but remembers she took them from his breast pocket. Mom barges in, looking for me. Ask me what I'm doing. Tell her I was talking to the ghost, but he just... She looks at me funny. Tells me ghosts aren't real. She would know. Tell her the old man wanted me to have candy from his breast pocket. Her jaw drops. Old man laughter from nowhere. We both turn to the corpse. Its mouth shuts slowly. Mother tells me to wait in her office and goes to check on her work. Joins me half an hour later with the candy from the ghost pocket. Takes my promise to never let anyone know what happened under pretense that she'd lose her job for handing out personal possessions. Been meaning to post these since forever. Praise OP for opening this thread. My childhood was filled with stuff like this, mostly because of my friend group being adventurous. Story 1. Be 6th slash 7th grade, anywhere from 10 to 12 years old. Be me. Play hide and seek in an old underground parking slash basement area. Place was used by three buildings. It was huge. Also dark as fuck. Me and two others get caught, so we're searching for our four friend. Friend comes rushing through us, literally knocking the wind out of us and continues running. We thought that somehow he didn't see us or had mistaken us for someone else. As we are shouting for him to come back, we hear a distant scraping that gets closer fast. As we are processing the sound, a sharp metallic screech comes from the direction of the scraping, like what a fox with a vocal box would sound like. Sprint the fuck out of there. Feel sunlight after what felt like hours on the ground. 
everyone has a different perception of what that thing sounded like. I don't know if the sound was just too unorthodox to describe or somehow it changed depending on the person. Friend who was hiding said it was a person screaming his lungs out. Others say that it was an explosion or a loud hiss. Fast forward to nine to 10 years later, event turns into a debate with the same group of friends. Theories ranging from a water pipe problem to a schizo homeless person. Friend who was hiding has no recollection of the event and says it's just a collective false memory. Story two, this didn't actually happen that long ago as I was 18 at the time. B senior in high school, 2021. Summerish. B at a strip mall with same friend group from before, plus a few others. The mall is quite the popular spot for young chaff types to hang around and pick fights with each other. It's almost always crowded with kids and teens. B in a crowd waiting for friends to grab some food from a bakery. Hear whistling. Now, normally, Whistling in this place would be nothing out of the ordinary, but this was different. It was calculated and flawless. Get out of crowd. Whistling starts following us. We start to get annoyed, thinking it's someone trying to provoke us. The whistling is always close to us, but out of sight, and as I said, robotic-esque. One of my friends with a non-existent temper gets heated and runs towards the whistling. Whistling stops. That's that, dot mp4. Go to friend's house and get hammered. Leave around 2 a.m. with another friend and go home. As soon as we step out of the building, the fucker is back. Now it's more malicious in tone, like it's taunting us. We curse at the sound, but it just continues. At an area with tall hedges. Whistling is getting really close now, like just behind the hedges. Me and friend decide that we jump the fucker on his mark. One, two, three, nothing. Then the fucker whistles again for the last time. The sound went over our heads for doing something of a 360. Literal ear rape material. And then nothing. Go home bewildered by what the fuck we just experienced. Story free. Sophomore winter of 2020 pre-COVID. Chilling at home, playing Sekiro on my PS. An unsaved number is ringing me. Pick up, and it's an old woman talking in Albanian. Politely inform her that I don't speak the language and that she has the wrong number and hang up. As soon as I put down my phone, it starts ringing again. Sigh and just put it on silent. Continue with game. Pick up my phone after some time to see if someone has messaged me. My face went 54 missed calls and still ringing. Oh shit. Pick up and shout at them for a few minutes, mutually exchanging curses and swears in foreign languages. Hang up and block the number. Don't think much of it. Tell friends about these crazy asshole people. They want to have a few rounds with them. Much shouting ensues. 30 minutes after the last call, my friend's PC literally fries itself. Freezes and emits heat like a radiator. Pull the plug and open it, cause something other than the cooling fan was making noise inside. The motherboard was half melted. Friend visibly upset, but doesn't attribute this to the Albanian witch. Go home. My PS had all of its files corrupted. Closest I've been to ending it. Another friend had something similar happen to him, but I don't remember what it was. I just know that it was something like a boiler. We all mutually agree. All of this is because we got hexed by that granny. Decide to call again. Number doesn't exist. All right, time for the weirdest story. Be 11 to 12 years old. Trip to some big ass water park for summer cause no camp this year. I was big into scouts and shit like that at that age. Trip was super cool. Going back home after three days of fun. Not even sad cause I'm so satisfied with the trip. Suddenly, 
a feeling comes over me. Dad, I need to take a number two. Pull up on a nearby gas station. Okay, Anon, go poop, and we're gonna refuel and buy some stuff, so just be quick. Go into toilet. Pick related, except no mirrors, and stall doors were more like the shitty ones at school. Go into the stall on the left. There were three stalls, and the one in the middle was occupied. Pooping and minding my own business, when I hear an ungodly scream. Something like a mix between a deer and a bear. Scared so much, I no longer need to poop, but I don't want to leave the stall. Hear a weird voice or voices. Hard to tell. They're speaking in some weird language. Latin, I think, although I'm not sure. See blood flowing on the floor from the middle stall. Jesus Christ, help me. That MP3. My stall door shakes violently. Scream like a little girl. Beg for mercy. Everything stops. Blood is gone. Bathroom is empty. No clue what the fuck just happened. I want to get out. Door to the outside won't open, even though it lacks a lock. The fuck do I do now? I scream for help. My dad hears me. I'll get help, Anon. I calm down a bit. Turn around. Middle stall is open, and I see this massive fucking shadow monster thing. I vividly remember that it was dark, with large horns and eyes that reflected light like animal eyes on photos, but not much beside that. Scream louder than ever in my life as it slowly approaches me. Right when it's like three meters from me, some biker with a crowbar whom my dad recruited opens the door. They look and see nothing in there. They think I'm crazy. Dad is mad at me for a couple of months because he had to pay for that door. This was so fucking insane, I honestly believe it. It reminds me of something I can share. Summer of 2014 or 2015, I don't really remember. I'm like 18 to 20. Hanging out with one of best friends. Our usual MO in these times is to go hiking or whatever in daytime and chill in the evening and play video, whatever. Go climbing around a free recreation zone by a hiking trail. Basically a zone where you can do what you want to at your own discretion. Basically a mountainous kind of series of rocks, stones, trees, and weird little paths that went up and around and so on. Keep in mind that this isn't in a forest or anything. We're in upstate New York, and this zone is smack right in the middle of a quiet but still well-populated small town, so we can hear cars and the chatter of other folks below on the actual trail. We be climbing around on rocks and shit, massive boulders, just gallivanting around. This is basically a mini mountain composed of big rocks and trees and shit. Find a very small opening that is between a bunch of rocks to the side. Can only really see into the opening from chest up because of where we were, pretty high up in the zone at this time. Looking into the opening, there's a little clearing of sorts. It's pretty large and open, sunlight peeking down through a pretty big hole up top, so it's pretty well lit. Ground is warped somewhat, so it isn't perfectly level. Looks innocuous. Like I said, it's well lit and open, so if anything, we're curious. The opening is tiny. Friend is a bigger guy and I'm skinny and thin, so I decide to check it out. Takes me a good 90 seconds of positioning myself to get in. Like I said, we can only see into this thing from chest up where we were standing. I'm in and just taking it all in. Keep in mind, my friend can see me the whole time, so he has his eye on me. I'm just looking around and being like, hey, this is cool. Just having a time. I'm in the middle of the clearing. Just standing there looking around. Suddenly, from a patch of darkness, like 75 feet away from me, I hear a hissing sound. It was incredibly quiet. Almost like if you turn the volume down on a human pretending to hiss like a cat. The sound was also very brief. Only lasted about half a second. What in the hell? I freeze and listen out of curiosity. I'm looking right at this patch of darkness where I hear the sound and don't see anything. Hear the sound again get a horrible feeling all over. Audibly say, I'm getting out of here. Mortal fear engages and I fucking book it out of there. 
entrance to the little area was much easier to get out of than in. I slip out like a lizard in two seconds. Buddy and I scramble down about 500 feet from the entrance before stopping and looking up at where we were. Nothing there. No sound. We leave immediately. And that's really all there was to it. I know I'm not describing it well, but the terror was immense and palpable. It became a joke between us for a while that I was almost eaten by a mountain lion or something. Maybe it was a snake or a bobcat, honestly. But I saw no movement or anything. Buddy also didn't see anything. Probably the one creepy experience I've had in adulthood. I grew up on a farm, and when the sheep had babies, we would have to go out and check on them. This happened to me one of the nights I had a 3am shift. Playing Silent Hill 1, as it had just come out, and I needed to stay awake. 3am hits, and time to go check the sheep. The weather is cold, foggy, and misty, just like Silent Hill. Great. I'm gonna die. All the sheep were good. Got one new lamb put up with mom. Seems healthy. Hear an indescribable, piercing scream in the woods. Fuck. I am actually gonna die. Seriously though, what makes a sound like that? Piercing screech again. Okay, I'm not imagining it. Maybe it's a calf stuck in the mud and bellowing until it's hoarse. Didn't make much sense, but I needed a possible explanation. Well, shit. I guess I need to go check. Screeching continues periodically, and I venture into the woods where I'm hearing it. None of the cows in that pasture anywhere to be seen. Realize that the source of the sound is moving away from me. Okay, it's gotta be a fox or a wounded rabbit, maybe. Now I just want to know. Keep moving towards it. It keeps moving away. Eventually, shouldering my way through thick pines. Can't see shit with my light in any direction. Just trying to get out of the pines into something walkable. Flashlight blinks out. Screeching sound moves closer. Fuck, fuck, don't panic. Banging flashlight. Nothing. Screech from maybe 20 feet away. Fuck this. Blindly pushing through trees, getting scratched and cut. Screech loudly in my ear. I feel like I feel its breath. Blind panic. I'm sprinting in the dark towards the edge of the woods. I just want moonlight, please. Arms and face are bleeding, but I make it to a clearing, and the light turns back on. Say fuck that. I'm gone for real. Keep hearing whatever it was, stay in the woods as I'm leaving that night. Hear it numerous times after that, always in the woods, always at night. Convince myself it was a barn owl, so I don't go insane. Be 11 or 12. Be really into pulling pranks. Come up with a new prank where you stand on two sides of a small road with your friend. When a car drives towards the spot, you mime pulling a rope tight between you two very visibly. The cars always do a sudden break and sometimes yell at you. Mostly, it's a pretty harmless prank. Pull the prank all around town. Figure out that the best place to do it is close to the town's only McDonald's. That way, you get people to do a sudden break with a fresh drink or food in their laps. Once see a milkshake explode, in the windshield of a car and get chased on foot. Nothing bad happens though. One day, pull the prank at a small road. There's almost no cars and it's getting late. Think that you picked a bad spot and start preparing to go home. Realize you're not really sure where you are since you've never been in that part of town. The atmosphere gets strangely tense between you and your friends. All of you get scared for no good reason. Decide that you want to do the prank at least once so you wait for a car. After maybe half an hour, you see a car at the end of the road. It's a nice looking newer car with tinted glass so you can't see who's inside. The car comes close and your friend gives the signal. You pretend to pull the rope and hear a horrible screeching sound. The screech is normal, but the boom that happens afterwards is not. See the car on the road 
fully stopped, with its front bumper crumpled inwards and the windshield shattered. The bumper is completely destroyed, looking like a tight wire cut into it. I become very confused and just stand there, looking at the totaled car with your friends. The car's doors open and a family of four stumbles out with the kids crying. The airbags inflated and the front passengers are both clearly injured. Have no idea what the hell happened since they crashed into nothing. Decide to run away into the night. Never pull the prank on anyone again and try to forget it ever happened. Little kid living in rural PA. Used to be home alone and would come every inch of the place looking for presents while my parents weren't home, especially around birthdays and Christmas. Up in the attic once, looking through old family stuff. Come to a small dresser and start opening drawers. All empty except the last drawer. It was off its track and made a grinding metal screech like nails on the chalkboard. Inside were two neatly folded garments. They didn't look old or dusty, but clean and new. I unfolded one of them and it was a hooded robe, like monks wear. Thought it was strange how new and clean they were. Really freaked me out. Thought maybe it was some witchcraft shit. I got really scared and remember trying to fold it back exactly how I found it. Too scared to ask my parents about them. Some weeks later, my mom says that they'd be going out later. Dad comes by my room and tells me that they're leaving. Hear a mom up in the attic and that distinctive screeching sound from the drawer. Remember the robes. Being a 90s kid, I naturally go into detective mode. Knew my room was between where my parents were and their car. Climb out window and hide behind the back seat of their car. By that time, I went from fear of getting caught to holding back the shittiest, biggest troll face grin. I wanted to laugh so hard and just jump out and scare them, but I didn't. We drove probably 20 minutes. Dead silence. Finally, they pull off somewhere and get out. My dad walks away, then my mom after. Slowly look up and get a bearing of my surroundings. No other cars. See my mom walking up a hill until she disappears over it. She was wearing the robe. Complete silence for a while. Still looking around when I see a bright light from over the hill. Then smoke. Then the screams of what was definitely a woman. Lay back down, close my eyes, and plug my ears to deafen the noise. Parents eventually come back and drive back home. Never said a word. Repressed it entirely until this thread and seeing the comment about witchcraft. Bimmy, B15, 2009. I loved Call of Duty 4 so much. Loved All Gilead Up so much. Favorite level. I would often reenact levels in my yard with imaginary guns and stuff. I was also like abnormally tall for 15. This is important. Like 6'2. Heard senior prom was coming up, and since I was a sophomore, I could not go. Girl across the street was having people over for pictures. Now, at proms, what happens is that when you go to take photos, people park their cars bumper to bumper. Reminded me of all gillied up when Macmillan and Price crawled under the cars. This gives me an idea, that JPEG. From what I learned from Stephanie, the girl across the street, they were going to go drinking and shit in the nature reserve after prom, maybe have some sex. Figure I might spy on them, and pretend that one is a KF and shoot him. Borrow my friend's ghillie suit. Wait until prom. When everyone is taking photos, I put on the ghillie suit. It was a little dark by this time, about 7 o'clock, and I had cover. Ach, it's a bloody convention out there. When they leave, crawl out and stay low, I say. As I see the crowd, I wait for one of the dads to move. Hold. He moves. Okay, go. And so I ran, exactly as Macmillan does, while even making the sounds of the music from that level. 
start crawling under the cars. It's a bit of a tighter squeeze than I thought. Pretty tough, but I'm skinny, so it works. When I get to the end of the cars, people are starting to leave. I say fuck it and run out from under the cars, over to a tree in my neighbor's lawn. I hear someone say, what the fuck was that? I run to the beginning of the woods and look back. People are looking in my direction, mostly kids. They look sort of shaken. They keep wondering what it was that ran past them. I run back to my house, and when I see one of the dads and one of the seniors, named Jake, start to walk across the street. I say to myself, what the bloody hell was that? You trying to get us killed? Night comes. I pass the time playing MW2. No Macmillan. I am sad. In the woods, I see lights. It's the seniors. No, it's the ultra-nationalists. Kill Zakaev. Throw on my ghillie suit. Run into the forest. Stalk the seniors, about ten of them, through the trails. I'm snapping a lot of twigs and shit while following them. What the fuck is that? One of them says. What? It's me. I run to a safer location. Hello? Stephanie calls out. If they see me, everyone will think I'm autistic. They keep walking, and I realize I got too close to them. I say in a horrible Scottish accent, Are you daft? Stay out of the radioactive areas. What the fuck is that? One of them says. What was that? They're seriously scared. They book it to the campsite, and I tiptoe behind them. When they get there, they set up camp. I live in the south, so one of the guys brings a gun. His date is complaining. I brought it in case that thing from Stephanie's house comes back. What if that was it earlier on our way here? Oh my god, stop. The females whimper in unison, like a choir of alley cats. The guy, Dave, looks into the woods with his guns, while his date starts drinking and inviting him to join her. He's got his eyes fixed on the woods. I pretend he's an ultra-nationalist who spotted me. I run for cover. I heard something, he shouts. Everyone is getting scared. Girls want to go home. The men decide to be noble and go find the fucker stalking them. I bolt. An hour later, I'm still in the nature preserve, looking for a way out. All of a sudden, I run into the guys. I pretend it's that part of all gillied up, when Price and Macmillan crawl through the grass, past the ultra-nationalist patrol. I go prone and try to slip past them. Instead, I lay down in deer shit and get it smeared on my friend's ghillie suit. But I continue. Macmillan would have wanted it. They pass me, talking about the creature they saw. Well, what? What did you see, Jake? It was... Huge, like six feet, hairy as fuck, and it was like walking like it had a limp. I do not walk like that. I do not walk like that. I should probably point out my Macmillan impression sounds like I have a bunch of marbles in my mouth while I get deep throated by Men Dingo and Danny D at the same time. I do my accent and say with all of my autism, Butch doesn't look too friendly. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> they freak the fuck out and I run. I heard it. That's it. I keep running and see lights. Maybe I'm home? Nope. Campsite. A girl shines a light into the woods. It hits me. Macmillan would have been disappointed. Hello? Say nothing. Just stare. Macmillan would have shot her. What do you want, creep? A girl waves to get my attention. Pull down my mask to see if she would recognize me from school, so she would not be scared. I smile, but due to autism, I smile really wide, and with eyes wide like a deer getting ass rammed. I wave, but it's cold as fuck, so I'm shaking a ton, and it looks like I'm having a seizure. They scream. It's mimicking us. The thing is here, Stephanie shouts. I run again. I kept running that night, but ran into the group again. Turns out, they had split up to search for the creature, 
but two of them, Susie and Noah, got lost. They're calling out for Susie. I like Susie, and this fits. So I shout in my Scottish accent, Oi, Susie! A guy shoots me with his AR. Macmillan would have topped him. He is shooting wildly. Kill that fucking monster, one shouts. I run out of there while screaming loudly, Susie, hoping they'll know that I'm helping. I slip and fall into a small pit. Did you smell that thing? One says. I'm still splattered in deer shit. They follow my trail, and Dave reaches the edge of the pit. Found it, he cries. Then he slips and falls in. Hits his head on a rock. Is out cold. Bleeding. I scream and bolt. I can hear the group screaming, It got Dave. They think I killed Dave. Target neutralized. Uh, what? What is that? Oh, you fucking bastard. Target neutralized. <laughs> I, I, don't, I give up. I say. Eventually, I realize I've been going in circles because I end up back at the camp. I get an idea. Trash it. Throw shit around and set things on fire. Then I say, Look at this place. 50,000 people used to live in this city. <laughs> now it's a ghoul star. <laughs> Never seen anything like it. When the group comes back, they see their camp trashed. They left Dave in the woods for some reason. I was really cold, so I threw on some of Noah's extra clothes to keep warm. They see me. Noah, one shouts. I'm confused. Noah? They stop. My face when I'm still using my Scottish accent. They're frozen. One girl tries to approach me. Jake pulls her back. That's not Noah anymore, he says. Noah was the class clown and had a lot of funny catchphrases. So to calm them down, I do an impression of him and say, What's swagging? This scares them even more. Apparently, he said that right before he disappeared. What? Jake charges me. I run, getting sick of hearing that. He catches me. I'm bigger, so I punch him and he falls. I pull him by his leg into the dark and punch him more. The group is screaming. The others are too scared to help. I beat him up while shouting Macmillan lines in a Scottish accent. It sounds like William Wallace had suddenly come out of the trees and decided to savage one of the group members. He's bloody, and I run so I will not get in trouble. The group freaks out. I stagger a lot, leaving blood all over the trees and stuff. My hand hurts from punching him a ton. I scream. More screaming from the woods. I get back home, shower, and play all gillied up for real. When I return my friend's ghillie suit, he tells me that apparently there is like a hairy monster man in the woods. I'm scared until I read the newspaper. Blood trails all over the woods. Two teens beaten and bloodied. Susie was found stuck in mud. They never found Noah. Jake and Davy ended up in the hospital. Friends say they saw Noah attack Jake and then disappear. Say the creature was dark, hairy, smelly, ran fast, was tall and gaunt, and mimicked humans. Two years later, some Anon posts about it on Cook Chan's B. Called it a skinwalker. My face when I was a skinwalker. Macmillan would have been proud. Get GF. Her dad has an allotment. He's broken his leg so he cannot tend to it. See opportunity to get in his good books and ask him what it is that needs to be done. It's just basic memory like turning over the soil. Offer to do it for him and he accepts. Absolutely sweltering morning. GF comes with me to keep me company. At about noon, we go back to her parents to get dinner. Allotments are directly behind the houses, and his is about 100 yards away from the house, so it's not a long walk back. Her mother says to leave it for the day, but I insist on going back and finishing it, because there is not much left to do. Me and GF go back after dinner. Absolutely revolting smell. 
two sheds in the allotment, one at the top corner that gets used, and one that's old as fuck and is basically just a frame at the bottom corner that never gets used. It still has two walls up and a floor, but no roof or door or anything, so you can see straight inside of it. Smell seems to be localized around that area. Investigate. Gag reflex at full. Cannot see anything. Notice that the floorboards are loose. Realize that it's going to be a dead rat or a dead fox. Lots of buff around, and both fucking stink when they die. Lift up the floorboards. There's a lever gym bag there. Take it out. Smell is unbearable, and the bag has a weight to it. Go full axe, and consider that it might be a dead kid. Panic. Tell GF not to look, while I see what it is. Unzip the bag. It's half a dog. Literally just the back half of a dog that's been cut in two. Didn't even look that decomposed. Literally no idea where it came from. It couldn't have been there the entire time, or we would have smelt it in the morning too. It's not really skeletons, but it was odd as fuck. Five years old. Being raised by a single working mom. She doesn't bother with kindergarten shit. Instead, an old lady who lives in the same apartment building makes my breakfast and watches over me until her grandkids are back from school. They come back before my mom does, which means that for about two to three hours, I am home alone. One day, during that window of time, I get a phone call. Some man I don't know asks if my parents are home, and I tell him that I'm alone. Back in the day, we got a lot of calls from people who dialed the wrong number, so this was not unusual to me. Man does not hang up though, and he starts chatting with me. I'm bored as fuck, so I'm glad for the company. Pretty much tell him everything. That I don't have a dad, that there's a lady who watches over me in the morning but leaves at noon, that I'm home alone until about 3pm, so I get bored and lonely a lot, etc. He tells me that he is a college student, and that he moved away from his parents, so he gets lonely too. Says he'll call me again at the same time tomorrow, so we can keep each other company. He does call, and this turns into a ritual. Normally we just chat about whatever inane bullshit comes across a five-year-old's mind, but sometimes he'd make up stories for me. I only vaguely remember one of them, which was about a very good boy who ended up in a world where all the rules are the opposite, so he was suddenly considered bad. This goes on for a long time, for months maybe. I think I told my mother I had a new friend, but she dismissed it. Anyway, time for my sixth birthday comes, and I'm super excited, and tell him all about the party I'm going to have, and the gifts that I'm about to get. He says that since we're friends, he should send me a gift too, and ask me for my address, saying he'll mail me something. Being a greedy little shit, I tell him. He doesn't call again. My birthday comes and goes, and I get no gift in the mail. I remember being very hurt by this, thinking that he forgot about me. About a month or so after he stopped calling, I get a ring at my door as soon as the woman who watched over me left. My mother taught me not to let anyone in the apartment when I'm alone and to just ignore the doorbell, so I did. After a while, the ringing stopped and I heard a familiar voice calling out to my name. Anon, please, I know you're in there. I've got you your gift. I tell him that I'm not allowed to let him in and ask him why he did not send it by post, like he said he would. He explained that the gift was way too big to be sent by post. So he needed to come over and give it to me in person. He is pleading that I let him in. Says he is my friend. I'm feeling very uncomfortable at this point though. At the time, I was not quite sure why. Still, being curious about the gift, as well as about how my friend looks, I looked through the people. He did not look how I imagined him at all. I can't say he was ugly but he looked off. Tall, skinny, 
acne, very baby-faced, which did not seem to match his deep voice at all. He looked almost sickly. I immediately noticed that he was empty-handed and that there was no gift around. I still vividly remember the cold, sick, empty feeling in my gut when I realized that something is extremely wrong and that I had made a terrible mistake. I immediately start to bawl and to plead that he goes away. I don't know what I thought he was going to do, but I knew that it was not good. He tried to comfort me while still pleading to be let inside. He then started fake crying, saying that I must hate him. The door was locked, but I was still completely petrified. I tried to block it with a chair, like I saw in cartoons, but I could not do it. My brain went to autopilot, and I screamed, I'm calling the police. That made him stop, and he immediately left. I was extremely shaken, but also ashamed. I knew I fucked up, so I did not tell anyone about what happened. Instead, I insisted that I want to go with the lady who was watching over me and stay at her place until my mom gets home. Soon enough, I started going to school, and for a while, I would stay there to do my homework instead of going home immediately after class because I did not want to be alone there. I don't know for sure if he ever called again, but we did get a couple of silent calls here and there. I don't know that it was him, but I feel that it was. I used to be friends with a girl who had just a dozen or so movies that she liked on her laptop, watching them over and over again. Many of them were popular films, with significant portions of them edited out. She'd had a friend could out all the scenes featuring any violence or sexuality, no matter how slight, with very few comedic exceptions, and she did not even consider anyone's recommendations of other films, even if that friend would have edited them. She reasoned that it was because she had only ever watched those dozen or so films, and would not need more since she had the edited versions of them, and she could not handle anything shocking unexpectedly. Needless to say, her other friends and I all found her strange, and at times, annoying to hang out with. But at least I can say that she was by far the nicest and most honest person I've ever known. We called her Angel, for reasons that should be obvious. On the evening of October 31st, 2016, a group of friends went to hang out at a park that got pretty spooky after dark. Angel lived alone in a nearby apartment complex, so when we started getting cold and decided to go indoors, we went with her. Her apartment was largely unfurnished, with the notable exception of the bedroom. The floor was entirely covered by mattresses, and there were dozens of pillows, blankets, and plushies scattered around. There were several comfy armchairs facing the TV, which sat on top of a stool at the back of the room in front of the window. Next to it was her laptop, connected to the TV. This was where she watched her few favorite movies, and had made many of us watch them more than once. That night, the friend who had originally edited those films to her liking managed to convince her that we would watch scary YouTube videos. We stuck to obviously fake ghost caught on tape ones, which at least outwardly did not bother Angel, and she said it was because she did not believe in ghosts. An hour or so later, she said she was bored and wanted to put on Patch Adams. It was her all-time favorite movie, with the edits of course. She watched it practically daily. We all had seen it at least once before. Not the most exciting film on a Halloween night, but she could not be talked out of it. At this point, my best friend and his girlfriend left, but the rest of us stayed because we were not actually planning on watching it. We'd just talk about ghosts or whatever. So, she double-clicked on Patch Adams.mp4 and the film began. She was actually watching it, but she'd seen it a thousand times, so she also talked over it, about paranormal stuff with us. Her editor friend, though, seemed like he was having a hard time focusing on the conversation. 
After the part where Patch holds the skeleton and says, I have a boner, suddenly it cut to the scene in imprint where the girl hangs upside down with needles stuck in her gums. When she saw it, Angel screamed and backed up to the corner, hid under a blanket and wailed in the most heartbreaking way I've ever had the displeasure of hearing. It was like she was mourning the death of a child or something. She just kept crying and moaning, no matter what we said. Even her editor friend apologized, saying it was a prank and that it was just a movie too. Before we had started watching the YouTube videos, he'd replaced the Patch Adams file with a new edit that included fucked up scenes from horror movies. But already, that first one was too much for Angel. Me and another friend decided it would not be a good idea to leave her alone, so we stayed the night. She stopped crying eventually, but in the morning, we realized that she'd pissed herself and was still shaking. We got her to drink some water, but she would not say a word. Neither of us could stay, so we called her sister and told her what happened. Her reaction was like, I'm coming, stay with her but would not explain why Angel was the way that she was. The other friend left, and I waited for her sister, trying to get her to at least look at me, but she just stared into emptiness. When her sister came, she rushed to Angel and held her. I awkwardly left, because I was already late, and after work, I called Angel's sister to ask if she could come by. She said it would be good but I should be extra careful. I should not even talk about what happened because it would only make her relive it. So I went there, and her sister explained quietly that Angel witnessed a brutal assault and possibly murder when she was seven and had to hide in a dumpster. She stayed inside for hours in the pitch black darkness and had to walk home at night. Anything too shocking sent her mind back to that dumpster. She'd never watched a horror movie in her life. That scene in imprint sent her way over the edge. As far as I know, she never returned to normal. Last I saw her, she still would not speak more than short, childlike sentences and was like a little kid. I wouldn't say she seemed unhappy, but being her friend was too hard when all she cared about were coloring books and plushies and talked to me like I was an older family friend, or something, rather than a friend. It was like her memories of her friends were gone. Shortly after that Halloween night, her sister moved in to help her in her daily life. Her sister told me she has not dared to watch Patch Adams after that. A prank ruined her favorite movie for her life. Moral of the story, some people might have a reason why they can't handle horror films. Years back, I drove out to Arkansas with a friend for work. Our boss was this really cool old Southern guy, and he told us that if we wanted, we could drive up early and stay at his ranch. Said there was a good fishing spot nearby, and he had four wheelers and lots of beer in the fridge. Friend and I, of course, take him up on this, and we spent the first day just riding four-wheelers. Then we got ship-faced late into the night. Next day, we woke up late and decided to go fishing. By the time we got ready and ate and grabbed our stuff and went to the lake, it was fucking 6 p.m., lol. We were both hung the fuck over, but we were not drunk. Anyway, we were out there fishing, and suddenly everything just went fucking dead quiet. I could see the water moving, but I couldn't hear it. I turned to my friend, and I could tell it was not just me. It was like we were both afraid to speak, because there was not any fucking sound. Right at that moment, there was this huge gust that picked up. I could feel it on my skin, and it whipped through my clothes, but I could not hear shit, even though I could feel it. So we're both just staring at each other, spooked, when we hear this big splash. It came from over to our right, and we both jumped and looked over. It wasn't Bigfoot, 
That's what people always think when I describe it. This thing was tall and hairy, but it was slim. Almost lanky, but with big shoulders. And it was only like 20 feet away, maybe. It trudged really quickly through the water and up the bank and into the trees. Before we knew it, it was gone. It happened so fast I didn't even really get a good look at it. But my friend said he noticed that it had big hands. But honestly, all I noticed was its height and build. And that it moved fucking fast too. I don't like to tell this history because it sounds weird as fuck. Look, in my city, there is a myth about an alien base near the shore. And there are histories about weird foreign people. Some people called them the weird gringos or weird European. So when I worked in a local minimart, I had an encounter with a weird tourist. Be me, at work, cashier of the minimart. 4 p.m. People were buying shit. Then a weird woman, wearing a summer dress with new sneakers, entered the store. She just wanders around and giggles. Everyone leaves, and we end up alone. I started to analyze her, because something was off. She had a small frame, and she was thin as fuck, and her skin was almost white, and a little red around the elbows. Her head was big, but her hair looked fake. No chin, and her nose and mouth were small. Her eyes were big, not as big as A's, but they were normal big, and she was using sunglasses. She walks to me and does a friendly giggle. I noticed that her hands looked so smooth, like as if they were boneless, and her nails looked glued on. Hey, good afternoon. You need something? I said. She giggles and points to the microwave. With a weird voice, like the boy voice, in a broken Spanish, and said, What is that? First, I thought about the frozen pizzas, so I said, Do you want a pizza? She said no, the machine. Oh, the microwave is an oven. Then she said, How it work? Explain, explain. I explained how the microwave worked. She giggled, and then pointed at the old CRT TV that the CCTV used. That thing, please explain. I explained to her all the basics about CRTs. She smiled at me with her small mouth. You people are so close, but at the same time, so far. She starts to giggle again. Thanks, you are a good people. Then she walked away from the store. I don't know what the fuck happened, but I never felt threatened during her stay. Just a little uncomfortable, because the technical questions, but I never felt in danger. Those kinds of tourists are a common myth around the city. I love cryptid shit myself, so I was pretty excited when I recently found out that my late grandfather had an encounter with one when he and my father lived in the Soviet Union. Grandad, an electrical engineer, gets called to a town near the shores of the Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is known for, among other things, being fed by 330 rivers, but emptying into only one. Having an incredible ecosystem of thousands of species, half of which are only found there. Being the deepest lake in the world. Being the biggest lake in the world by surface area, and being the oldest lake in the world, as well as being the center of all manners of legends and creepy shit. So, my grandfather arrives by the time it's getting dark, so the client insists that he insists that he stay the night in the Gustinitsta, but not before inviting him for supper. Over the meager meal, they discuss details of the problem and possible solutions. As the sky darkens, the client makes an odd remark that sounds out of place, coming from the mouth of such a fellow. Do take care not to leave your room during the night. There are creatures out there. After checking how much vodka the client had drank, my grandfather asked him what he means, and after a little hesitation and a request for him to not talk about this, 
The client obliges my grandfather. Around the forest, we find huge mounds of droppings, with whole skeletons intact, of sizes, everything between and including wolves to bears. These shit mounds are left by giant snakes that live in the lake. This was the only doubtful part of the story, as a snake usually wouldn't want to venture into the freezing cold lake, though it would make a great deal of sense for such a creature to reside in burrows underground. Reports of sightings of the creature are only heard once or twice a year, compared to the often seen mounds, because, well. Human bones, too, fall under the purview of everything in between. And when a set are found, reports of a missing person from as far as a few towns over are never far behind. But try not to think too much about what I've just told you. Just stay in your room for the night and do have a good night's rest. My grandfather had little trouble not thinking about it as he made his way into his room that night, as it frankly stunk of giant snake shit. So, giving the whole silly thing no more thought, he changed into his night clothes and swung open the room window to let a cold breeze in. He studied the schematics a little longer until he was satisfied that he had figured it out, then got up to extinguish the light to get some sleep. Turning towards his bed in the now dark room, he sees, peeking through the opened window, the head of a huge snake illuminated by pale moonlight, its fervor tongue flicking up and down. As any sane man would do, he ran into the closet and shut the door behind him. For not more than twenty seconds, he heard the most infernal thrashing of wood against wood and leathery flesh, and of papers and bed covers being whipped about at breakneck speeds. That small time felt like an eternity, as did the minute or so until he heard a rapping on his room's door and a man's voice. What the hell is going on in there? You've woken everybody up, and I've called the police. My grandfather rushed out of the closet, through the wrecked room, and out into the hallway, slamming the door behind him. He gets accosted by the owner until the police arrive, who inspect the room, or what was left of it. Papers are all about, the furniture reduced to splinters, and the bed covers were nowhere in sight. My grandfather collected his few remaining things, and as per police's orders, was given a different room for the night. One of them stepped aside to talk to my grandfather. Don't open your window again. We don't want to come back here again tonight to recover a body, or worse. The rest of the trip went uneventfully. My grandfather fixed the problem and promptly returned to Ukraine, where he and my father, then in his early youth, lived but my grandfather did bring one thing back. On a trip to the Museum of Natural History, he brought it in between the pages of a book, meaning it was probably a scale. My grandfather shows it to the curator, who shows great interest in it. My grandfather relates the story of how he got it, as the curator inspects excitedly. The curator asks if he can hang on to it to conduct some research and ensures my grandfather that he'll show him his findings. My grandfather accepts and parts with the thing, but the curator never did get back to him. But my grandfather did get back to the curator, after having some difficulty finding him. The curator responded almost angrily to being questioned about the item and his research on it. That thing you brought me was a hoax, nothing more. I've decided I want nothing to do with the damned fake and I suggest you decide the same. And that concludes the story. Now, the strangest thing about the story, at least to me, is that before hearing it, I had heard all sorts of strange goings on in and around Lake Baikal, but never anything like this. The only thing relatively close was a single isolated mention of a possibility of a Nessie-style plesiosaur type thing entering the ecosystem through one of the 330 rivers feeding the lake, since one of those things could possibly be mistaken as a giant snake. But there is just about nothing else. Quite the peculiar affair, isn't it? What's hiding or being hidden at Lake 
by Cal. Having a family reunion at a lake, supposed to be safe to swim in. Everyone is having a good time swimming and fishing. I get up on a little dark area, do a running jump into the water. Big splash. So cool of me to do that. Wait, this water doesn't feel right. It doesn't look right either. It's all black and wriggling around like it's alive. It is alive. Dove into a big pile of snakes that were just under the water. Everybody takes off away from the lake as the snakes overrun the water and shore, screaming like a bitch while whipping snakes back and forth, trying to get to the shore. Didn't get bit at all. Never went into the water, ever again. From what we were told, they were mating water moccasin. If that were true, and they had attacked me, I almost certainly would have died. B12 Recently moved to shit, very old town in Idaho. Live in really old apartment building that was once a mental hospital. Floors are squeaky, huge doors for gurneys. Old morgue still in basement behind padlock door. Only kids in the entire building are me and my baby sister. Start hearing children's laughter one day. Laughter is accompanied by huge shadows moving around outside the door. Floor is not squeaking like normal. Get ballsy one day. Bro, open the door. See nothing. Lose my shit. Happens every day until we move out. I eventually spoke to my aunt about it, and she told me that she heard it too, especially at night in her apartment. They'd always be in the spare room she had. Sometimes they sounded like children, and other times they sounded like adults. I also went back to this building when I was a bit older, to visit the morgue in the basement. You had to go into the cellar outside, down one floor into a solid concrete room. The light never worked, so we always explored with flashlights. Everything was still there, like the people that bought it never bothered to have it taken out. Huge old sink, drains in the floor, the concrete slabs for bodies, entire place was basically a nightmare. The town was literally one of the first in Idaho, and most of the old buildings remained. There were even old tunnels underneath most of the city. I was a first-hand witness for a murder that was completely and entirely covered up and silenced in Barber County, West Virginia. Live in Bellington, small town, August 1993. Working at the Laurel Mountain Inn. Inn is about to close. It's about an hour until my shift ends. Three guys come in, out of towners. Immediately recognize them as not from these parts due to their accents. Two of them order. The other one hovers around them, not taking a seat. Seems to be on something. Not my job to give a shit. Just focus on cleaning dishes. Another guy walks in, open carrying a pistol. Now, at this point, there are six customers inside, an elderly couple, the three out-of-towners, and the guy with the pistol. There's three workers inside, two are on break. I'm manning the counter now, after having finished cleaning up. Third out-of-towner, the one who didn't sit down, casually strolls into the bathroom. Guy with the pistol unholsters it, shoots the two other guys. I'm completely shocked, freeze up. Vividly remember this one detail. His gun did not make a single sound. Holsters it. Casually strolls out, with the two out-of-towners dead in their seat. Immediately snap out of it as soon as he's out of the door. Elderly couple seem to be in a trance at this point. Call the police. They get there very quickly and act really fucking weird around me as I'm telling the story. They seem to not believe me. Tell them about the third guy in the bathroom. They don't even go to investigate, but tell me, there's no one in the bathroom. I'm feeling really fucking nervous at this point, like they're suspecting me. They take away the bodies. I go to use the bathroom myself and check for the third guy. Nowhere to be found. When I walk out, all of the blood is gone, and the elderly couple have left too, without touching any of their food. 
I contacted the police again the next day to ask about the situation because it didn't sit right with me. I was told by the operator of the non-emergency rather matter-of-factly that there were no records of a murder in the Laurel Mountain Inn. I didn't have work the next day, so I decided to call up one of my friends who worked just across the road at the Midtown Motel and would have absolutely seen anyone enter. I asked him. He said he saw the three men enter and the guy with the pistol, but his account of events is fucking bizarre. He never saw the man with the pistol leave. He also said he could vaguely see the muzzle flash and thought he heard something loud from the inn. He said he also didn't see any police cars pull up, but two unmarked black Cadillacs the police officers stepped out of. Every single time I've tried to contact a newspaper with the story or the police, I was turned down and addressed as a liar. It wasn't like they were merely skeptical. They addressed me flat out as if I was making shit up and they knew it. They would never give any evidence that I was a liar if I tried to press them on it. And in general, everything about this is suspect to me. I could be a schizo, I don't know. But I know as a matter of fact, I saw a guy outright shoot two people in the middle of the Laurel Mountain Inn. Grew up poor. I have to share room with Big Sis. Room is tiny, so we're really bitching about having each other's stuff in our zones. She gets this huge plant leaf thing from Ikea with her allowance that she saved up. Hangs it on the wall between our beds so it's kind of like a partition. First night, it's up. I'm staring up at it from the bed. Sort of at an angle, so I'm looking partially underneath it, if that makes sense. It makes a really weird shadow on the ceiling that looks like someone looking over the edge of it. It freaked me out, but I didn't say anything. Would have just gotten laughed at. Every night, for like six months, I look up at this thing and think how weird this shadow is can't figure out what it is. Seemingly no cause for it. One night, I'm looking at it, and I almost convince myself I can see eyes. Almost like the reflection animal eyes have, but way duller. Actually getting kind of freaked out. Suddenly I hear from my sister's bed. You see it too, right? Both of us flip out and turn on the light. Of course, nothing there. Take the leaf down and try to forget about it. Turns out, she'd been seeing it for months, always in the same spot, always looking down at me. B15. Parents threw me out of the house at midnight for finding drugs in my room, like I give a fuck that I'm before. Pack my backpack and get a sleeping bag. It's summer, so sleeping outside is no problem. Find a lonely spot in the industrial part of town. Put a sleeping bag down on the edge of the parking lot that borders the building. Cozy little alcove. Go to sleep. Bit spooky being so alone and quiet, but fall asleep. Wake up to hear liquid pattering down onto my sleeping bag. Fuck rain, man. Wait, I'm in the alcove. How can it be raining on me? Poke head out of sleeping bag. Some guy pissing on me. What the fuck are you doing? Yell at him for being a creep. Get out of the sleeping bag to kick his ass. He runs off like a goddamn track star. Fucking piss-soaked sleeping bag, goddammit. Wait. This doesn't smell like piss. It was lighter fluid. I haven't told this one in a while. Not me, but a nurse I worked with. Omaha or Lincoln. 1990s. First of many waves of crystal meth epidemic hitting the city. Guy brought to the hospital with all the classic symptoms. Doesn't fit the stereotypical user though. Wearing a suit, well groomed. Guy is losing his mind when the cops bring him in. Trying everything he can to get loose. Screaming like a madman. As soon as the cops leave the room, he calms down. Local PD don't have a great reputation, and this wasn't long after the whole Rodney King ordeal, so nurses just assumed cops were mistreating him. 
guy goes from shouting to a kind of chanting, to just talking in a regular voice, but in gibberish. A couple of Pentecostal nurses thinks he's speaking in tongues. Resident is called down to assess, pretty sure at this point, whatever it is, isn't meth. Resident is from Saudi Arabia. He starts listening to patient talk before he gets to the room, stops in his tracks, listens for a few seconds, then nopes back to his office. Nurse telling the story goes to his office and tells him to get his shit together and go and assess like he's supposed to. Resident tells her there's no way in hell he's going near that guy. Nurse asks why not. Resident explains that the guy isn't speaking in tongues. He's speaking perfectly fluent Arabic. Trouble is, he's very clearly talking to a demon. Guy starts bellowing like an ox again, loud enough to be heard in the office. Patient switches between this and very calmly, matter-of-factly, telling nurses and other patients, I'm going to eat your eyes. Eventually put into a padded room for patient safety. Every time somebody goes into the room to give him food or check on him, he fights like a cornered animal. Comes out of it the next day. Super nice to everybody. Has no recollection of anything that happened to him for the past couple of days. Guy doesn't speak a word of any other language besides English. Be me. High school kid in small town. Popular state park in town that friends and I frequent to smoke weed and fuck around in. Free houses in the middle of the park that you can only access by the trails. Pretty nice houses at one time, not some tiny cabins. Driveway had an entrance to a small road nearby that was pretty hidden and gated. Friend tells me he's been inside the houses and they're abandoned. Strange part is, they seemed completely abandoned, but every once in a while, there would be luxury vehicles in the driveway. Once every few weeks to few months. We're talking Porsches, Hummers, Lambos, etc. Lots of them, like five or six at a time, or none. Not something you see every day in my small, rural town. Make a plan to go into the house anyway. My buddy is absolutely sure they are abandoned and completely unworried. Meet up at the park with six people. Myself, four friends, one friend's girlfriend. Friend's girlfriend's dad is a cop in our town. The one who has already been there starts leading the way of the trail. Trail turns into cobblestone, then paved over with asphalt as we approach the houses. Get to the central driveway of the free houses. Cars aren't there, coast is clear. Houses look abandoned with a couple of weird exceptions. One has broken windows, overgrown by ivy and even some graffiti on it, but a satellite dish on the roof that looks brand new. Friend leads us to the back door, which was already ajar. Inside is very fucking weird. No furniture. No signs of inhabitants. No clothes, no pictures, etc. Lots, and I mean lots, of canned goods. Every single room has stacks of cans and old bottles. Seem to be ranging in age for at least 100 years. Pile of spam cans and beans that were no older than a couple years old, next to glass Windex bottles from the 1930s. Jars filled with random shit everywhere, containing everything from spices to hardware to coins. Walk around both floors, only to find every room is exactly the same with collections of random canned and jarred goods. One of us gets the bright idea to go down to the basement. Buddy opens the door to the basement. It's fucking pitch black down there. Reluctantly, but with an exaggerated sense of confidence, he starts heading down. Doesn't make it down more than a step or two before we hear a car slowly rolling into the driveway and a car door shut. Oh fuck, it's the Porsche motorcade coming to lynch us. I'll freeze in dead silence. No, we have to leave, but the only way out is the back door in full view of the driveway. Decide to walk out all at once and face whoever it is. Maybe even talk our way out of spelunking some boomer's prepper storage house or whatever. It's the fucking cops. D dad what are you doing here? Friends GF cop dad standing in the driveway, which has a locked gate next to his patrol cruiser. He's pissed. Deathstare.gif. Walks up to us slowly. 
looks, and just says, go home. Anand's GF gets angry and argues as a teenage girl would. But dad, we weren't doing anything, it's just an empty house. You're trespassing on federal government property. Puts her in the car and waits in the driveway till he sees us leave for the trail. Anand's GF tells us her dad refused to tell her anything or answer any of her follow-up questions, including how he knew where we were and how he got in the gate. Few months pass and we're back in the same park smoking a blunt with two of the kids that came into the house with me. It's late, like midnight or so. A light goes on in the distance. It's the house at the top of the hill, the empty one we went inside of. Figure standing in upstairs window, looking out in our direction. Do a 360 and book it the fuck out of there. Never attempted going near those houses again. Hey X, I'm new to this board and consider myself a hopeful skeptic. I would love to believe in the paranormal, but I have not seen enough convincing evidence to believe it wholesale. That being said, I have had one experience in my life that while may be able to be explained rationally, is full of bizarre and unsettling things that I do not have explanations for. I don't normally use a trip code, but figured I would for the purposes of telling the story. I suck at green texting, so sorry you can't be me. But anyway, here is my tale about a place called Dead Man's Maze. I grew up in AZ, and during my junior year of high school, I heard a rumor from my older brother's friend about this really strange and creepy place him and some guys stumbled upon. What I got out of him was that it was called Dead Man's Maze, or just simply, The Maze. And it was a large, fenced property that held within a large maze, filled to the brim with weird shit, and a small house in the center. Apparently, people have seen ghosts or other paranormal shit there. The back story they gave me was that the old guy who lived in the house started constructing the maze for his granddaughter. She unexpectedly died, and out of grief, he just continued to add to the maze for her. Apparently, she was even buried on the property. They also mentioned that he may have been in some kind of cult, and that the maze may also have had some significance to that. But naturally, I thought my older brother and his friend were just fucking with me. And to this day, I think some of the details that they gave me were added in to do just that, but they were reluctant to give me more details and really tried to scare me out of finding it. At the time, I thought it was just a tactic to keep it a secret and kept pushing for the exact spot, and eventually they relented, but told me I really should not go, as from what they knew, the guy who lived on the property was fucking nuts and would probably attack me or even kill me if he caught me. I tell my group of friends as soon as I get the chance. There were seven of us in this group, including me. I won't post their names, but let's call them Red, Blue, Green, Orange, Brown, and Purple. Red was my buddy that I knew all the way back from elementary school. He became kind of a jock, but we stayed good friends and still are. Blue, Green, and Orange were Red's jock buddies and more friends of a friend, but they were cool dudes. Brown and Purple were my two closest friends and still are. All in all, we were a weird mix of jocks, skaters, and nerds, but we all had a lot of fun doing stupid shit, so naturally, this maze business was right up our alley, and we all decide we absolutely have to fucking go. Late one Saturday night, we meet up and get in Rudd's truck to find the maze. We drive around the part of Phoenix my bro and his friend told me that it was in. Looking for a church across the street from a school near a small mountain called Lookout Mountain. Eventually, we find the neighborhood, but as per my bro and his friend's directions, we need to park the truck near a small green belt and walk out of the neighborhood on a small dirt road that leads to the base of the mountain. Once we found the green belt, we see where the street just randomly fucking ends to the west, and a small dirt road starts. It was seriously strange, like this fully developed neighborhood just abruptly ends and becomes desert. As we start walking up the dirt trail 
and continue on, we slowly start to see the outline of a small fence and realize we are getting close, so we try to go stealth mode as we approach the property. When we get to an opening in the fence, the first fucking thing I see is a replica of the Sphinx. It was probably about 12 to 15 feet tall, and the eyes were painted in a really unsettling way, so I'm already creeped out, and we haven't even stepped in yet. I quietly point it out, and we all kind of nervously giggle, and whisper stupid jokes about the power of Ra and shit, but we all slowly creep through the fence, opening into the maze proper. Holy shit, this place was bizarre. Shortly past the Sphinx was a goddamn fucking replica of fucking Stonehenge, albeit with smaller rocks, but still large enough to walk through. We are all slowly walking around, just soaking in the oddities, but so far, nothing really scary happened. But man did that change real fucking quick. As we move past Minihenge, I notice bird cages hanging on a few poles, sort of randomly placed around the sides of the trail. At first, they looked empty, but as we got closer to one, I realized that was not the case. We found a decomposed, nearly skeletal bird corpse in the first one, and other small bones in the others. This immediately killed the sort of creepy funhouse vibe that we had up to this point. Purple whispered that whoever leaves dead birds out like this clearly has issues, and maybe we should just turn around. But the jock trio peer pressured him, and the rest of us into continuing forward. Eventually we came to a bend in the trail, and got a good view of the property. Calling this place a maze was not entirely accurate, it was more of a trail that slowly spiraled to the center, where the old small house was. As we kept going on, we came up to a series of small shacks, some of which had windows, and in one of those windows, I see a pale white face staring back at me, and just about shit myself before I realize it appears to be a doll's face, so my pants shitting gets downgraded to a light pissing of the pants. Again, I point this out to the group, and we all kind of nervously laugh, and try to get a closer look, to confirm it's not going to steal our souls or whatever. We are starting to get close to the house, and notice on the other side, it looks like a floodlight is on outside. At this point, we should have just got the fuck out of there, but being a group of teenage boys, we were too fucking dumb to realize that, and slow creep around the side. This was the moment where things went from creepy and unsettling, to absolutely life or death terrifying. The floodlight was aimed down near a shovel, and next to the shovel was a freshly dug hole that was the perfect size for a body. In other words, it looked like whoever was there was digging a fucking grave. We all sort of froze when I noticed movement back from behind the corner of the house. I nudge red and nod in the direction, and we see a figure standing behind the floodlight outside of its glow so we cannot make out any features. We all kind of freeze, as it kind of feels like a standoff, but before we could process our situation, the floodlight shuts off, and out of instinct, we all scatter. This is when I immediately regret bringing the jocks, as red, blue, green, and orange take off full speed and are out of sight. Brown, purple, and I book it back out to the trail, to get to the road and towards Red's trucks. When we passed the shack again, that face in the window was fucking gone, and the door was now fucking open. The three of us are now shouting, what the fuck, what the fuck, and we can hear shuffling from behind us, so we all bank into the dirt and bushes to just run straight to the fence and jump it to get back to the dirt road. As we get back to the street, a fucking van screeches up out of nowhere and stops in between us and the truck, and I shit you not. A group of people in white robes start jumping out from the back of the van and start silently running towards us. Their outfits almost looked like Triple K, but without the pointy hoods, and there were at least five or six of them. At this point, I am beginning to realize I might fucking die tonight, and apparently so did Brown and Purple, because they took off leaving me stranded. I fucking bolt as fast as I can into the neighborhood across the road and start running down the sidewalk. 
I was not athletic in the slightest, so even with fear and adrenaline, my endurance was starting to fail me, and I start slowing down. That's when I hear tires screech behind me towards the entrance of this neighborhood. I look around for a place to hide, as there is no way I am outrunning that fucking van, and eventually decide to dive behind a bush in a front yard. I curl into a ball and try to lay totally still, as I can make out headlights slowly coming up near the yard that I'm in, and my breathing stops, as I could not tell if they can see me or not. The van fucking stops for a second, and I start tearing up, as I think, this is fucking it, and I'm dead. But then, the van slowly drives past and turns at the end of the street. Once the headlights are gone, I start gasping for air, trying to calm myself and get up to start kind of slowly power walking back out to the sidewalk to get out of the neighborhood. I make it close to the exit, back out to the main street, when I hear tires squeal again and behind me see the van turn back onto the street towards me. I run as fast as I possibly can back towards the green belt, but as I approach, I see that Red's truck is fucking gone. I just sort of stop and freeze as the reality of the situation washes over me. The van is moments from seeing me in the middle of the street, and there is no way I can hide in time. I really might fucking die now, I think, as my mind races to find some way out of this. And then I see the beams of headlights behind me. I turn around and see Red's truck barreling down and he slams the brakes to the side of me. And before I have time to react, blue and green hop out of the truck, grab me, and toss me like a ragdoll into the back before jumping back in. I come back to my senses as I see the van peel around the corner and start chasing us as Red fucking floors it out of there. The van chases us through the neighborhoods, but once we get to the main road, it's just fucking gone. Red slows down a bit, and we eventually end up at a Walmart parking lot, and he stops and shuts the truck off. We all get out and start laughing nervously and trying to make jokes out of the situation. It was obvious we were all scared shitless and just trying to play it off like we weren't. But I think the laughing came from the relief that we all got out of there safely. To this day, I don't know what it was we stumbled upon or who was in the van chasing us. Over the years, we all stayed in touch, and whenever the maze came up, we all just reminisced about how crazy it was. But recently, when I was back in the Phoenix area, I decided to drive by during the day. But now, that property is just a large empty dirt lot. Sorry I didn't run into a skinwalker, wendigo, tulpa, SCP, and I'm probably not the best storyteller, but this is the closest thing to a paranormal experience I have had and I wanted to share it. B15. Mom is going out of town for a week, leaving me alone. Fuck yeah, dot AVI. First day is fine. First night, I have a fucked up dream. Only part of the dream I remember is the very end. Strange girl. Holocaust skinny. Pale as death. Hair like grease. Starts snapping her head slash neck and limbs in strange directions, lets out a scream akin to the thing. Scream wakes me up. Can still hear it for a few seconds after I wake up. Shake it off as a bad dream. Go to make myself breakfast. Keep seeing shadows out of the corner of my eye. Finish making breakfast. Go to take it back to room. Glance down hallway while walking to room. The girl is just standing in the far corner of my mom's room. Snaps her neck up and stares at me. No pout. Get into room. Slam door behind me. Lock that shit up. Sit in my chair shaking for 30 minutes. Eventually I calm down. Decide it was just my head playing tricks on me. Finish eating and take plate to kitchen. On the way to kitchen, can't see mom's room. On the way back, have a look. She's on the other side of mom's room now, closer to the door. Fucking points at me with backwards arm, elbow facing upwards. Dive into bedroom. That was no mind trick. Grab a rifle. Aim it at the door for what feels like an hour. Nothing bursts in. Decide it's safe enough to go back to browsing the internet 
with my rifle next to me. Do this for the rest of the day until it's late at night and I can no longer suppress my hunger. Bring rifle with me to kitchen. Make a fine ass dinner. On my way back, see her again. She's in the doorway of my mom's room now. Stand watching her because I feel like hot shit with my rifle. Look her over. Arms are both backwards. Right leg entirely backwards. Left leg is jutting out at a weird angle. This angers her, apparently. She snaps her jaw down. Lets out the exact same scream from my dream. Starts dragging herself along towards me. Morale check, 0%. Jump into room again. Same procedure as before. Finish my dinner in my room. Thinking over my situation. Pretty obvious I can't call anyone and rant about a spooky ghost girl in my house. Decide that the only thing I can do is try to face it head on. In the morning, try to stay up through the night. Eventually, fall asleep in computer chair. Have the exact same dream again. When she screams, I wake up again. The doorknob to my room is jiggling back and forth. Thank Jesus I locked it. Aim rifle at door. Jiggling stops. By now, I'm entirely losing it, thinking I'm going to die. Luckily, she does not try anything else, and I just spend the rest of the night online again. Spend my time thinking over what I'm going to do when I face her. Live in a city, so I can't exactly shoot at her unless I absolutely have to. Decide that the best thing to do is try to hit her with the bayonet on the end of my rifle. Then dawn comes. It's time. Fix bayonet. Charge out of room and down hallway, trying not to shit myself. Charge all the way into mom's room. She's not there anymore. I look all over mom's room, trying to find her. Nowhere to be found. Start hitting back down the hallway to my room. She's in front of my fucking door. Decide to stick with original plan. Charge. Run right through her. Feel nothing but cold. Run directly into my room. Fall flat on the floor for momentum. Look behind me to see what's happening. She turns slowly towards me. Starts walking into my room. Kick my door closed on her. She turns into a cloud of fog. Lay where I am for a while, thinking. It's clear I can't hurt her. It's also clear I don't want her to do whatever the fuck it is she's trying to do with me. Decide that the best thing I can do is stay in my room until mom comes home. Luckily, I was weird and had emergency supplies of food in my room. It turns into a siege for the rest of the week. I can't leave my room. Every time I fall asleep, I have the same crazy dream. Every time I wake up to her fucking with my door. As time goes on, it gets more and more aggressive. Eventually, it goes from jiggling the doorknob to slamming into the door with a loud bang. By the sixth day, I've almost completely lost it. No sleep and constant stress make me insane. Sixth night, I know I just have a few more hours until mom comes home and I'll be saved. The thought relaxes me. I start fading and fall asleep. Have the same dream. Wake up at the same point. This time, something is different. No slamming on my door. Dead silence for a few seconds. Then suddenly there's a crash of breaking glass. Sounds like it was from my mom's room. Realize this is actually happening and not in my head. Grab rifle and run out into hallway. Can't see shit because it is so late. Suddenly, a shadow figure runs out of mom's room and into the cone of light coming from my room. Hear the scream again. I've completely lost it by this point. Bang, bang, bang. Shadow figure drops to the floor. I fumble with and eventually turn on the hallway light. There's a knife on the floor. The shadow figure I saw was a human. Big pool of blood around him. Between this and the six day siege, my mind shuts off entirely. I pass out in the doorway to my room. Wake up to someone shaking me. It's a cop. The neighbors had called when they heard shooting. I tell the cops what happened that night, omitting the previous six days. The man I had shot 
was a known felon who had been breaking into homes to steal things. Mom comes home. Cops explain what happened. Everything fine. I'm okay. Etc. 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 After that night, never again see the girl or have that dream. Reposting from earlier Fred. Keep in mind, this will use both my own memories and second-hand accounts from my parents who remember this incident. Be about six years old. Just began sleeping in my own room since we were able to move into a house that allowed for us to have our own room. Excited, because I finally felt like I was a big boy who can live on his own. First night, feel hot. Like, very hot. Live in Texas, so heat was not a rare issue. But this felt unbearable, almost to the point of not being able to breathe. Just go to the living room to sleep and forget about it. Next night, the heat returns. But this time, feels less warm and more mean. My six-year-old mind did not know what malice was, so that was the best way I could describe it. Made me want to leave my room, but I couldn't. Something made me so scared that it got me frozen. Tried yelling for my dad, but almost like those dreams where you yell and nothing comes out. Same thing here, but I knew I wasn't dreaming. Now here is where my memory gets fuzzy, so I am going to go off what my parents remember. Next day, I go to my dad and tell him about the past two nights. He chalks it up to me being scared, all alone in the dark. He decides that day to put a nightlight in my room, and hopefully that helps. Comes into my room that night, like he usually does, and this time, he reads me a bedtime story, all in the hopes it calms me down. He leaves, and seemingly, that's the end of it. Fast forward to about 2am or so, the absolute worst blood-curdling scream he has ever heard comes from my room. So loud it actually wakes up the neighbors. My dad is not a fast man, but that day, you could have sworn he had super speed, the way he was able to get to my room so fast. Our rooms were on the opposite side of the house. Dad basically breaks the door off its hinges and sees me on the floor crying and cowering for my life in the corner of the room. My dad goes on to explain how as soon as he went in, he felt this pure aura of just anger and malice. Dad picks me up and bolts out of that room. Sleep with them for the next two nights. My dad does not talk about the room for those days, not wanting to scare me. Tells me after that, he talked to my mom about it. My mom, being religious and an avid believer in the paranormal, tells my dad it has to be some sort of spirit haunting the room. My dad, still skeptical, decides to say fuck it and sleep in the room himself, just to make sure he did not just imagine it, since he was still groggy and half awake when he came into my room that night. Later that night, he tucks me in with my mother and goes to sleep in my room. Next day, we find him sleeping in the living room. Mom asks Dad what happened. He begins to go on this huge tirade about how the room made him feel nauseous and almost depressed. Said that the heat itself was bad, but that around 2am, he felt almost like taking his own life, to the point of thinking to just turn on the car's gas and let it be. My father is not a depressive, nor has he ever had such a history. Tells my mom that something is definitely fucked up about that room. My sister, she was about 17, hears my dad say this, and, as most teenagers do, tend to not believe him, so she says, she will sleep in that room, to much of my mother's dismay. Later that night, my sister goes into my room. About 2 a.m., same as last night, and same as two nights before, she bolts out of my room. And I don't mean run, I mean she almost leaped out of the room with how fast she tried to leave. My mother tells me that she even caught my sister trying to leave the house entirely in a mess of sweat and tears. Later that night, after my sister calms down, my parents ask her what exactly happened. She goes on to explain that she had been touched by something, and not just in the normal grazing feeling or strange sensation. She means grabbed and groped. She explains that while the room itself became scorching hot, the touches felt like they were setting her on fire, burning her. She said that the pain may have been one thing, 
but the sheer feeling of anguish and despair that she felt while it happened was on an entirely different level. She explained it as the feeling you get when someone you love dies and you have to see their body in a casket. Of course, to my mother and father, they knew what that felt like, losing a parent and grandparent respectively. My mom finally tells us she wants to sleep in that room. Dad tells her not to, and just to call a priest or something. Mom says she wants to confirm it herself. Part of me thinks she just wanted to have a piece of the paranormal pie. That night, we all go to bed, and my mom goes into my room. Same verse as the first, second, and third. 2 a.m., and shit hits the fan. This time we hear crashing and screaming. Dad once again runs into the room, tells me to stay in their bed until he comes back. Can hear sister running to my room as well. Can hear talking, but not real words can be made out. Later that day, my mom explains what happened. Mom tells my dad she felt the exact same malice and anger that he and my sister did. Only this time, she could feel the direction. She could tell where it was. She continued to explain that she just knew where it was sitting or standing or whatever. At first she left it be, since it was not really trying to harm her. But then, she told my dad something and later to me, which to this day has never left our minds. She begins to tell my dad that not only was it there, but it spoke to her. Not the same quiet whisper my sister got, but full, audible speech. She says the spirit began talking about my father first, saying things like, He only chose you because you were the easiest. He only chose you because he needed a rebound. Only reason he stayed was the kid. For context, I am my father's only child. My sisters were from a different marriage, etc., etc. She then began saying the spirit talked about me, how he'll end up being buried by you. He'll never amount to anything because you'll never let him, etc. And this went on for maybe 30 minutes until she just lost it. My sister felt fear. My dad felt depression. I felt malice. My mother felt pure, unfiltered anger. My mom is not someone known for her temper, but when she is mad, she is terrifying. This was one of those moments. Mom finally told my dad to call a priest to bless the house and exercise any bad juju. Call a family friend, who was also the priest at our local church. Priest comes in and immediately asks, Can you show me your son's room? My mother and father never told him about the room. When asked why he wanted to start there, the priest just said, I think that's where I'm needed the most. My mom allows him in and leads him into my room. Priest stops, almost frozen, tells my parents that there is something evil, something cruel in there, and as he said that, he turns to the corners of the room. Same place my mother told my dad she felt it. Priest points and says, There, that is where it lives. It's no spirit, it's a demon. I don't know what brought it here, nor why it resides in this exact area, but something about this land attracts it. Priest, as he says this, begins to set crosses and candles around the room, grabbing his holy water, begins to pray and spread the holy water. As he's doing that, the whole room goes hot, hotter than anyone has ever felt it, to the point where we were all drenched in sweat as this happened. Priest is praying and spraying at this point. Looked like a movie, almost. The whole time, it felt like something was struggling, clinging to the room. And then, after 30 minutes, it stopped. No more heaviness. Temperature went the same as the rest of the house. Everything felt normal. Priest then says that it decided to go. It knew that it could not stay. Fast forward about two years, and my father and priest friend decide to discuss what exactly happened. Priest begins to explain that for some reason, the demon felt an abnormal amount of attraction to that one area. That one bit of the house was full of malice and anger. 
says he researched the house, and from what he knows, no one was ever killed there, or Indian burial ground, or any of that crap. Just something there fed its evil nature. Tells my dad that it's not unheard of for a demon to just choose a random house, and especially a random room. But when it does happen, it happens for a reason. To this day, neither the priest nor my parents know why. Now I'm 23, and to this day, I still think about that room. I still sleep in it sometimes, when I visit my folks, but nothing ever feels off. If you see it, it's just a normal, everyday, middle-class room. I have had some paranormal experiences here and there since then, some bigger and more unexplainable than others. But nothing ever tops this one. Nothing ever gets close to this one. It has always stuck in my mind. It is possibly why I still believe in the paranormal at all. Just the amount of evidence I witnessed firsthand those two weeks or so was enough to tell me this is not all superstition and voodoo. I still wonder sometimes what it was that attracted that thing to my room. Not my parents, not my sisters, nowhere in the house, but my room. Maybe demons are just more attracted by toddlers, since they are more innocent and easier to corrupt. I cannot say for sure. All I know is that in some sick way, I hope I can encounter something like that again. Okay, I'll start with the most recent one. Be 20 years old. Go camping with friends right before I leave for boot camp. Hike a mile and a half into the woods to our normal spot on a sandbar of the Corbin River. Get to our normal spot. Two very nice potheads already at our fire pit. They see our tent and supplies and tell us that they are leaving after the next bowl and they will keep the fire going for us. Our group consists of friend A, friend B, his dog, and friend C and myself, Anon. We set up our tent and get out the food. Give two hot dogs to the potheads as they leave. It's about 4 p.m. We keep the fire going and chill out by the fire, swatting mosquitoes and telling jokes. 8 p.m. We can all smell something stinky. We decide to look around the sandbar for what it could be. Friend B's dog starts sniffing at what looks like a stick poking out of the ground. We go over to it, and like the dumbass I am, I yank on it before even looking at what it is. It was a motherfucking dog, and its leg was sticking out of the ground. I threw the dead dog to the side, all of us flipping out. It must have been buried recently. It wasn't decomposed too much. Feeling like a shithead, I bury the dog deeper this time. We all go back to the campfire and talk about things to lighten the mood. 9.30pm. It's getting dark, and we realized we sucked at planning. We have another hour of fire left with the wood we brought, and all our phones were dead or dying. Friend B and C decide to be fuckfaces and just leave because they won't have a fire all night. Friend A and myself left with a dwindling fire, a crank-powered 12-lumen flashlight, and nothing to do but bullshit. 11pm. It's completely dark now, and only embers are left in the fire pit. We are silent, listening to the river. It was peaceful. We feel safe, seeing another fire going about a mile upstream. Refer to picture for the next part. We hear rustling in the bush hanging over the river to our island. Probably a raccoon. Whatever. We shrug it off and eat in melted s'mores in darkness. Hear a bush shake violently. Something fall in the river like something jumped out of the bush and into the water. Shine flashlight in that direction. Nothing. Large, long strided footsteps on rocks near dead dog. Weirded out now. Flashlight is dead. I'm cranking it like a madman. Friend throws some sticks in the fire pit and pours lighter fluid on it. Six foot flame comes from fire pit. It feels safe for an instant. Can see nothing on island while it's bright. Flames die down a bit and the sticks crackle. The strange noises have stopped. We take turns 
going to the shore and bringing sticks back. 1am. The trips to get sticks is getting to be a nuisance. I ask friend 1 if he wants to leave. No. Do you win on? No. Let's tough it out. We let the fire die again. Ten minutes later, those fucking steps again, in a different direction. Shine my light at it. Nothing there. Look closely. Large, hunched shape, wading upriver, 50 yards away. It gets onto land across the river. Can't see if it's on two legs and very hunched or on all four. It moved up the cliff and disappeared. For the rest of the night, we heard noises on the island all around us, never seeing anything, both of us sitting back to back at the tent. When the noises got close, we would both go over to the beach and gather wood, while the other held the light and hatchet. While the fire was going, the noises would stop, or be far away, but as soon as it would die, whatever it was would walk near us, in the pitch darkness. This continued all the way until morning. We went to talk to friend A's dad about it, and he said we should never go there again. He's been in that forest and seen some stranger things. I live in SoCal. When I was 18, I used to take walks around my area at night. I did this because I hit the sun and wasn't easily freaked out by the dark. This one time, I had decided to take my dog with me, who is a large Swiss shepherd. I was walking up the street by my house that has very few working streetlights, and came across a cardboard sign placed perfectly in the center of the sidewalk, as if left for me specifically to read it. As a woman who is naturally quite curious, I stopped to read the sign. When I realized that this wasn't just a discarded sign, I was immediately overwhelmed by dread. The sign had a straight up riddle on it, said something like, I am blank, I have blank disease and permanent damage to my spine, who am I? I had then decided to take out my phone and use the flash to get a photo of it before leaving in the other direction, but immediately as I let off the flash, I heard what sounded like a gunshot and felt the noise in my chest. It was so close. My dog was already running, ears back in the other direction before I was. I started to run so fast after her and grabbed her leash. I thought I was being shot at, so I ran in an erratic pattern to make me hard to hit. I ran across the street while traffic was coming and just trusted cars would stop for me. I remember looking straight into someone's car front window as they stopped with a look of horror on my face and tears as I ran. I ran into a nearby Ralph's and immediately told them to call the police. I think I was just shot at and I didn't know if I was being followed. They called the police and a bunch of cops came out and found the sign and searched the area. They didn't find anybody. I was later told by someone that a similar sign was found by his girlfriend left on her car window shield in a dark place after work, and that in my area this was a well-known tactic of human traffickers preying on curious women. They watch your pattern, leave a sign that is meant to distract you, and stop you in your tracks, and then strike. Once was at a bar, and some white dude, bar was a little seedy in a Mexican slash Texas city, kept looking at me, but not in a gay way. Anyways, due to me being bored, I started talking to him. For some reason, I asked him if he was from Virginia, and that he looks like he's from Virginia. Starts talking about he was, used to be, supposedly a sniper for Obama when at the White House, for something not quite the CIA, but similar. Had 75 polls, etc., etc., was a millionaire and started a security company, gave me his card. Like almost a year later in, run into a department of public security guy in the Rio Grande Valley. We're drinking because he was looking for a way to blow his per diem and we're going to get sticks or something, but never went. 
He was talking about how they brought him out there, because some company was hacking DPS through China. Also, that he was going to retire in the Philippines. He did cryptology, so I was like, met a guy who could probably use a cryptologist, or whatever, and gave him the card of the Virginia dude. He immediately recognizes it as the company that was hacking DPS that he was brought in to deal with. Weird shit. This past Christmas, I was chatting with a former commando online. He told me he'd had several spooky encounters in the woods, and I asked him to type them up for me with as much detail as possible. I know X hates inner wood stories and longer stories these days, but I enjoyed reading them. I will share them here in the hopes that others will enjoy them as well. Here goes. I'm a military vet, not in US. Seen combat. Trained information gatherer and scout. During summer 2016, I began making semi-regular patrols around my property to catch as many tweakers as I could after I had caught them using my property as a shortcut between labs and crack houses on my road. I captured a few war trophies, like wallets, phones, or hats. But one especially hot day, I was exploring an area I'd not visited before. While there, I found an absolutely enormous old growth softwood tree. Thing was massive, easily 15 feet around at the base. It had good coverage if I wore good camouflage and offered a good view of a highway that tweakers used. One especially hot afternoon, I was patrolling when I sat down at the base of the tree and rested for a moment. I leaned back, drank from my canteen, and closed my eyes for a little bit. When I did that, the wind picked up, and I began to shiver from the unreasonable cold. I opened my eyes, turned to my right, and saw it. There was a human silhouette, about 30 feet in the air. It was totally transparent, about the size of an average adult male, and it hovered perfectly still in midair in front of the older trees behind it. It was clear enough that I could see the trees behind perfectly. All that was there was the outline of a man, without legs. It just trailed off into nothingness. It was like reality was embossed around the shape of this thing, and I could feel it was just staring at me. A slow creeping horror came over me as I stared at it. I blinked, and it stayed in place. I blinked again, and it didn't disappear still. I felt paralyzed with uncertainty and fear. It was clear I was in this thing's home, and I was not welcome. I sat up, and slowly I looped the shoulder strap of my backpack over my arm, grabbed my rifle with my other hand, and in an instant, I was on my feet, turned away and running the opposite direction while the wind kicked up again. Even in direct, 98 degree sunlight, I still felt as cold as in the winter. Trees shook, leaves fell around me, while I sprinted through the swamp back to a familiar territory, till I realized I was totally lost. I ran in the direction I'd come from, from a familiar territory, but I was nowhere I'd been before, in a clearing in the swamp. I took cover behind a fallen tree, and began appraising the situation. I was still alive. Far as I could tell, I was still thinking rationally. I knew the direction I came from, and relative to that, I had a rough idea of where the road was. The creek was still present, and if I followed it far enough, I would eventually find where I came from. Slowly, I began exploring the clearing, and found a small trail behind another old cedar. Where I was, the tree was blocking the exit from view perfectly. I still felt like I was being watched, and I wasn't welcome. But I followed the trail, and after about a quarter mile, I was only about a hundred yards from familiar grounds when I began running. Found my way back to my property. It took me a long, long time to return to that area. I'm man enough to admit I was terrified of what I'd seen. Eventually, I got the balls enough to return with a better plan. And soon after arriving, the wind kicked up again, just as violently as last time. 
This time, I began to pray. And, using advice from dumbass wannabe pagans I used to know, audibly spoke into the woods. That I had no idea what the thing I saw was, and that I have no quarrel with it. But it does not have my permission to follow me home, nor do I allow it to follow anybody I know or care about. I returned to their area multiple times afterwards, and never had any other such experiences, but I made damn sure to always say aloud that it didn't have those permissions. At this point, I asked him if the wannabe pagans ever told him what they thought that thing was. He said the following. Forest white is what they called it. Like a spirit that protects the forest in Nero myth, I guess. They suggested I leave an offering, something without any artificial components, plastic, rubber, etc. So I left a wooden figurine, and a bagel once. Didn't do shit. I found this guy's stories. Nice reads just before bed. Here's another. So when I was in high school, my family managed a burger shack. It wasn't much more than a grill, two fryers, and a cash register in a horse trailer. But we had a good fan base in our town for our menu. In our town was a local schizoid we'll call Roy. In my parents' generation, Roy was a big damn deal. He was the first to bring our high school football team to state. He was popular, handsome, and had no shortage of girlfriends when he was young. But all that changed after his brother died in a murder disguised as a hunting accident by another local schizoid. That drove Roy into a long, long, unbelievably deep, dark spiral he never fully left again. He ended up diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, and every few months would go off his meds. Then he'd begin attacking the asphalt road in front of his shack with a pickaxe. He'd say he was trying to dig down into the tunnel that the zippers used when they wanted to steal things from his home and escape undetected back into the woods. The zippers were so called because of their speed. They'd zip in and out again. Roy had been banned from every public space in that town for his panhandling and threats to people who questioned him. Roy claimed my family had a good aura. We always treated him with respect and my parents were friends of his before his episodes. Roy, upon request, could immediately recite all the numbers off the plate on every telephone pole in town. He'd often claim he was a reincarnated soldier from the Union Army named Robert G. Stebbin. Anyways, my family would often deliver fresh water to him in gallon jugs. On one visit, he offered to show me the room where he spoke with Satan on a nightly basis. I politely declined. Roy had torn all the flooring from his two-room shack to burn for heat, and to expose the zipper's hidden tunnel network. This is where I ended up seeing what I saw. One day after work, I had a friend of mine tag along while making our weekly deliveries. Being off his meds for so long made Roy a serious talker. He'd jabber on for hours with his delusional ramblings, never meaning to waste our time, though that's exactly what he did. So my friend and I sat politely listening to him, sort of, and after a while, I looked past Roy's shack and saw something in the woods behind it. What I saw was humanoid, standing about one and a half times as tall as a man, but about half as wide. It was covered in shaggy black hair. It looked back over its shoulder at us before bounding away into the brush, moving much, much, much faster than any person would be able to in such thick woods. I'd have assumed it was just my eyes playing tricks on me as I was listening to Roy's ramblings. The sun was going down, till my friend tugged on my sleeve and asked, Did, did you see that movement too? After a silent, intense car ride home, we finally talked about it. My friend only saw something move. I got the better look at it. We discussed what it logically could be, till we decided it didn't fit any logical explanation that we could think of, so we agreed just to not talk about it. Roy died a few years ago after letting some tweakers move in with him. Now his old hut has been demolished, 
and the road leading to it is blocked by several abandoned cars and intentionally felled trees. At this point, after I incorrectly described it back to him, the commando specified. It was bipedal, roughly human proportions, just way tall, stretched out and covered in matted black hair. It looked over its shoulder as it ran off. I moved into my house five years ago. The last two years, there have been strange things happening. It started in October in 2004. I noticed strange footsteps, but soon shrugged them off, thinking there was probably an explanation for them. My 16-year-old son, Michael, slept in the only bedroom that was downstairs, while myself and his little sister have our bedrooms upstairs. I would wake up in the morning with Michael sleeping on my bedroom floor. He at first heard strange noises, then he said he saw shadows moving across the room. He came running from his room one day because his plug flew from the wall. Yet again, I put it down to electrical faults. He has felt something brushing him too. I have been with my partner Mike for a year now, and he moved in with me in April. At first, Mike couldn't sleep with the noise of someone moving about up and downstairs, always checking, but nothing there. He would always say, Did you hear that? I was just used to hearing them. Four months ago, Mike was sitting at the computer, which is beside Michael's bedroom door, and he jumped up in pain. He lifted his shirt, and there was a deep scratch on his stomach. There were no sharp instruments about and there was no possible explanation for this. The computer always acts up for him, but for no one else in the family. I am also catching shadows out of the corner of my eye, and I'm putting it down to my imagination. We were lying in our bed, two weeks ago, watching TV. I lie nearest the doorway, and I saw a flowing shadow going into my daughter's bedroom. Mike jumped up, and shouted that he saw it too. For once, I was completely freaked out. I had to sleep on the other side of the bed. Everything was forgotten, and then two days ago, Mike was sitting on the computer chair, holding a piece of drawing paper in his lap. The paper hit him in the eye and took out a chunk from his cornea. He is in complete agony and has been attending hospital. He cannot explain how the paper hit his eye from the angle he was holding it on his lap, but knows that even if he tried to do it himself, it would be impossible. At first I thought it was just a mischievous ghost of some kind, but now I am starting to get very worried with this thing assaulting my partner. It's no longer mischievous, but evil. I wonder if it's the shadow that has always been with me, that I have always seen from the corner of my eye, or if it was something that's already in the house. Two weeks ago, my son came screaming from the bathroom, saying he'd seen a face all bloody and wrapped in a dirty sheet. He took his own life last Friday, and we were all devastated beyond words. His note said, I got it mom, check the camera. When I was working at a warehouse, I had a guy tell me something very weird. Work in a warehouse not too far from a river. People say local mobsters used to dump bodies there. This is kinda relevant. One of the things we used to do was go and gas up the work trucks, meaning we'd park somewhere out of sight and drink some beers. Our favorite spot was a secluded area by the rivers surrounded with trees. Now, lots of other warehouses are no longer in use, and we're not really next to any busy roads, so the area is kinda quiet and isolated. One day, me and a guy named Floyd are parked there. Floyd needs to take a piss, so he walks off with his beer and disappears into the trees. I'm finishing my beer when I hear a pop inside the tree line sounded like a gunshot. I think about driving off 
and leaving Floyd there alone, but I get out and I run into the tree line. Floyd is standing there, staring into space, beer still in his hand. He looks hypnotized. He's not even blinking. I shake him by the shoulder a few times. He finally starts blinking and shakes his head and then looks at me. Did, did you see that? He said. See what? It looked like a big piece of glass came up out of the river. He said it looked translucent like normal glass. Then he heard rustling and saw two tall men dressed in black walking through the trees not 10 feet away from him. They were pushing a furred, blindfolded man towards the river. One of the men in black kicked the blindfolded man to his knees and put a pistol to his head. Floyd watched as the man fired the gun. Floyd's not even panicked for some reason. His eyes move towards the large glass hovering above the men. Feels like he's being attracted to it, and he notices it's no longer translucent, but bright white. The next thing he knows, I'm shaking him awake. This story did not sit well with me. Floyd's no bullshitter, and I tell him, let's get the fuck out of here, man. He says, fuck, I still gotta finish my beer. He sips on it casually as we stare out into the river. We don't say a word the entire time. I worked with Floyd for five years, and he was not the kind to make up stories. He was kind of a moron, to be honest, but he wasn't a liar. I think about the stories of mobsters disposing of bodies in the river, and I wonder if that's somehow related. Be at best friend's house, watching Robocop. Dad comes to pick me up. Comes into the front room. He has a chat to my friend's dad. Eventually, we go to leave. All walk out to the front door. Friend's dad puts his hand on the back of my neck in a fatherly way. As we're walking, he suddenly squeezes my neck really hard. I don't say anything, but it really hurt. Later, friend's mom leaves him and he takes his own life. Friend has to move to a shitty house with his mom has to buy second-hand furniture and stuff. Go round, and he says he has something to show me. Tells me to go into the wardrobe, and he's going to close the door. Get in with all his clothes. He slides the door shut. Your mom was a slut, is written on the inside of the cupboard. All happened, and while there's every chance it's just a weird coincidence, or my friend writing it as some weird coping mechanism about his dad killing himself, I've always remembered it. Someone killed his pet cat and left it on the front door of the new house too, and now I'm thinking about it. Good day, X. I am the author of some other posts on this board. I have had very odd experiences with what I am suspecting to be a targeting campaign hell-bent on my destruction. After what I've been through lately, I know without a tiny fucking doubt that this is something serious, and it is only going to get worse. I am not crazy, but they are trying very hard to make me. As I said in the first post, people literally analyze my every move in front of me in a very condescending tone. That has not stopped, and I recently found out something very unsettling, but not necessarily surprising. One of my few friends got a hold of my sister's number and has apparently been texting her practically every single fucking detail about me he could imagine. Every little criticism, every single time I do something, his filthy self doesn't like, he goes babbling to her, complaining like she's my mother. If I'm not constantly contacting that fucker, he goes and complains like a fucking child that I hang out with everyone but him. Thankfully, my sister told him to fuck off, but he still won't. Another one of my friends is now doing a similar thing, where practically every secret I told him, he has to say it out loud at random times without any fucking consideration, or even just blurt out things that aren't true. 
he once saw me build a swastika in Minecraft as a joke, and is apparently now fully convinced I'm some sort of neo-Nazi. Recently, my father was in the other room, and this bitch has the nerve to say, does anyone know you're like a neo-Nazi? He didn't even say it as a joke. He actually sounded curious, like he was planning to tell the whole world what my reply was. That's the thing about my friends. They no longer joke around with me. They are all tracking my every action with the seriousness of a robot. I no longer sense their playful energy. I only sense a mix of disgust, hatred, and a determination to unravel all of the information in my brain. Funny enough, when I first posted about my gang stalking on X, I complained that everyone was ignoring me. But now, practically everyone sticks to me like a magnet and complains if they can't hang out with me. It's almost like them, being the hive mind they are, all realized they could inflict the most suffering on my being by being with me as much as possible. I have very few people who I fully trust now, my family and a small friend group, but I have noticed that even they have changed slightly. It seems like everyone is getting sadder. I can feel the pain in the souls around me, and this has nothing to do with my pandemic, my 2021 bad year. This is something much bigger. They're all hiding something, and I have a strange feeling that they too are being persecuted. Hell, I find it safe to assume that gang stalking has spread to everyone to some extent. Well, I am tired of remaining silent. We humans must stop pretending we are all fine and speak up before we are defeated. When I first started this incarnation, I made it my mission to bring love, light, and hope to all benevolent beings. I would have never thought of causing harm to anyone for any reason. Are my tormentors fellow tortured souls who have been hijacked or agents of evil that should be put in their place? I really want to keep pushing so I can stay true to myself and not bring down the vibration of Mother Earth, but my strength is waning. And I am very sure many of us here are in the same position. Just a few more straws before we all snap. What do we do to get out of this? What is the best course of action? Be me, 20 year old art student with no friends. Go on long night walks to get out of the house and clear my head every night. Usually just circle my neighborhood and rest to smoke a cigarette at a nifty secluded spot for maximum comfort. One winter night, I go out like normal, but about halfway through, start developing the feeling that someone is nearby and or watching me. Double time, because I want to be alone. See a human-like shadow in my peripherals. Nah, famalam. JPG. Ditch my usual path and split to a long, grassy area between my neighborhood and the one next to it. Walking along and check my sex to see if I'm just being paranoid. Shadowy, hooded blackness approaching about 25 feet behind me. Proceed to shit bricks. Nowhere to run. Can't jump any fences because all the neighbors have guns and mean dogs. That face when? Texas. Turn around and start walking back. As I approach this person, I'm mentally preparing myself to pull out my shitty $10 pocket knife and slice someone. Get closer. Heart is pounding. I start to make out a face in the shadow, which to my surprise was white. Female voice asks, Hey, have you got a cigarette? It's just some chick I give her a cigarette because she was actually kind of pretty. Black hair, pale skin, maybe five foot six. I light it for her and she deeply inhales. Exhales into my face. Suddenly feel really dizzy. Not the nervous kind either. More like I'm definitely about to pass out dizzy. Knees collapse. She kneels down and whispers, Sleep. Pass out. Wake up the next afternoon feeling really sore. Thought it was just a crazy dream. Counted my cigarettes. This definitely happened. I posted this in a green text thread about a week after it happened, and some anons pointed out that I might have been assaulted. Still not sure about that, 
since she was attractive and I haven't bothered to get checked. I've been getting gang stalked heavily, guys. It's bad. Walking on my street. Woman following me. She gets close to me and throws a fucking bloody tampon at me. I yell at her, fuck you, bitch, but I don't hit her because she's a woman. I go home and call 911. Doesn't ring. Try multiple times. Try the police station. Phone doesn't work. I hear something outside. I run out and there's a guy in my tree in the front yard. I panic and throw a shovel at him. I miss and he jumps out and runs off. Go inside. Take a quick shower. Terrified. Someone has been inside my house. The TV is tilted to the left. My couch has been moved forward. Run outside and decide to spend the night under the bridge again. What the fuck, guys? Stayed at a hotel once and some guy tried to break into my room. In my hotel room. It's late. Thinking about hitting up the bar downstairs. Put on my shoes and get ready to leave when the doorknob starts to jiggle. Look through the peephole and see the weirdest looking guy I've ever seen. Kinda looked like the robot from Red Dwarf. Pick related. Very smooth skin, but kind of angular features. He's jiggling the doorknob. The entire time, he's staring right into the peephole, like he knows I'm watching him. Has this very casual smile on his face. I immediately ring up the front desk and tell them someone's trying to break into my room. The doorknob stops rattling at this point. The guy on the phone says he doesn't see anyone on the camera, but they'll send up security. Security checks up on me. I tell them I'm fine. They never find the guy. There's a very old fort that the city of Alicante is built around. My friend, let's call him Lucas, had spent all day up there. Dude's Hispanic. I guess he wanted to get in touch with his roots, rather than spend time on the boardwalk. It's a pretty long hike down to the city, and by the time he got down, it was well past sunset. Europe is cool, because a lot of the older cities are built like mazes. A single wrong turn can fuck you up. Knowing Lucas, he probably took a dozen. Anyways, he ended up in a very old part of the city, like an ancient ghetto. There was a festival slash party happening at the time. I forget the exact date we were there, but a quick Google search leads me to believe it was the bonfires of St. John. Pretty much the whole city had gone to the festival, me included. I was wasted, but I recall very pretty women doing some very creepy dancing. Lucas wasn't as alone as he thought. I don't know if all of southern Spain is like this, but there was a noticeably high amount of beggars missing limbs. Easily a beggar without an arm or a leg in one out of every three alleys you'd walk by. As Lucas is walking through alleyways to get back home, Lucas is an idiot, by the way, he runs into one. An old, wrinkled man with nothing but a left arm is staring daggers at my friend. Lucas's Spanish is more like Spanglish, but he can get by in Spain much better than me, who only knew Yo Necesito Albano. The beggar has a coin in his hand. From what Lucas can understand, he wants to buy something from him, or for him to buy something for the beggar. The beggar is insisting to buy his legs. Lucas hears a noise. Behind him is a second beggar, missing his arms and mumbling to himself. At this point, he realizes he's in a back alley in a foreign country with two schizos and decides to bolt. The armless man shrieks, chased him for at least a block before Lucas got away. Don't talk to beggars. Here's a real story from almost 20 years ago. Be me, 14 years old. Best friend and I head out backpacking to a high mountain lake during the summer to get drunk and high in peace. Steal an old man's single shot .22 bolt action rifle. Hear noise at night. Being drunk and a little high, get scared and grab the .22 rifle. 
Noise stops. Point rifle where we last heard the noise. Start falling asleep. Noise gets closer and louder. Wake up. See shadow. Panic. Pull trigger. Bang. 22 goes off. Shadow disappears. Friend wakes up and laughs. He goes back to sleep. Stay up all night clutching the 22. At first light, we go searching. Find a blood trail. A major amount of blood. Follow blood trail. Find horse tied to tree. No saddle or anything. See person laying next to tree. Body is shirtless, covered in blood and wearing leather pants and has some feathers tied in long hair. Motionless for about 30 minutes. Person is Native American. Inspect body. Entry wound in thigh. No exit wound. Blood all over his hands, legs, and abdomen. In one hand is a bloody rag. Little bone knife in a leather sheath on his waist. Friend tries to approach the horse. Horse panics and breaks free and runs off. We panic and run back to camp and pack up and go home. I still don't know if it was just a native guy trying to get back to his roots or what. Maybe he was trying to live like a native. I don't know. I don't know why he didn't call out to us or even scream after being shot. Guy and his girlfriend go hiking in Washington. Don't return. Family report them missing. Later, Guy is found dead via gunshot to the head in a sleeping bag. Months later, girlfriend's skull is found in a street. Her body is discovered nearby. She had a tube sock tied around her neck. A month later, an unrelated two-year-old girl turns up at a grocery store alone. She is taken to the police, who grandmother sees her on TV and calls her. The police ask the little girl where her parents are. She says, Mommy is in the trees. Girl's mom's body is found half buried in snow in a forest. The dad's truck is found nearby. Dad is nowhere to be found. I used to have this blank theater mask that I put on while standing in front of people's houses in the middle of the night, never saying or doing anything wrong, except trying to get eye contact with the people who were up at that time. Sometimes I used to get a scared face or a startled scream, but mostly, I went unnoticed. Carefulness was important, so I only went out at random dates in different neighborhoods. Thing is, this one time, a guy actually came out to meet me. I was going to run away, but he opened the door, and he just stood there, looking at me in the eyes. It became a game of chicken, but I didn't budge. He seemed delighted that I stayed, and took a step to the side, signaling to me that I could come in if I wished. However, I had noticed that he wasn't wearing any form of nightly attires. He was fully clothed, shoes included. The thought hit me that maybe he didn't live there. So I ran, and once I came home, I got rid of my mask. I still can't forget what he shouted to me as I ran. Why are you leaving? Aren't we the same? Years back, movie theater near my house is a shithole on the verge of bankruptcy. One Tuesday morning, I show up to watch a shitty movie. Buy a ticket from the old timer at the window. Theater layout is strange. You have to walk through a wide lobby, past concessions, which are always closed, and down a narrow hallway. At the end of the hallway, you can go left or right to your theater. I find a little man waiting at the end of that narrow hall. He isn't dressed like he works there at all. Ask me to see my ticket. He kinda looks like the dude who shouts, I'm an NYU film school graduate sucker. Pick related. Apparently, his name is Douglas Levison. Hand him my ticket, and he points me the wrong way. He's watching me strangely, and shifting from foot to foot like he has to piss. I don't know why, I just go left like he told me, 
even though my movie is to the right. Look back and the guy is watching me, hopping from one foot to the other. I slip into a random theater. So now I'm watching the new Mamma Mia movie all by myself in an empty theater. Start scrolling Instagram on my phone because I'm bored. Look back up and see movement at the bottom of the theater. The little man is down there. I can tell it's him because he's still hopping from one foot to the other. I see him walk up the stairs and hear him slip into the row behind me. He sits down directly behind me. Feeling watched, I put my phone away and try to enjoy the movie. The guy keeps shifting in his seat really loudly and grunting. Near the end of the movie, I hear the little man sigh really loud. Then hear what has to be piss dropping onto the floor behind me. The little man ambles back down the stairs. He trips on one of the last steps and eats shit. I see him writhing in pain on the ground, groaning. I watch him crawl out of the theater, on hands and knees, sniffling. Movie ends. I stand up and look behind me. The seat where the little man sat has a puddle of piss in it. Piss is dripping from it and pooling onto the ground underneath. I hurry down the steps. Follow a little trail of piss towards the theater exit and find the little man holding the door open for me. The crotch of his pants are soaked, still dripping piss. His bottom lip is split and swollen and bloody. Blood is dripping down his chin. He's smiling painfully. Thanks me for coming in. Spits blood at me as he talks. I say thanks a lot and hurry past him. Hurry past the old timer in the ticket booth. He seems to be asleep. Sit in my car for a second, text someone on my phone, then drive off. As I leave, I drive past the entrance one last time and see the little man sitting in the ticket booth. He waves at me as I leave. Theater closes down a month later. I've got Maori, native New Zealander blood, and I went to a family gathering around Christmas when I was younger the family being on my mother's side, where I get the Maori blood from. This gathering was way up in North New Zealand, which is mostly just Maori land, and as rural as all fuck. No shit, as me and my family pull into the farm it's being held on. There's a boar on a spit, some of the uncles, adults were just called aunties and uncles, had caught earlier in the day using spears and knives. Anyway, there's a creek slash stream that runs through the property, which the kids went down to and swam in most days. A lot of the time, we'd all let ourselves float down a while on inflatables or just by the current. At one point on the bank, on the farm side, was about two meters high or so, but there was a small ledge about halfway down that you could get down on from the top, but not from the bottom. Me and two of our boys reckoned it would be a brilliant idea to use that ledge for eeling. We told the adults, and they just shrugged and told us to knock ourselves out. So me and these two guys, we go to this ledge, a fucking bunch, using those hand casters, pick related, and having fun, chilling in this picturesque place, surrounded by rolling hills, green fields, and bushland. Us three boys even found a cool place further down the stream no one else went to, where only we would hang out. But then it got weird. A few times out swimming, all of the kids got a little anxious, and there was a couple times we could swear we saw a figure standing on the far bank as we floated down the stream. It got to the point where me and the two guys were out eeling. We hadn't caught anything so far, which was weird, because this stream should have been essentially untouched, and we saw a shadowy figure step out and walk towards us on the opposite bank, then begin walking across the water. Of course we shit ourselves, and book it out of there. I remember being in complete terror. We told some of the older adults slash elders about this, and they seemed a little concerned, even when they dismissed it as it was probably just the farmer from the next property. But unless that farmer was Jesus from the Shadow Realm, I didn't buy that shit. Anyway, us boys had only been eeling during daylight hours, and we wanted to go out at night because that's the best time to catch eels. One of the older cousins, early twenties, said he'd come along, 
and about six girls beg to come along too. So ten or so people go out at night to catch the meals, all crammed onto this tiny ledge. We're there for a few hours, the girls complaining about being bored, while us boys told them to shut the fuck up, worried that they'll scare off the eels. That's when one of the girls gets a tug on her line. A tug that nearly pulled her off the edge into the inky black waters beneath us. The older cousin grabs on and starts pulling the line. He's digging in his feet and he's struggling. Me and the other two boys grab on too, all trying to yank this line up, thinking we hit the jackpot. A couple minutes go by when we get some progress, slowly pulling the line in. One of the girls turned on a light, but that's all over the place because they're all screaming and freaking out and shit. But I noticed something long and really thick being pulled out of the water with no indication of ending. An immense eel eventually crests the ledge. This motherfucker was huge, slightly thicker than the one in the picture and way longer too. This thing is a meter out of the water and still looks to have most of its body in the water. But this fat fucker's head is only over the ledge for a couple of seconds when it lets out a fucking roar. A little like a dog bark, but way fucking louder. And the line snaps as it slides back over the ledge and splashes into the water. We're stunned, and the older cousin tells us we all have to go back, so we walk back through the dark, a little disappointed, but also a little frightened. We swim in that creek, and a giant fucking eel that roars lives in it. When we got back, we told the elders our story excitedly, with them nodding and wowing, but they didn't seem surprised, and actually seemed relieved, but told us we weren't to eel in the stream anymore. After that, we didn't see the shadow man again, but not long before my family left, while stopped swimming, I felt something thick and slimy slide past my leg when we were near the ledge, and looking back on it, I'm convinced as to what that eel was. In Maori legend slash folklore, there is a creature called the Tanifar, which guards certain areas in nature or is a guardian for tribes and subtribes, in which case it is called a kotiaki, a guardian. They generally take the form of sharks if in the sea, or an eel if in fresh water. I think that the elders were concerned the shadow man was an evil spirit or ghost, and made an offering or summoned a Tanifar guardian to protect us kids, and that eel was giving us a warning, specifically that bark. Other stories I've heard about Tanifar have mentioned the roaring sound as well. I want to go back there in a couple of years and try and make an offering, even if it isn't a Tanifar and it's just an eel, that bitch has to be about 80 to 100 years old to be that big, and deserves respect. Shared this once before, not really sure what the fuck it was. Have a shit job, shit family, and no girlfriend. Depressed and bored as fuck with my life. Decide to drive out to Marfa, Texas. Pick related. It's a well-known mecca for artists, and I figured it would be cool to explore. The place is nice, but after a few days, I decide to ditch society and go camping. It's near sundown when I pull my jeep off the highway and mad max my way into the middle of nowhere with a cloud of dust behind me. I'm basically driving into the Chihuahua Desert. I'm not expecting to find campers out here, much less any sign of civilization. So imagine my surprise when I'm rounding this hill and I see a little rundown building, basically a shack very small. Now this area isn't far from cartel territory, so in my head, I'm already seeing dead bodies piled up in a heap inside. Figure fuck it and shut off the jeep. I make my way over to the cartel death house. Nothing but the crunching sound of my footsteps as I approach. I realize the front door is not actually missing. It's sitting 10 feet or so from the entrance, like it was blown off its hinges. Hmm. That's ominous. Oh well. Walk inside, and I'm surprised to see a little flight of stairs right in the center of the room. The place looked like a one-story from outside. This feels unsettling, 
but I decide I'm this far. I may as well go up and check it out. This is when things get weird. The stairs lead directly into an upstairs room. It's completely furnished. Actually looks quite nice. This makes me more nervous because now I'm thinking maybe this really is a cartel hideout or something. But then my eyes are drawn to a round wooden box sitting on a table. Not sure why, but instead of leaving, I wanted to see what was inside. Then I hear the sound of an engine rumbling in the distance. I pause and listen. The sound's getting closer. Sounds like an 18-wheeler heading towards the shack. That's when I realize that I'm not alone. Somebody's in the room with me. I can just make out a figure standing in the dark corner farthest from the entrance to the room. I freeze. The rumbling in the distance suddenly intensifies, loud as fuck, before cutting out completely. Then I hear a different sound. Now, I was raised on a ranch, and I grew up hearing calves calling for their mothers all the time. The sound was exactly like that, but shortened, almost like barking. I hear a bunch of these barks outside the building, then inside the house, then coming up the steps. The whole time I can't move, and I can feel whoever is in the corner watching me. I begin to feel very weak and heavy, like I'm drunk. The person in the corner walks over to me, but at this point, I can barely see. I feel something touch my neck, and everything goes black. That's basically it. When I woke up, I was in my jeep, but it was parked right up against a huge cactus, not where I'd originally left it. There was no shack in sight, and I felt hungover. I actually freaked out, thinking I wouldn't be able to find my way back to the highway, but I managed it somehow. Turns out, I was by Fort Davis, which is like 30 minutes from either Marfa or Alpine. Fucking weird shit. I have an inner city spooky story, if that counts. Live in Maryland, outside of Baltimore. Got into urban exploration in my late teens with my friends. Lots of abandoned buildings and houses to explore. A few towns over, there is an abandoned hospital I've wanted to check out for months. My friends all pussy out. Up until then, we had only explored small houses or stores, and they didn't want to get arrested or run into something dangerous. Thinking I'm hot shit, I go in by myself late at night easy to break into. No security since it was a smaller hospital. Walk around the old rooms, inspect the old equipment, and get myself spooked. Notice down the hallway the lights are still on. Not uncommon for the city to forget to shut the lights off. Wait, what's that humming noise I hear? Walk into what I imagine was a nurse's station and see a running generator. Some fast food on the counter. As I'm gawking at all this, I hear, Who the fuck is this? Look up, and see some guy wearing hospital scrubs. Out pops two more guys, also wearing scrubs. All of us staring at each other. Uh, I thought this place was closed. First guy says, Yeah, it is. And looks back, wide-eyed at his friends. Another few seconds of silence, while one says, Why don't you just sit down for a minute, kid? (laughs) Nope. Um, okay. This seems to put them at ease for a moment, and I take that moment to run. It takes them a second to snap out of it. Then I hear footsteps chasing after me, and them yelling, Kid, wait! Come back here! I sprint out of the building, crash through a door, and keep running into the woods. I didn't tell anybody what I saw, and I never went back. They weren't like tough-looking guys either, kind of nerdy, wearing hospital gear. I've guessed it was some underground hospital slash organ harvesting thing for criminals, but I honestly have no idea. There wasn't a movie being filmed there by college students, and it was at 2 a.m. I have never gone back. B12, doing urban exploration in Massachusetts with older brother and his friends. If you've never been to MA, know this. Lots of old-ass buildings. 
lots of urban legends, and lots of people with too much time and money who enjoy reenacting history. Don't get me wrong, the state is beautiful, and I recommend visiting, but it's like walking into a history book. Spend a few days checking out old buildings in places from the 1800s, reading up on history and local legends of axe murderers and the like. Small towns have the best stories. Local guide tells us we should check out this old ass school that was closed down in the late 1930s. Arrive at the school. Nothing too crazy. Typical small abandoned two-story building. Go through the rooms and find all kinds of cool stuff. The place was literally closed in about a week, so there was plenty of stuff left behind. Find all kinds of books, papers, photos, etc. Guide says we should go see the dean's office on the second floor. Same as every other room, though not as trashed. Save for a layer of dust, everything is meticulously organized. Like, the dean just walked out and no one has touched anything since. Notice a small door that leads to a crawl space. I'm the only one that can fit, so my bro is like, Anon, you should totally go in and explore. You'd be so brave if you did. Well, sure thing, bro. Go inside. It's dusty and dark, and it smells musty. For all I know, I just climbed into Fergie's cooter. Find a shit ton of more books and files. This place was just another storage room. Bro and his friends have this thing, where they're dicks. Hear them leave before I can get out. Crawl to the entrance, and I see a pair of legs. Get out, and I'm standing face to chest with a reenactor in an old brown striped suit. Fucker was tall. At least 6'2", but really skinny and slender too. Also had on a bowler and a handkerchief in his pocket with a gold watch chain coming out of his vest. Just picture a 1920s era suit, complete with a bowler. Also had this really thick black mark twain mustache. This wasn't the first guide to get into character like this for tours. This guy has the most pissed off scowl on his face. Looked like he was gonna punch me in the anus. Try to lighten the situation. Are you next in line? Doesn't move at all. Still has that scowl. Some people don't appreciate comedy. Whatever. Scoot by him and head downstairs. I see out of the corner of my eye, he watches me leave. Find bro and company with the guide sitting in a classroom. Where were you, Anon? Well, either one of your reenactors shit his pants and was very upset about it, or I was three seconds away from getting my ass kicked. What? One of your tour guides upstairs, he's all dressed up. Anon, you were the only one up there. No, the guy in the brown suit, the bowler, the mustache. As soon as I describe him, our guide's face drops. She runs over to one of the books and starts flipping through the pages. Find an old black and white photo from the early 1920s and points the guy out. Is this him, Anon? This was the exact same guy. He was even wearing the same fucking suit. Y yeah. That's Edmund Kane, Anon. 1920s Edmund Kane was the dean of the school. Was caught sexually abusing some of the students. Was arrested and then lynched by an angry mob, was found hanging from a tree in the woods. He was badly beaten, stabbed, and even shot a few times before he died. Edmund got fucked up. No one was ever caught. Most of the cops didn't care anyway. Whole town tried to move on. School closed down a few years later from the scandal. Guide is having an orgasm. Apparently Edmund's sightings are rare. Go back up to the room. She's got her tape recorder out calling for him like a cat in heat. Tells me the crawl space was where he would put the kids while he abused them. Or misbehaved. My face went. Agree. Only because I think she'll have a stillborn if I say no. Get a flashlight and push out some old boxes of stuff. Tunnel extends for another four to five feet. I keep going and going. I'm the energizer bunny of ghost hunting. Find the end of the tunnel and some dirty blankets. Tell myself they were just left there by a janitor. Didn't want to think of anything else that it could have been. Look around and see a carving on the wall. JM, 20. 
MB-21, MO-21, and a few others. All poorly carved. Read off the list as best as I can to them. Then Indiana Jones my way out. Spend the rest of the time looking for the history of the place. One of my bro's friends finds an old school catalog from the 1920s. Guide finds copies of the police reports from the deans, deads, Joey McFreed, class of 20, Melinda Burroughs, class of 21, Matthew O'Connor, class of 21. I don't have to tell you whose names were in the police reports. The oldest one was fucking 12. Getting ready to leave, putting stuff into bro's car out front, look back up to the school, see him standing in the window of the dean's room, staring down at me. Still got the scowl. But, bro, look up. Look up right now. Bro and friends look up. All do the same jump back motion at once. We look to each other, look back up, and he's not there. My face went, we nope all the way home. The end. Be me. Been going to a resident summer camp every year since I was 10. Was a blast. Usually went for two or three weeks. Most kids stayed only one. Camp has a lot of history. Folklore, tradition, etc. Been around almost 100 years. Every week. It was like a one week program, with the same program every week for the summer. There was a night hike up to the haunted area of the camp. It was a lone trail that loops way out to the edge of the property of camp, where there are old foundations, about a half a mile in the middle of the woods, away from anyone else in the camp. Tell stories in the pitch black. The counselors seem to take it very seriously. Stop along the trail and look for signs. We weren't welcome. Some weeks, they would get all the way to the ruins. Other times, they would have to turn around and tell stories at the beginning of the trail. Be me, going to camp as 12 year old. Older kids convinced me to come on the hike. Get there. My favorite counselor was running it, and his oddly serious tone was really unnerving compared to his normal enthusiasm. He gives a spiel about respecting the land, listening to the counselors and taking it seriously. Starting to piss myself. Start hiking. No flashlights, no talking. The counselors had to focus on the noises coming from the woods on either side. They hear an owl, end up turning around. Tell stories back at the field where we started. They started to tell the stories. An old Dutch slash Hessian settlement was once on the property. Lost contact with nearby settlements. Englishmen eventually and find the whole town dead where they stood make a mass grave and burn the bodies. Years later, area is now farmland, grazing pasture for a herd of cows, 1840s. A bunch of cows go missing. Farmer finds them lying dead by the ruins. Even more years later, area is now a scout camp, 1930s. Scouts would go exploring up in the area and telling stories about the ruins in the area. One group of scouts decides to spend the night. They are found the next day, dead in their sleeping bags. Camp actually attempts and succeeds in a cover-up by saying the kids died of some unknown disease. The camp is new, and it's the Great Depression. Bad optics means going under. Years later, 1970s, archaeological dig being performed. Lead archaeologist slowly becomes fanatical about finding the mass grave and confirming the legends. Stays alone on the site one weekend to continue digging. Team returns on Monday. Finds him lifeless in his tent. Shitting my pants hearing these stories. Don't sleep at all that night. Years later, I was now one of the older kids that had been going there for weeks every summer. Think the stories are BS. Counselors are just trying to spook us. Friends think it would be funny if we went on a hike to scare the young kids. We go. 
end up getting further towards the ruins, but counselors have us turn around. Soon, they ask us to pick up the pace. Suddenly, we're all sprinting out of the woods in a panic. Friend thinks it's funny, screams, what's that in the woods, to try and scare the kids. We have a good laugh and sleep well that night. Now it gets weird. Be me, a few years later. I joined the staff and had been working there already for a few summers. I was surprised by how seriously they all took it. Start gaining the trust and talking to older staff members who had been working there for decades. They completely believe there's something very wrong in that corner of camp and take it very seriously. Apparently, there are a lot of crazies in rural New England. Evidence found of occultic slash demonic rituals being performed near the ruins by crazies who believe the legends. Order staff members to seal the trail and prevent this stuff from affecting the rest of the camp. Literally burn sage and perform an exorcism on the trail every year. Scouts dying in the 30s is not a myth and there was a legit cover-up. The counselors take the owls very seriously. Like a warning or something. That's a whole nother story. The owls are not what they seem. Final one for tonight. Be me, experienced staff member who is now aware that this shit is taken seriously, even when the kids aren't around. Still had never experienced anything firsthand. End up volunteering to help run the hike. Huge group that week. Needed extra counselors to help out. Midway through the hike, I am walking right in front of one of my staff friends. Pass a particular tree. Get crazy sensation of being unnerved. Shivers down spine. Ask friend, Hey, did you feel that? Replies, Feel what? And as he passes the tree, goes silent. Yeah, holy shit, I felt that. We ask the other staff members if this may mean we should turn around. We decide to keep going. Get a couple hundred meters up the trail. Distinctly remember not being able to shake the feeling that we weren't welcome. At the front of the group, a huge tree falls across the trail, right in front of the lead counselor, only a yard or two away. Everyone else heard the huge tree just come down and are frozen in their tracks. Lead counselor, audibly terrified, yells to turn around and get out of the woods. Didn't sleep a wink that night. That's one story of many. In my years working there, I had accumulated enough paranormal experiences, more than I feel like telling tonight, lol, and eventually began to understand that this kind of Wiccan occult stuff is very real, and there are people out there who treat it as such. Tired, but might post another story tomorrow. Some of you wanted me to continue, so I'm just gonna start going. I have a lot to tell. Worked at this camp for four summers. Had a ton of different experiences. I don't want to be too specific about a few things. Don't want to dox myself or co-workers or the camp itself, but otherwise, I'm telling it as I experienced it. This is simultaneously the story of how I went from an atheistic paranormal skeptic, as they programmed us in school, to the true understanding that there is much more going on in our world than we are not yet aware of. I guess I'll start with this one. Chronologically, this is after I went as an older camper, and before I'm a few years into staff. It's also the first time I really started to question what the hell was going on up there. Be me. First year on staff. Kind of a moron at the time. Joined because of the heavy inspiration of my favorite counselor. Ran the archery area and also the weekly spooky hike. I get hired as the assistant to the shooting sports area. Not just archery, but rifle shooting. Trailhead for this spooky trail begins, at one end, next to the archery pavilion. Don't go on the hike until about three weeks into the summer, when one of other staff in my cabin wanted to go, 
and see how they faked all the noises and spooky stuff. Counselor friend and I get there, help out the staff in charge, but we are mostly just watching them handle things. They give the speech about respecting the land, staying quiet, etc. We go. Nothing happens all the way up to the ruins. We get there. Everyone sits down. The counselors in charge start telling the stories. Cabin mate and I are told to watch the woods and listen closely. We're told to make a perimeter between all the campers and the surrounding woods. Story's going well. Obviously by now, I had heard them many times and generally figured they were more legend than truth. Suddenly, a loud bird-like noise screeches from trees right above us. Owl? Cuts through the silent forest. Counselors all turn on their flashlights and the kids are obviously scared or startled at least. Remember thinking that wasn't a speaker. I thought they hid like Bluetooth speakers in the woods and played noises like a skeptic moron. Lead counselor stops in his tracks, telling the story, and asks the second in command. Okay, first owl, do we go? Other staff responds. If we hear it again, we go. Kids are shitting their pants. I'm realizing that was a bird, 10 feet away, who basically just screamed at us in the middle of the pitch black woods. Something I'm going to pause and say right here is that fear does make you see and hear things. Once I realized that, the owls were not what they seemed. Cheesy, I know, but that's the best way to describe it. As if the owls that called to us up there were neither doing so due to random chance, nor due to some natural behavior. I decided to start seriously investigating, or at least trying to understand why the experiences we had up there occurred. In the back of my mind, the scientific part of me always remained conscious that with the combination of the law around the area, the stories told, and the collective fear they induced by how seriously the counselors seemed to take this, it was very likely that a lot of the spooky stuff we experienced up there was due to our fear creating things that were not actually there. Every time something like this, an owl screeching above, happened, I tried to remain as calm as possible such that I could reasonably provide myself with an explanation for why these events occurred and why it seemed like certain people were innately tuned in to whether or not we were welcome. Anyways, back to the story. After everyone calms down a bit, we resume telling stories. Maybe two minutes later, the same screeching noise cuts through the dark woods and the shadow of a bird flies across the moonlit sky right over our heads. Head counselor is visibly shaken. All right, everyone, we're getting out of here. Stay single file, turn on your flashlights. Staff, get a head count. We always took a head count at the start of the hike to make sure we never lost anyone. We hustle our way out of the ruins and back down the trail. Imagine a single file line of about 30 people running through the woods with counselors at the front, center, and back, all with radios. Counselor in the rear radios. I'm near the middle, so I hear it. It's following us. Let's pick up the pace. In between his panting. We hear this and legit start sprinting over the rocks and the roots on the trail. Everyone makes it out of the woods and back to the field with the pavilion. Counselors are now in between the scouts and the edge of the woods, scanning the tree line with their flashlights. Everyone somewhat calms down, and they decide to finish telling the stories. There are about 12 archery targets sitting 15 meters away, unsecured on their stands like pick related. About 5 meters behind the target line was a backdrop similar to pick related, but like a heavy woven fabric, so semi transparent. We're telling the stories still, a few minutes go by. Moon is very bright on the open field, and our eyes are adjusted so we can see the targets and backdrops very well. Suddenly, one of the targets closest to the woods falls off its stand. Some of the kids gasp or start crying. Head archery guy goes to investigate. 
puts it back on its stand and sits down in the grass between the group and the targets. Stories continue. Suddenly, two more targets fall over on the other side of the target line. Archery Guy tells everyone that the hike is over, that they should go back to their campsites. Everyone gets up. I'm helping make sure everyone knows where they're going as we make our way across the field. I'm hanging out near the back of the group, still in view of the archery range. Suddenly, seven targets simultaneously fall over. Older camper in the back of the group tells everyone to run, and they're now sprinting away from the range. I hang back with the staff and think to myself that the wind must have been responsible for this. Pause again. I spent the next couple weeks and years of my time working in the archery slash rifle area, and this experience really stands out as the point when I realized something paranormal was at play. The morning after this happened, I was still trying to come up with an explanation for the owl and the target thing. I figured it was a coincidence that we were in the owl's hunting territory or something, and that the wind was able to push over the targets, or the archery dude had some sort of rope rigged around them, so he could pull them over and scare the campers. Looking back, these explanations were my younger self, trying to dismiss the probability that paranormal things do occur, because coming to that understanding is a very hard truth to bear. Over time, I ended up debunking my own explanations. Firstly, the targets. I actually ended up working two years as the head archery counselor after this, and thus, I saw the range under a bunch of different conditions. On windy days, targets to fall over. However, this usually happens when there are already arrows in the target, and the target falls over the next time a camper hits it from the impact knocking it off the stand. Additionally, and more importantly, targets would only get knocked over by the wind if the backdrop behind them was blown way up, maybe four or five feet off the ground. This was A, because the backdrop provided a serious windbreak for the area, and B, because the strength of wind needed to knock over our targets was greater than the strength of wind required to lift the backdrop up to that point. Secondly, the owl. This one is a little more spiritual, but I ended up getting really good at ecology and understanding that all organisms in an ecosystem are constantly in flux due to the actions of all other organisms in that system. This, combined with my growing trust in my own instincts, made me begin to understand why the counselors took the owl so seriously. It really felt like it was warning us, or that it was aware of the unknown forces that took place in that area, and wanted to try and communicate it to us. This is purely my own belief, but it's the same belief that animals are more intelligent than we usually give them credit for, and they communicate things to us in a way that we don't consciously understand. Maybe some Anons will understand what I'm talking about, but the basic QRD is that the owls are not what they seem, and the staff who have had experiences up there all believe this with every fiber of their internal instinct. Anyways, another interesting story. This is after I had been on staff and became really good friends with all the people who had worked there for a while. Only a select handful of the elders, the people, mostly teachers, who had worked there every summer for 10 plus years, ever really dabbled in the spooky stuff that happened on the property. Campfire late at night with just staff. One of the elder dudes comes out. We're already talking about whether or not the stuff about the ruins is real. He heartily laughs. There is some dark stuff up there, man. Staff, especially first and second years, are really interested in knowing more now that they realize it's not a joke, or at least not taken as a joke by the people who work there. Elder Dude starts telling us stories. This guy had investigated a ton of very strange, occult, wicked, spooky stuff. 
I could say way more about him and the things that he told me, but for now, lifelong interest in paranormal stuff. Had crazy dreams slash nightmares as a kid. In high school, he decides to make a documentary about strange occurrences and stuff in New England. Decides to try and interview Ed and Lorraine Warren. Long shot if there ever was one, but Lorraine was apparently very sweet and let him interview. Ed was apparently always traveling, investigating paranormal phenomena. Lorraine stayed in CT and watched over their museum of all the haunted slash spooky objects they had dealt with over their careers. Lorraine appears to notice that this dude, let's call him Ted, has some level of awareness of paranormal phenomena. She invites him over again, they become close. She teaches him about her experiences and how some of this occultic stuff worked. He has a huge photo album of all the things in the basement of her house museum. God, I wish I could show you these photos. He only took it out around a select group of the staff and didn't let us take pictures. Real life Annabelle doll in her cage. Tiger pelt. Eyes followed you. There was legitimately one camera angle where the eyes were looking right at the camera and a completely different camera angle the eyes were still looking right at the camera. Real Necronomicon. Real Wiccan books. 14 foot tall paper mache satanic effigy found in the woods near Dudley Town. This one creeped the fuck out of one of the staff for years. Skulls and shit that had been used for ceremonies. Anyway, TLDR, this guy was way into the X stuff, way before X existed. Back to the story around the campfire. New staff asks what Ted thinks cause the occurrence is up there. He says that depends on your interpretive framework, i.e. the natives would have called it bad spirits, others call it ghosts or whatever, and that Wiccan and other occultic frameworks have exact terminology for the stuff. Says to call it whatever you want, but know that there is generally an evil force in the area, especially around one particular foundation in the ruins. Younger staff want to have him lead a hike up there so he can tell his own stories. He laughs again. I don't go up there at night anymore. Younger staff asks why. He begins telling another story, occurred in the early 2000s. Very similar night to tonight. New staff want to go up to the area without any campers, but want one of the elders who had experience to be their guide. Bunch of first year staff start hiking up the trail. Simultaneously, two of the older staff, let's call them Will and Dave, think it would be funny to take the back part of the trail, get to the village before the other group and scare the new staff. The trail loops around and the ruins are at the far end. The path normally from the archery area was way closer to the ruins than the other end that looped around to the pond, but Dave taught hiking and thus knew the trail. They embark and try to hustle along the trail to beat the other group. Back to Ted and the new staff, who were making their way up to the ruins. Ted in front, walking along, and hears an owl make one call. Immediately feels as if something is wrong. Keeps going. Owl hoots twice. Ted's spooky senses are kicking in. Owl hoots again, way closer, and Ted stops the group dead in their tracks. Huge bird suddenly swoops down from the trees and flies inches in front of Ted's face. He turns around and begins getting the fuck out of there. The rest of the group is left shocked, as though Guy just left them and is now running in the other direction in the pitch dark. They all run out of the woods. Back to Will and Dave. They kept a good pace, but then hit a patch of mountain laurel, like pick related. I hear Yanni. Dave swears the trail is supposed to go this direction. They start pushing and hacking their way through the brush. Will drops his knife somewhere. They keep going in as straight a line as possible. They end up in a clearing among the laurel. Will's pocket knife is laying on the ground in front of them. At this point, they are panicking. 
early 2000s didn't really have a great cell service. Barely managed to get a call through to the camp office, explaining that they are very lost. Office clerk decides to sound one of the unused siren tones. We had sirens for fire and lost favor emergencies and did drills weekly. Will and Dave turn directly towards the faint sound of the siren and start hacking their way through. It takes them hours to get through. Loop trail was normally 30 minutes long. They get back and get a stern talking to by the admin staff. Wake up the next morning and the whole sequence of events was so strange they felt as if it was a dream. Cuts and scrapes all over their bodies say otherwise. So Ted finishes telling us the story around the fire. Knew that Will was a real guy. Met him in my first year as a camper and ran the archery area before my boss. Go to my boss, let's call him Eric. Same guy who had been running the weekly hike for years. Ask him if this story is true. He tells me it is. That Will had told it to him when he first started working there. Tells me he's had his own experiences being chased out of the woods by owls. I ask him about the night with the targets. Whether he had done anything to rig the targets to fall over. Says no way. And even so, no rope could have pulled the targets over. Uniformly and simultaneously like that. Explains how that particular hike still haunts him. How he legitimately feared for the safety of the campers on the hike. Had never seen anything like that in his seven years working there. At this point, I had already started to understand that the night with the targets was legit. Ask him about the stories we tell the kids. If a group of scouts actually died on camp property in the 30s. He suddenly turns very serious. Opens the archery shed. Pulls out a printed scan of an old local newspaper from 1944. Talks about an unknown plague outbreak in our camp. Says 14 kids died, but disease was being contained. I read the article. Eric turns to me and explains that the group of scouts were literally found dead in those sleeping bags with no known cause of death. Unknown disease was a combination of the limited medical understanding at the time, as well as to cover up that these deaths were very paranormal. I realized they weren't kidding about the cover-up, and that the older staff took the hikes so seriously because they were convinced that these hikes could get very dangerous if we didn't respect the forest and listen to warnings that we were not welcome. At this point, I had gotten close to Ted, and he had shown me his photo album, and I described his various experiences around New England. Some of the stories he shared from Lorraine Warren were really, really strange, but aren't super relevant to the story. At the beginning of the next summer, I'm in charge of the archery area, second in command for the hikes. Guys who ran the program now was studying to become a priest, which unironically may have helped law. I talked to Ted about what I should look out for. He explains that the owls are legit, but other things that we sometimes turned around for, spiderwebs across the trail, newly fallen branches, probably weren't. He explains that instinct is the most important indicator, and that some people are more attuned and more capable of feeling the presence of this kind of phenomena. Explains that's a lot of why Lorraine took him on as a pseudo-apprentice, since, in her mind, he was exhibiting a high degree of awareness for this kind of spooky shit. Tell him the story about getting a really nervous feeling right before the tree fell in front of our group, like I wasn't welcome. He confirms that this is the exact kind of instinct he is referring to, and that is often independent of fear. Pause again. In before, you believe in psychic bullshit and you're talking like you are the nobody. Shut up, LARPer. I tried really hard to understand this kind of phenomenon, that some people could be more aware of energy and flux in the world 
that has yet to be understood in a conscious and mathematical way. I don't know if this has anything to do with the gateway process or perceiving other dimensions or whatever, but I can, with everything that I believe, tell you that some people are able to sense this stuff and that this premonition or feeling of being unnerved isn't some manifestation of our own fear, nor does it seem to be totally random, like pick related. At this point in my career on staff, I had heard that Ted does something to seal the trail, i.e. keep the spirits in, or however you'd like to rationalize it. But basically, it is to make sure that the stuff going on near the ruins didn't affect the rest of the camp. Ask him about it. Says it's real, that he burns sage and performs a specific ritual, where he has to run for the entire trail before the sage is done burning. Gets his supplies from a store in Salem. Apparently there are three kinds of woo-woo spooky egg shit type shops in Salem. A. The one for spiritual stasis who think they can learn magic and witchcraft. B. One that sells what seems like legit stuff. Ted noted that there are a lot of shops that seem legit, and lots of symbols around these shops. However, if he sees a pentagram in the shop, he won't buy from that shop. Apparently, not all pentagrams are created equal. You can draw it with one point of the star facing up, or two points of the star facing up. If you are displaying the upside down star pentagram, you are pledging allegiance to satanic forces. One that sells actually legit stuff. These look a lot like B, but have no dark pentagrams anywhere in the shop. If he sees a pentagram in that configuration in the shop, he turns around and immediately leaves. So Ted is explaining to me the ins and outs of shopping in Salem, and how this ceiling works. Not sure how much of this is real versus mystic horseshit. Ask him how to tell, generally, what is legit. He responds in a way that to this day, I have not forgotten. His tone gets really stern. If someone is talking about spiritual slash occult stuff, as if they understand it completely, and have control over that realm, then they are talking out of their ass. People who really understand the paranormal are those who understand that it is in a realm way beyond that which we can understand. That doesn't make it less real, but claiming you can manipulate it is arrogant as all hell. A few days later, I've been getting interested in the lore all around the camp and want to try and map some of the trails that go to the end of the property with GPS. The camp is nearly a century old, and there were old campsites and foundations everywhere. Thought it would be cool if I could map where they all were, as older decommissioned trails and stuff were not marked on the official map. Do a few hikes around the loop to the north with the ruins in the daytime. Looking along the trail for possible old paths, campsites, etc. Get to the part of the loop with the ruins. By now, I had been up there plenty in the daytime. Not every time had I gotten that unnerving instinct, but when I did, I started to take it more and more seriously. First thing you notice about the ruins area is that the loop's trail bends and goes up a hill, and when you reach the crest of that hill, the sounds of birds fades. The part of the forest around the ruins is devoid of any noise, birds overhead, animals scurrying around, trees, leaves settling. Even in the daytime, there is a noticeable quiet about this region that is distinguishable from earlier parts of the trail. I end up finding a trail that had been covered up by some sticks. Yellow blazes on trees that had been painted over by black paint. Looks like someone had recently decommissioned this trail. Have one of the guys with me stay on the main trail and keep visual contact as I explored what was over there. Hard to explain, but the woods up there feel like they shift sometimes in the daytime. Patches of ferns move around, trails move to different spots, etc. It was protocol 
every time in this area that any time we deviated from the trail, someone stayed on the main loop, so nobody gets lost. I follow the trail about 100 meters. There's a clearing, looks like an old campsite. Rocks and things not normally placed. Ring of rocks in the middle, covered by leaves. Looks like an old fire pit. I take pictures and then make my way back to the original trail. Find the possibility of having discovered an abandoned campsite really exciting. Talking about it with the staff. Go to consult Ted. He's also very familiar with the various ruins and abandoned stuff around camp. Ask him about it. Show him the pictures. Ask him what he thinks. Kinda avoids the questions. Tells me to keep it quiet. I don't understand what is going on. Really just wanted to see if this was an old campsite. I approach Ted later in the day and ask him again. He pulls me away from the rest of the staff and I show him the pictures again. Starts explaining to me in a hushed voice. There are a whole lot of crazies up here. We've had incidents on the property here and found evidence of some rituals being performed around the property over the years. Look at him dumbfounded and not sure if he's actually serious. Yeah. One time, we were walking that northern loop and found a bunch of shells arranged like a pentagram. Over times, there are candles placed on the rocks in the middle of the woods. The crazies around here do some crazy shit. So could you try and keep this quiet from the rest of the staff? We don't want rumors to spread about this. I'm realizing he's being completely legit. Convince him to explore the area again with me. We get back up to the clearing with the rocks, right across the trail from the fire pit, where we tell stories with the campers. He starts uncovering the leaves on top of the circle of rocks. Facial expression changes. It's not arranged like a fire pit. Not like a pentagram either. Some other formation that was clearly unnatural and ritualistic. Points out a few rocks placed equidistant around the circle. That's where they would put the candles. What the fuck is this real, that JPEG? Listen to me. We didn't find this. Nobody is going to hear about this. Understood? I nod in shock. We destroy the rock formation and cover up the offshoot trail. Ted talks to the ranger who lives on the property year-round, as well as some of the really senior staff. All I'm told is that they took care of it. Never talk about it again. That's all I'm going to post for now. I've had a few more experiences, but they're really long to explain, so I'll save them for later. Stories from Rural Russia Growing up, I spent a lot of time in rural Russia with my grandparents. The village was kind of secluded and surrounded by pine and oak woods with a small lake on one side and a cemetery on the other. The atmosphere was exceptionally magical and eerie when fog came down on cold nights, so the locals were extremely spiritual and superstitious. Three years ago, I left for a job offer in Moscow after my grandfather's death and only managed to visit the place just recently on a holiday leave. Visiting his grave again reignited many memories from teenage and childhood years, so I decided to share them here for the sake of it. Over the years spent there, I've heard many stories told by the elderly and experienced some ex-tier-ish events myself, so consider this thread as some kind of spooky story and hearsay dump in no particular order. 4chan says my post is too long with the first story, so I will post it right away. The first thing that comes to mind is how my grandfather used to lose his shit and get mad at me when I did anything remotely fun during thunderstorms. Be me. It's pouring outside. Decide to fix a snack. Grandfather comes in. You mustn't glutton during thunderstorms. Okay. Sit down and play cards with my cousins. 
Grandfather comes in, scolds us, and takes the cards away. Okay. Start goofing around the house, doing noisy kid stuff. Grandfather comes in. That's no way to behave yourself during thunderstorms. Ask Grandfather why. Grandfather then tells a story from his old village his mother used to tell him. The early 1930s. Small, now non-existent village in Briangst Oblast. It started to rain and no more work could be done in the field people gathered in, in a local hub for a dance night. Men bring booze and snacks to make the night fun. Accordion plays. Women sing and tell spicy Russian short book songs, usually vulgar or comedic. Time to dance in pairs. Some middle-aged woman has no partner, so she gets blasted instead. Grabs a wooden icon of Christ, see pick related, from the wall and starts dancing around the room, shouting, got a partner, got a partner, to everybody's laughter. Thunder roars. The dancers tumble and fall. The room is quiet. Everybody gets up except the woman. So they decide to check on her. She lies stiff with the icon in her hands, eyes wide open, not blinking, not breathing. Took two men to take the icon away from her hands. The wooden icon has her black handprints burned in. Heavy rain and thunder is Christ crying for our souls, so acting like a fool is disrespectful. That's why you never act foolish during thunderstorms. Would only read books once it started pouring since then. Got myself a beer. Time for a personal one. Grandparents' house was quite big, and my grandfather was very proud of himself for designing and building it all by himself. The biggest upside for me as a kid was a spacious attic where they stored tons of old stuff like books, furniture, and stuff that belonged to my deceased great-grandparents. Found a pre-revolution tome of Pushkin's poems, published in 1887 once even, which was cool. Anyway, the point is that I loved digging through the old things and to see if I could find something interesting. One of those times was my first encounter with paranormal. Be me. 12. Scavenging through the attic again. Find a bunch of books in an old wooden cupboard. Mostly Soviet publishings of classic literature. Notice some faded album on the bottom of the shelf. Get down from the attic and look through the photos. All of them are just some kid I never knew in different ages, ending with some photos of his teenage years. Come to grandmother and ask her who that is. She gets mad and slaps me on the neck. Tells me that I should never take things from the attic down to the house without asking her permission because it's a bad omen and tells me to put it back where I got it. Refuses to talk to me for a while, so we both mind our business and forget it the next day. A week passes. I go outside to explore an abandoned summer camp walled off from trespassers with lousy concrete blocks, like pick related. Start climbing one to get inside. Here's something crack. Oh shit. Managed to jump off in time so it only fell on my foot, breaking two fingers. Cry like a bitch because it hurt like hell. Decide it's enough exploring for today and limp back home with tears and snot on my face. Grandmother breaks down when I tell her what happened. She goes outside and asks a neighbor to drive us to the hospital. Could have been worse. Just two small cracks. Why did you have to take that album? Ask grandmother what that was about when we get home. She tells me that the kid in the album photos is her dead cousin. Tragically died when he was 16 because a concrete block fell on him, breaking his spine when he walked past some construction site. Grandmother takes me to the cemetery. Turns out, he was buried at the one near the village. We light candles and pray for his peace. Babushka says that the album has bad power because her cousin didn't want to die so soon, and I was probably only lucky because his soul 
watched over me. Older people in the village, despite being very Christian, still believed in spirits, like Domovoy. In Slavic mythos, he is a neutral spirit who inhabits most of the households and watches over them. If you are respectful towards him, your house is safe, and he will warn you if anything bad is to happen. If not, he will cause trouble and scare you at night until you come to your senses and start treating him well. In some cases, he might even force you to leave your house for good, so better owners can move in. If you don't invite him in with a certain ritual when building your house, he will not enter at all, and it will be easier for evil spirits to move in his place. For example, my grandmother used to leave a small bowl of milk on the shelf for Domovoy every other weekend. She and my mother used to tell stories about a dark, shadowy figure that sat on their chest at night when they forgot to do so for a long time. As a guy who grew to 190 centimeters before my cardiovascular system could adjust when I hit puberty, getting sleep paralysis was the most common thing. Sometimes I would even get like three to five of those in a week, so I laughed at their stories and told them the medical implications of this occurrence, like the teenage smartass that I was. And then, a couple of years later, I noticed a pattern that made me doubt that I was really that smart. You see, when I got sleep paralysis in the city apartment where we lived, when it was school time, there was no consistency in the figures I would see. Sometimes those were fat shadowy people, sometimes humanoids with long legs. Sometimes, huge worm-like creatures, disfigured animals, and insects. Sometimes, just staring from the corner while I can't move. Sometimes strangling me. Sometimes running around the room like crazy. It was scary the first dozen of times. But then I learned to go with the flow until I wake up, like you would do in a regular nightmare. Sleep paralysis bros probably know what I mean. However... When I got sleep paralysis in the village house, it would always be the same. Either no visuals whatsoever, or a small, childlike figure with black fur and big, yellowish, glowy eyes. Best way to describe it is pick-related, but with messy fur, like you would see on an old street dog. During the first encounter, I didn't mind it at all, because by that point, I got used to seeing those kinds of figures. I started feeling uneasy and leaving the night lamp on somewhere around the fifth time seeing the same hairy child one. That time I was home alone because my grandparents had to run some errands in the city. A week passes. Had like eight sleep paralysis by that point. Bags under the eyes because of bad sleep. Starting to see things in the corners of my eyes when awake. Minding my own business and doing regular stuff, but slightly paranoid. Night comes. Go to sleep with night lamp on. Sleep paralysis. Domovoy climbs onto the bed like a small child and sits on my chest, staring at me with his yellowish, glowing eyes. Can't breathe. Try to scream but can't. Usual sleep paralysis stuff. Wake up, jumping from bed in cold sweat. Head goes dizzy. Stay awake watching TV the whole night to calm the nerves with background noise. Fall asleep at dawn and sleep until noon. Call parents to come pick me up. Mother asked me what's wrong. Ask her what the domovoy that strangled her looked like. A childlike figure with messy fur and big yellowish glowy eyes. Probably a coincidence. She says they will come pick me up in a couple of days anyway. Call grandmother. Tell her I love her, because that's what real men do first when they call their babushka, and so should you if you're reading this too. Ask babushka what the domovoy that strangled her looked like. A child-like figure with messy fur and big, yellowish, glowy eyes. She asked me why. Lied that I remembered her story and was just curious. He's messing with you isn't he? Um, yes. Get him some milk. Probably misses us 
since we were away for a while. Hang up. Leave some milk on the shelf like grandmother advised. Get sleep paralysis that night anyway. No domovoy present though. Just your typical stuff, like not being able to move when you wake up. Peacefully go back to sleep. The bowl of milk seems untouched, but I still doubted everything I believed in the following morning. Now I wonder what happens when I eventually go back to the old house, since Babushka moved to the city, and my family left it for three years. Not to sound cheesy, but our Domovoy is probably very lonely. Or he's having a blast while we're away. I meant that my grandfather was little when his father died, Kek. Got mixed up in all the great-grand stuff, and lost something in translation. Anyway, here's another one. All the chores are done, and two beers are down, which kind of suits the theme, since this one will feature a local drunk. One day, my uncle, who spent his childhood in the village, came back to visit me and my grandparents. On his way to our house, he stumbled upon his childhood friend, who became a jobless alcoholic drinking in the middle of the dirt road. Me and other local kids called him Bonifacius because he looked like a character from a Soviet cartoon called Bonifacius's Vacation. See, pick related. Uncle walks up to Bonifacius to say hi and ask if he's getting okay, getting blasted at noon. The drunk jumped and started shaking uncle's hand. Mihan, how are you? Long time no say. Uncle says he's fine, but inside he was disgusted to see his childhood friend like that. Asked the friend how he was doing. He says he's good and tells my uncle to take care. Uncle starts walking away, but the drunk calls him again. One more thing before you leave. Be careful walking near the forest. There's now dinosaurs around these parts. Uncle asks him what he meant. You know, the dinosaur Vicky. Cute name for little dinosaurs in Russian. I've seen them in the woods when picking mushrooms a while ago. They breed like rabbits. Uncle shakes his head in disappointment and leaves. Tells us about this encounter. Grandmother gets sad because he remembers the friend as a kid, but by then, he was a brain-rotten drunk. We laugh it off to cheer her up, drink tea, and talk about stuff and uncle's business in the city. Uncle leaves. Fast forward a week. Grandmother decides to call the friend and ask if he needs anything because she was still sad that he went delirious from drinking like that. No one picks up. Grandma decides that he's binge drinking again and doesn't care to even pick up his phone. Goes to check on him in person. Nobody home. Neighbors tell her that they haven't seen him in days. Fast forward a couple of days more. Local search volunteers find him an hour away deep in the woods. Mauled by some animal while picking mushrooms. That face when dinosaurs Finally got him. OP here. Fell asleep. Here's a short one to bump the thread. There was a period in the early 2000s when my grandmother wouldn't let me go outside alone after dusk because there were numerous news reports of local Satanists murdering people in nearby villages. I put Satanists in quotes because those were just mainly crackhead LARPers getting high on bath salts or whatever and committing ritual-ish homicides against drunks and hobos. They would kidnap them in the city and drive them to the forest near the neighboring villages. Neighboring is a stretch since they are like a two-hour walk away. There were no consistencies to the rituals because they would draw random symbols on the trees, cut somebody open from throat down to the groin and call it a day. This happened around five times or so, but the last one being some teenage girl they kidnapped on her way from school somewhere in the city. Police were so pissed they would raid drug dens non-stop and soon the occurrences stopped. The whole ordeal lasted almost a year and Satanists became a new boogeyman to scare the children for a good while. There was one more story I was hesitant to post last night and decided to go to sleep instead 
because it still makes me sad. It's about my grandfather, who spent the last year of his life slowly fading away to cancer that was diagnosed too late. He lived a long and fulfilling life, but it still broke our hearts to see him go like that, because most of the time he was not here. He was just staring blankly into walls. His last week, he was visibly scared, as if he felt that the end is coming, started seeing things at night too. Each morning, my grandmother woke up next to him, lying awake, just looking at the ceiling and waiting for her to wake up. He then whispered about his dreams that were just his deceased relatives and friends entering the room and telling him that it was probably time for him to go too. Grandmother tried laughing it off to calm him down, saying, What do they know? They were silly old fools even before they died. Don't listen to them. You got your grandson's wedding to attend still. He smiled and said, Oh, that's right. Next morning, he told that his mother came calling to him at night, as young as he remembered her. He said later, so she silently left, and he slept peacefully till morning. That day was his last one. Grandmother told us that he spent the whole night trembling in fear and staring at the corner of the room, pointing his finger and saying, the hand, stretching, the hand, over and over again. Babushka tried hugging and comforting him until he fell asleep. He was tossing and turning and when grandmother woke up in the morning, he was dead, lying still with his eyes open, looking directly at the corner. He was still in that pose when I drove to their house from work to say my goodbyes and help arranging the church service and funeral. His expression wasn't scared at all like your typical cheesy horror cliche. It seemed to me as if he was slightly smirking, being finally at peace. Sometimes I wonder who might have been reaching out to him from that corner though. Loved Bonifatius. I hope he is in peace. Yeah, me too. Despite being a drunk, he was a kind man and occasionally got his candies when he went to the store to buy booze. Tell me war stories. Southern Russian Front was the most violent offensive of World War II, and our city was 90% destroyed by artillery and carpet bombings, so I heard plenty of those growing up. But most of these are more fitting for his rather than X. There are some spooky urban legends though, the woods around the village I grew up in are littered with World War II era military stuff from partisan warfare, so people go treasure hunting with metal detectors all of the time. In the late 2000s, there were tons of discussions on local forums about the sites of abandoned German and Soviet forest camps and hiding spots. Apparently, there's one area in the woods that is considered a bad slash dead place by the treasure hunters and mushroom picking enthusiasts. People would often get lost for days when they go there. Some unsolved cases of disappearances too. One of the local old men told me about his experience. Be a mushroom and berry picking enthusiast in the late 1990s. Decide to go deep into the woods where the biggest ones grow. Walk east for hours until the dirt path is overgrown no longer visible. Stumble upon the most plentiful spot. Pick a full basket of shrooms and a bucket of wild raspberries. Already getting dark, so it's time to go home. Start heading back in anticipation of the amount of preserves that would make for winter times. Realize you're going the wrong way, even though it should be the right way, judging by the sun's position. Walk in circles for more than an hour trying to pass through the thicket. End up in the same spot every time. Try shouting, but there's no one around to hear you. Give up and prepare to spend the night in the wild. Got plenty of food after all. Suddenly, hear people talking, playing the accordion and laughing in the distance. Go to the direction the sound comes from and hear the cracking of fire as you get closer. See some light flickering around the thick overgrowth. Exhale in relief and announce your presence before approaching the site so as not to scare people. 
Voices all go silent. The accordion stops. The fire is quickly extinguished. Dark as hell. Hear some rumbling and see some branches move in the dim moonlight. Some man comes around the bushes and slowly approaches, pointing a knife at you. Wears some weird, grayish suit and knee-high boots. He's very mad and nervous. Starts talking, almost breaking into shouting. What the fuck? Realize he's speaking German. Okay, you studied some German during your time in the army. He asks who you are and how you got there. Tell him you got lost and ask him if he knows which way the road is. Man turns his head back and shouts, Ein Russe, into the bushes and charges you as you hear more footsteps approaching. Drop the basket and start running as fast as humanly possible. Man is not following you anymore. Still hear shouting in the distance, getting closer. Some gunshots are fired. Realize that the funny gray suit was actually a Nazi military uniform. Wind starts whistling and bending the branches. It's so loud, you don't even hear the voices anymore. Hit your head on the branch and fall down, passing out from exhaustion. Come to your senses when it's bright already. Realize you're lying on the ground at the border of the woods and see familiar houses nearby. Walk home. People in the street see that your face is bleeding and run up asking where you have been and what happened. Shove them away from your face because too tired to deal with their shit. Germans almost got me. People laugh at you and say that you should stop drinking. Wife scolds you for scaring her and losing the basket she made. Rumor goes across the village that you are an alcoholic who started seeing things. That face when you only drink twice a year, at your birthday and New Year's Eve. That face when ghost Nazis almost shot you for finding their camp. In the meantime, here's another one. There was an abandoned house in our village where we would never go near as kids. It was more of a small wooden hut with a crooked wooden fence, an overgrown garden. Here, I'll need to explain that here, everybody has a garden on their property, but it's not a garden in your regular sense. We call them Ogorod, which is basically a patch of land on your property, mainly used for growing vegetables. Like a farm field, but smaller. Fairly bigger than American suburbs garden though. We would sometimes go in the dead house garden at daytime to see if there was something interesting, but would never get close to the hut. Grandparents told me that a single mother whose husband died in the war lived there with her five children. She was a hard-working woman, but still failed to manage the household by herself. Her children would often get sick, and over three years or so, they all died, one by one. After the first death, the grieving mother started going nuts, and the locals tried helping her by giving her extra harvest and bringing medicine for the kids, but it didn't help much. When she lost all of her children, she would tell her neighbors that she's moving to the city, just so that she wouldn't see that empty house each time she wakes up. My grandparents offered her a ride, but she said she had already arranged for her friend to come and pick her up. Years go by, and the house decays into the empty husk that we share scary stories about. Fast forward five more years. Police comes asking people about the woman who went missing decades ago. Turns out she had some distant relatives who didn't know she moved, so they started searching for her. She never moved to begin with because there's no such name in the city register. No documents on her dead children in the graveyard registry either. Police start sniffing around for clues, letters, and notes. Nothing. Bring the dogs. After the long investigation, they start digging through the garden. Mass grave under the raspberry bush. Found the bodies of her children. She never notified the authorities about their deaths. All five of them just buried in the garden like pets. 
experts prove that they died of natural causes. Woman's body is found buried near them too. Apparently, the friend she arranged to leave with either killed and buried her, or buried her after she took her own life. Friend was never seen by any of the locals, and police never found them. Locals raise funds to arrange a proper burial for all six of them, with a priest and all. Never go near that house or the garden again. Parents smack their children if they do. Remember the small lake near our village I mentioned? It's quite popular among local fishing enthusiasts, but people don't swim there anymore, even though there used to be a well-maintained beach zone in the past. Kids would build makeshift rafts and play pirates sometimes, but that's it. Not that it has a cursed reputation or something, but there were some stories that make people less eager to push their luck and take a dip in the water. When I was a wee lad, there was a man who would just walk into the lake and stand there until the water was at his chest level and stand there for hours with his eyes closed facing the sun. We jokingly called him Vorginoi. Vorginoi is a popular character in Russian mythos. It's a primordial being that inhabits lakes, ponds, rivers, and swamps. Imagine your typical merman, but greenish, covered in algae, and looking like an old man, sometimes taking the form of a giant catfish. He minds his own business mostly, but if he dislikes you for some reason, he would drown you making you his slave in the afterlife. The easiest way to anger him is to swim at dusk or night and fish in his domain without asking for permission first. The lawful evil spirit of the water, basically. Anyway, back to the weird bathing man. People considered him a harmless weirdo because otherwise he was a completely normal villager with a job and a family. Once he even saved my life when I was a baby. Mother used to walk with a stroller by the lake, but one time she got distracted and I came rolling into the water from the steep coast. Vorginoi heard the splash when I fell into the water, opened his eyes and hastily swam to get me out. Thankfully, the water didn't get into my lungs, so we got off with a slight scare. Guess that means I still owe him, wherever he is. That was the exposition. Time for the actual story. Years pass. The man still stands in the water with his eyes closed for hours, two to three times a week. Shout, how are you, Vojinoi? Whenever we go past the lake and see him with local kids. The man just stands there and doesn't respond. Not until he eventually goes out of the water. He's okay with his nickname, so we make inside jokes and conspiracy theories about him. Edgy kid says that he's acting like that because a mermaid sucks him off. Laugh and keep the jokes coming. The village is small, so Vorginoi eventually found out about the jokes we make. Laughs too. Never explains what's the deal with him standing in the water when confronted though. Just says, I guess that's how I meditate. This goes on for a couple more years, until one day, the man goes missing. Last time people seen him, he was doing his usual thing. Disappeared without a trace, and no one saw where he went. His wife was an emotional wreck, calls the police and the searching squads. His boss says that he never showed up at work that day. Bus driver said he hadn't seen him either. They searched the lake through and through. Nothing. Just some rubbish at the bottom. Still missing to this day. Children say he was taken by actual Vorginoi. Fishermen start catching catfish that never inhabited the lake before. Russian spirituality is a weird one. Christianization of Russia met so much resistance from the local heathens that the Orthodox Church had to compromise and allow many pagan holidays and beliefs to intertwine with the Christian narrative. Some time later, it was just one god, and all the primordial beings became angels and demons. One of those were Alkanost and Gamion, the paradise made in birds. 
Before Christianity, they were maidens of the wild, turned into birds by the ancient gods, predicting future and offering comfort to the travelers through their mesmerizing songs. After Christianization, they became messengers of the Lord. There is no recorded evidence of people seeing them, but they are easily recognized by their singing, which sounds nothing like any bird or woman you have ever heard. Be teenage me. Go out into the woods to pick wild berries for babushka to brew some kompot, a traditional Russian drink made by boiling fruits or berries. Walk for hours until the bucket is full. Listen to the birds singing their usual songs. Suddenly, hear the melody you never heard before, but too familiar. It sounds as if it's sung in the distance, but right before you at the same time. Almost like a girl singing, but birdish at the same time. Break down crying, because it kind of sounds like your mother singing you to sleep when you were little. Never felt more peace in your life. Get carried away. Take out your mobile phone and start calling your mother, brother, and close friends, telling them how much you love them with a shaky voice. They're all confused, but don't question it. Say that they love you too. Laugh and cry until the melody quiets down. Now you're just standing in the middle of the woods with wet, wet eyes and a bucket full of berries. Go back home. Enjoy your compot drink. Never question anything that happened and accept it for what it was. Sometimes, comfort is not the only thing those paradise birds would offer though. They are believed to reveal the future to the ones willing to hear what is destined for both men and animals. My uncle had a similar story from the early 2010s. Be my uncle. Drive to the village to see his parents and me. Listen to the radio, but decided to turn it off because his head hurt after a long day at work. Listen to the nature around, mostly crickets and birds. Notice a pattern in a distant bird singing. Something between an owl and a cuckoo. Sounds as if it says, Ogon, 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 over and over again. Ogon means fire, fire, fire in Russian. Don't mind it because not too spiritual, but wonder at how peculiar that sounds. Finally arrive at grandparents' house. Spend a week off there doing errands in the garden and teaching me to do sports. Time to leave next weekend. Go outside in the morning. Can't see shit. The whole village looks like some Silent Hill location. Thick smoke covers the land and ashes fall down from the sky. Turn on the news. Forest fires of 2010 started destroying many households in the villages located near the woods. Whole region is covered with a cap of exhausts from burning trees. Neighbor's house made of wood catches fire, thankfully put down by the firefighting brigade. People get sick and hospitalized from breathing nothing but smoke for weeks. Whole thing lasts till the end of the month, until neutralized by the authorities and volunteers. Put two and two together. Realize that something tried warning you on the way to the village. That face one should have listened to Gamion. This one is from my senior year of high school, about 10 years ago. Be me, just starting to lurk on K. Really want to go in a woods. Recently got my FID. SKS for my birthday. Fuck yeah. Invite my only has guns friend along to go camping near Appalachian Trail. He says yes. Brings a Winchester lever action 3030. Plan is to start up at northern part of Massachusetts. Follow the trail south for three days. We brought plenty of food and fuel. Not much water as we plan to be near rivers most of the time. Buddy brought a harmonica. From now on, I'll call him John. We get dropped off near where we want to start and start hiking, covering pretty decent ground for the first few hours. Slow down a bit after a quick lunch, still moving along pretty well. We stop for the night, set up our tent. I start the fire, 
and boil the water we collected. John cooks up some of our food, plays harmonica a bit. We're just sitting around the fire, eating and talking, bringing up the fact that we haven't seen anyone all day. He shrugs it off. It's a bit shitty weather and cold, so it's not that strange. We put out the fire and we go to bed, sleeping with unloaded rifles. We get up the next day, strike camp, eat cold breakfast, and start hiking again. Suddenly, we hear loud footsteps coming up the trail behind us, running really fast. We look behind us, figure it's a trail runner or a durr running from something. Ready rifles, just in case. The second we turn around, the sound stops. We're a little weirded out, but continue along for a bit. I realize that the woods are quiet as fuck ever since we heard the running. Mention it to John. Relax, man, it's almost winter. Most things are probably just hiding away in their burrows. Decide I'm just being a pussy. Ignore the silence. We stop for lunch near a stream, and John collects a little bit of water from it. Sniffs at it to make sure it's semi-clean. Recoils. What the fuck? Anon, smell this water. Wary that he's gonna splash me in the face, I take it and smell it. Oh god, this is awful. That gif. Smells like rotten meat and piss. We follow the stream upriver to see if a dead deer or bear fell in and is rotting away in it. After a few minutes of walking, we come to a cave that the stream is flowing out of. John walks in right away. Hey John, wait a minute, we shouldn't- Oh come on and on. I've got a flashlight and I'm not gonna fall in, so let's just check it out. Okay, I guess. Grab my own flashlight and my SKS. Following John into the cave, we come to a huge ass cliff where the water falls down. Not really a waterfall, but whatever. It's smooth as hell, made of this really shiny black rock. Alright John, looks like we can't go any farther, let's go back. Okay, and um, just let me look over here. I thought I saw a- Ha! Look at this man! A staircase cut into the side of the cliff, barely visible unless you look straight at it. John immediately starts climbing up. I follow him, but I'm just about shitting my pants. We're about halfway up, when suddenly, we hear this voice. Help me! Help me! Help me! Just repeating the same thing over and over, in the exact same tone of voice, exact same inflection. It sounded like a broken record. The voice was creepy as fuck. It sounded like a human voice coming through a fucked up speaker. Crackly at the edges and sort of deeper than it should be, obviously feminine. It's coming from the top of the cliff. John shouts up to it. Don't worry, we're coming for you. Just hold on. John, wait a goddamn minute. What the fuck on? Are you just gonna walk away from someone who might be stranded or hurt? No, but I don't think that- Let's fucking go. He double times it up the stairs, rifle flung over his shoulder. Help me. Help me. Help me. Voice gradually getting louder and more distorted. He's going a lot faster than I am. That's what saves me. He gets to the top of the stairs, shines flashlight toward the sound. Ma'am, are you- Suddenly stops talking. I'm just a flight below the top. I can hear him walking. Sounds really jerky, but steady. Like a metronome or something. Steps suddenly stop. At the exact same time, the voice stops yelling for help. I just barely hear John whisper. Of course. Whatever you need. Crunching noise. Sound of dripping liquid. Help me. Help me. Help me. It's a different voice, and it takes me a second to recognize it. It's John's voice. Oh shit. Fucking sprint out of there. It's a miracle I didn't break my neck on those fucking steps. Managed to contact a friend who was going to pick us up in two days. Tell him something got John freaking out. He calls the cops slash forest department. Tells me I have to meet them near a ranger station at a small town. I manage to get out of the woods. Meet up with cops. I claim a bear ate him. Lots of questioning. Realize they think I might have murdered him. 
finally break down and tell this old, grizzled ranger dude what really happened when we're alone. He just nods. There's some strange things would happen up in those mountains. Might be I'll head up there soon and take care of it. What the fuck? Is this guy serious? He smiles at me and nods towards the wall of his office at the ranger station. A bunch of mounted skulls. They look like fucked up deer, moose, goat heads, curvy horns, long jaw bones, huge ass eye sockets. Now, I'm off to go kill that bear of yours. I'll make sure them city boys know that you didn't do nothing. I'm sorry about that friend of yours. G good hunting. Thank you kindly. I still can't get over it. Especially since about two weeks after that, the paper printed a story about an individual who wished to remain nameless that had taken down a rabid grizzly not too far off the Appalachian Trail. Four years ago, I went to the beach. I hate the beach. I can't swim. But it was a birthday party for a friend. Friend has a sister, Melissa. She's the typical hot older chick. I have a huge crush on her. Why aren't you swimming, Anon? Friend pipes in. He can't swim. Fuck you, bro. Melissa's eyes light up, and she says she'll teach me. I try to casually decline, but she insists, and I don't want to look like a pussy. Then she grabs my hand and says, Come on. She's smiling at me. I'm melting. And kind of getting a boner. Trying not to stare at her fat tits, bulging under her bright red one-piece. She leads me out into the water, her ass cheeks jiggling as she jogs into the waves. Welp, can't refuse now. The blood rushing to my dick makes me momentarily forget I can't swim. She's holding me kind of close, still smiling at me as she leads me out further and further. She thinks all I need is to get out there and I'll naturally start swimming. She doesn't know that as a little kid, I nearly drowned to death when my cousin was supposed to be watching me. I'm traumatized by the fucking water. As soon as we're chest deep and her tits disappear from view, I kind of snap back to reality. My head is suddenly on a swivel. I'm rubbernecking from the shoreline that's disappearing on one side to the ocean stretching out endlessly on the other. I begin to scream. Melissa's eyes go wide as I start flailing and twisting and slapping at the water, screaming the whole time. Her voice is shaking as she tries to tell me it's okay. But I pull her towards me and begin climbing on top of her. I just want to feel something under my legs. I'm forcing her head underwater as I do this. The shore looks so fucking far away. I feel like the ocean is pulling me into its jaws. Melissa manages to get out from under me and coughs up water as she pops her head back over the waves. I'm still grabbing at her, pulling her. There's panic in her eyes. She breaks free from my grasp and starts swimming away, yelling, Help! He's drowning! I'm struggling, watching her swim away from me. I realize I'm gonna die here. I slip under the waves, still struggling. No matter how hard I try, I can't get my head above water. The ocean pulls me down deeper and deeper. But then, I feel a hand grab mine. Five long, soft fingers. They feel boneless, but they grip me tight. Then I feel myself shooting forward until my hands and knees hit the sand. I lift my head above water. I'm on the shore. Coughing and grasping for breath, I crawl away from the waves. I don't stop until I'm on dry sand. Then I collapse. I hear voices to my right, screaming and shouting my name. Friend comes up with tears in his eyes and asks if I'm okay. I tell him I thought I was dead. He said they all watched as I slipped under the water and disappeared. Then, ten seconds later, I was crawling onto dry land, fifty feet up the beach. I don't know exactly how far out I was, but they said the way I just appeared on the shore so quickly after sinking underwater was surreal. Be me, eighteen-ish, waiting at bus stop, going to work. Visibly crazy old man approaches me, does the meme, recite full name, date of birth, 
social security number, home address, phone number, etc. The man knows where I live. I'm not concerned about this. The guy might just walk in the area a lot and has an artistically good memory about the shit he sees on the street. Maybe he's walked past my house and noticed me without me remembering him. I'm not bothered. He knows what cars are parked outside. Again, I'm not concerned. He knows that I live with my sister's family. This is where I get worried. My sister and I do not look alike in the slightest. There's no way in fuck this guy could know that we're siblings. Shit, at this time, we actually were regularly mistaken as mother and daughter when we hung out in public together. This man has been watching us, or he has an in. I ask how the fuck he knows that. He tells me that my sister and I are going to kidnap and torture him. What? Realize this guy is straight up schizophrenic. Poor guy. Try to soothe him and assure him we don't even know him. Try to calm him down. He grows more insistent and agitated, but won't leave. I get really anxious. Bus finally arrives and I escape. Thankfully, he doesn't follow. Call my sister and tell her what happened. She has kids at home. She needs to know this guy is looking about near our house. She has no idea who the fuck this man might be. Tells me to call the cops and file a report, which I do. After this, we started seeing him everywhere, carrying a metal golf club. It doesn't matter where we are or what vehicle we're in, he always manages to spot us, and stares with the intensity of 1,000 suns at us as we pass. I've been in multiple different vehicles and dyed my hair, but he always knows. Crazy bitch. My family is originally from Mexico. We used to travel down there quite a bit when I was a kid. Usually, we'd stay for about two weeks at a time, always during the winter, so we could celebrate Christmas together. But once, when I was about 12, we went down there during the summer, and I saw a duende. More than once, I probably saw it over a dozen times. I remember all of my cousins warned me not to talk about it, or it might hurt me. The first time I saw it was just a quick glance, really. Me and cousin walking to a nearby river. To get there, we have to travel up the village, into the mountains, then walk down this long, winding path, 30-minute hike altogether. A portion of the winding path travels along a sort of ravine for a while. So imagine on your right-hand side, there's just a wall of trees. On your left-hand side, there's a steep bank of grass that rises up over your head. Cousin and I are traveling right through the part of the winding path when I hear something on the grassy bank above us. Look up. A very little man is walking along the top. Seems to be following us and watching us. Cousin tugs on my arm and tells me not to look. Starts talking about something else. I figured maybe it's a local wino or something. From my perspective, the man looks small, but not that small, so I just ignored him. We get to the river without incident. After that, my cousin explained that during the summer, duendes come down from the mountain Lamau. I asked her from where, and she wasn't sure. Some people said that they came from inside the mountain, and other people said they lived in trees, or that they moved through stones. Like I said, I saw this thing numerous times. I'll mention two of her quick ones. Get up in the middle of the night. First day. Get to the kitchen to grab water. Window there faces a small outdoor kitchen. I see the duende sneak across the patio and disappear into the kitchen. Later. Up to the coral with my cousin. They do bullfights there, and in general, this area is used to move bulls from the village to a neighboring ranch, I think. The point is, it's a very flat area with no grass, because it's constantly getting trampled on. All the trees have been leveled to clear the way for bulls. And then there's this coral, which stands empty at the time. Cousin and I are hanging out there, just talking, when I spot the duende moving around outside. Cousin and I ignore it. We keep seeing it out of the corner of our eye, though. I glance over and it's gone. That one was extra creepy, because there was nowhere for it to hide that quickly. There's literally the coral and just open fields of dirt. 
It's like the thing just disappeared into thin air. Also, I know everyone has a different meaning for Duende. Some people use it to refer to ghosts, but what I saw was a little man, much shorter than any of the kids there, wearing dark clothing. I've since heard lots of stories from other people who have seen them too, but they describe the creatures differently. In addition to what I experienced, I was also told a few stories by a neighbor of mine. Some of them just sound like fake ass urban legends, but they're still kind of interesting to me, especially given my own weird experiences. So my neighbor's name was Leonard. He was a hilarious 40 year old black dude that lived on the opposite side of the apartments from me. He and I oddly enough became friendly after two of us witnessed a dude almost kill a prostitute in the parking lot lol. Leonard and I sometimes hung out on my porch, chit-chatting. That's how I first heard the story. Once upon a time, before I moved in, there was a young man who lived two doors down from Leonard. A fine, upstanding, wannabe gangbanger, who I'll call Mookie. One bright sunny day, Mookie was shot and killed at his front door. Domestic dispute. The GF pulled a gun on him during an argument and shot him in the chest right there in broad daylight. The other tenants had sort of gathered by then to watch the argument and they all saw her do it. She went to prison. Mookie went to hell. Nah, JK. But seriously, Mookie was apparently an all-round piece of shit, so it was kind of a relief to have him gone. Only, he wasn't gone. According to Leonard, random people in the complex have claimed to catch glimpses of Mookie's ghost. Usually, they'll catch his reflection in the windows, and turn around to find nobody there. Shit like that. But the interesting thing to me was that Leonard said Mookie sometimes comes knocking on people's doors. But when you open it, there's no one there. When I heard this, I asked if he'd ever heard knocking like that. He said yes, right before Mookie was shot, which didn't even make sense with the story he told. I went ahead and told him about the mysterious knocking that I'd heard, and he said to me, Oh yeah. Mookie looking for your ass. Keck. Leonard was definitely a bullshitter, but I thought it was cool how his story dovetailed with my own experience. My friend's grandfather lives in a village of 40 people, in the mountains in Mexico. Every single person living there swears this is true. Cave near town that nobody goes to. Nobody has entered it and come back. One night, two teenagers do it, because of a lost bet or something. Neither of them come out. Nobody is surprised, but everyone is really close in the town, so they were missed. Ten years later, Priest wakes up one morning to one of the two kids, lying face down on the floor in his dining room. What the fuck? Within ten minutes, the whole village is standing over him. He's alive. Hasn't aged at all. Wakes up suddenly. Everyone sees it as an act of God. Dude starts screaming, Where am I? Where the fuck is Gomez? Eventually calms down. Swears it's only been three hours since he left the cave. Tells a story. Went into the cave with his friend. Normal cave. Nothing out of the ordinary. See a light. Go towards it. Room full of gold and diamonds and shit. Dudes are amazed. Never seen anything like it, living in a poor Pueblo town in the middle of nowhere. They start stuffing their pockets. Sudden shrieking noise. Both shit their pants. Sound came from where they entered the room. Frozen in fear. Shrill voice echoes out. Take it. But you can't leave. One of them immediately drops all the shit. Over thinks it's someone playing a prank on them. They hear footsteps fading away. Once they feel slightly safe, they immediately book it. The dude's last memory is seeing the end of the cave. End of story. Everyone tweaking at this point. Holy shit. Guy has no injuries other than a bunch of minor scratches on his hands. Gomez is nowhere to be seen. He kept the gold in his pockets. Other guy goes missing a few days later. Never seen again. It seems silly as fuck, but everyone who lives there, or lived there at the time, swears by it, 
and they all tell it the same. Two thousand and six was like eight or seven, running a really bad fever. Parents don't know what to do. Call nine nine nine. They say put him in a bathtub full of cold water. So they do. Remember just being super cold, and then all of a sudden, like I was burning hot. Instantly go unconscious. There was this pop somewhere in the middle of my brain. I open my eyes. I'm floating about two feet above my body, looking up at the ceiling. Not a ceiling anymore. Hard to describe. I'm looking at some kind of desert. Looks almost like pictures of Mars. Really bleak. Seems to go on forever. Then there's a click and an explosion a little ways away. Watch the smoke and fire for what feels like hours. Then I feel another pop, and I'm back in my body. Parents rush me to A&E, end up having a super bad case of the flu. Years later, in Afghanistan, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Humvee is keeping to a pre-designated path to try and avoid IEDs. We were just in a random spot in the desert, and all of a sudden, I get this terrible feeling. I tell the driver to stop. He does. He asks me what's wrong. I tell him there is a bomb up ahead. They check it out. Sure enough, there's fucking signs of a fresh dig. It's enough that it would have vaporized us. Remember the night in the bathtub? have absolutely no explanation for it. When I was in high school, something really crazy happened to a babysitter in the grade above me. Basically, from what I heard through the grapevine, didn't know the girl personally, a kid died under her watch. That's insane and all, but how it happened is the actual odd ex-related part. This bitch claims that two Large reptile men entered the house late at night and stole the child and beat her up and assaulted her and gave her the works. Obviously, nobody fucking believed her until the kid's bones showed up on some trail in Montana, which is like over 700 miles from where this happened. Found by some hikers, I heard. Charms the kid used to wear were found with the corpse, supposedly, and that's how the parents ID'd the body. This girl offed herself a few years later after this happened. Weird shit. B20 or so. Travel with group of friends to a small backwards town for lols. The bus we're traveling on breaks in the way, and as a result, we arrive into the town very late at night, ten or so. Hard to find a hotel for all of us at that time. Only available option is super expensive. Feeling adventurous, we walk away from the central plaza. Eventually, find a run-down hotel on a dark little street. It's cheap and has room for everyone. It looks as though rats and roaches may pour from the walls if you puncture them. We're tired and still feeling adventurous, so we decide to stay just for that one night. They put us together, three men, two girls, in a medium-sized room. Beds basically wall to wall, without room between. Kind of awkward, but we try to shrug it off. Turn lights off. Lights somewhere along in the hall, and room has windows on the hall side with veil, but not curtain. So the room is dark, but not pitch black. Start hearing children's laughter. Mind you, it's midnight by then, trying not to make much out of it. I'm on my back, but sleep does not come. The room is hot as hell. Ceiling has some black stains of something, barely visible in the dark. Suddenly, the stains start to move 
slowly across the ceiling. They look ethereal, like spots of light from a torch, but as a shadow instead. Super frightened, but I rationalize that my eyes are playing tricks on me with the shadows. I whisper to my friends to look at the ceiling and ask them if they see the moving shadows too. They do see them. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Immediately leave that hotel and spend the rest of the night at the expensive hotel we had first checked. Be closeted guy with a closeted boyfriend. We go out for a date and he drops me off next to a field near where I live. At night, it's completely dark even though it's right next to the highway, so we feel no one will see us. We were closeted and paranoid. He drives off and I start walking home. Walk along a path with the highway to the left of me and the field to the right. Walking down for five minutes, see someone in the field. It kind of paranoid because I don't know if I'm on someone's property or not. Try to get a look at the dude. He's shirtless, back turned to me, bald, pale skin, just standing there. As I walk further down the field, I get a slightly better look at the front of his body. Looks pretty fit. His arms are folded against his chest, Egyptian mummy style. Too dark to see his face, but he doesn't seem to react to the fact that I'm there watching him. Began to realize that this fuckers really fucking tall, like over seven feet, instantly become uncomfortable, walk all the way home, constantly looking behind me. I walk down that path all the time, never seen him before or again. 2009, just graduated high school, going camping with friends to celebrate, camping in an abandoned church house that is. Church itself is spooky, but basically an empty building. It is a very small, formerly Baptist church, which has a reputation around town for being haunted. Typical fair, graffiti, pentagrams, etc. The church house was where it was at. Old, two-story wooden house built in the 20s, connected to the church. Overlooks old graveyard ultimate spoop setting to drop acid. Four of us, all stupid, all very high on acid, wandering around the house with candles. We had flashlights in our pockets, but candles are spookier. It's hitting hard. I'm seeing spirals and fluctuations in the dark. I see a figure. Is it an illusion? No, it's too real. Anyone who has done acid knows that it's not like in the movies. Your perception changes, but you don't see like dragons and full-on hallucinations. Figure walks up to me. It's a black girl who looks my age. She's wearing a dirty nightgown kind of thing. Maybe just a really big men's dress shirt. I don't know. Titties jiggling under the thin fabric. Shit's cash. Stutter out a, hey. Totally confused. Tripping balls. She pulls out one titty. Think that's weird, just one, but okay. She pinches her nip. It starts making a sound, like when you pinch the end of a balloon while the air is coming out. I can fucking feel the breeze of air escaping her titty. Her body deflates and falls on the floor. What the fuck? I'm weirdly not affected. Probably the drugs regroup with friends and don't mention it. Go back and look in the morning. There's a huge pile of hair on the ground where the woman deflated. Never do acid again. One day, I was 11 or 12 at max. I was at a friend's house playing some N64 or some shit. My friend lived in a rural part of town, not far from my home, but basically near crop fields in an old World War II Fort, Europe. Area gets pretty dark at night. It's 8pm and I grab my bike to go home. Decide to cut 
through the crop fields to get home faster. It's winter, so it's pretty dark outside. I'm riding through the field, and I spot a faint light in the dark. Clearly a cigarette. As I approach, I see it's a man walking, so I say out loud, Hey, give road. Watch out. As I pass near the man, he grabs me and stops me, gets pretty close, and says something I can clearly recall. Something like, Hey, where are you going, huh? I'm scared shitless. I think that's it. I'm fucked. I'm gonna die. The man changes expression as he looks at me, says something like, Oh, sorry. I thought you were someone else and leaves me. I bolt away as fast as I can, and while I run away with my bike, he screams something at me. To this day, I think what could have happened if I were a girl. I always thought the guy thought I was a girl because of my high-pitched kid voice, and immobilized me to assault me, but then took a closer look and saw I was just a scrawny and scared little boy. Recalling this today makes me really sick. B25. Living alone in a kind of shitty house in a bad neighborhood because I can't afford anything better and won't live with roommates. Wake up close to 4am. Hear a woman screaming outside. Look out my window. See nothing. The screaming quiets. Hear the faint sound of wood scraping across pavement. Think some girl is getting assaulted out there. Grab a golf club. I keep in my room for protection. And a flashlight. Go outside. Anybody out here? Walk around backyard. See nothing. Still hear the faint noise of wood scraping. Walk back to the front yard. See something in the shadows near my neighbor's patio. Shine my light on it. What the fuck? It's a nude, black woman's torso with freakishly long arms facing away from me. Long, dirty hair, about four feet tall. Look down. Her lower body is some kind of flat, bottomed wooden thing, like she has a boat for legs. She turns her head toward me. Her eyes are empty sockets. She has no nose. Run the fuck back inside. Hear her scream at me. It's so shrill. Call the cops. Tell them there's a crazy woman outside my neighbor's house. Leave out the part about her having a boat thing for legs. Dispatcher man tells me the cops will be there to investigate. They never show up because it's a bad part of town and they have better things to do. Stay up all night with golf club in hand, wishing I owned a gun. Hear wooden scraping for about an hour later. It stops close to dawn. Ask neighbor about it the next day. He gets really anxious and sweaty and denies knowing what I'm talking about. There's no fucking way he didn't see it. I think maybe he saw it too, but was too freaked out and he doesn't want to believe it. Be me, 14 years old. Grandfather owns a massive ranch in down southern Utah, passed down from his father or something. One day, family decides to spend a week there. Hype as fuck, because I loved outdoor shit, and I get to see my cousins again. Fast forward to the trip. Have a huge dinner with everyone. End up sleeping in the barn loft with cousins. Furnished room, but still kind of strange. Something just felt off with it. Only has two windows. One on each end, looking out towards the ranch house, and the other facing the open desert. First few days are great. Ride four-wheelers and shoot guns and shit. One day, the four of us ride off to an area on the property called The Flats by my cousins. Literal flat desert for as far as the eye could see. Sparse vegetation dotted the landscape. While dicking around, we find an old, single-roomed, burnt-out cabin. A couple of us wanted to go inside, 
but the oldest says no because it looks unsafe and could fall apart at any minute. It was already kind of dark, so we decided to head back. It starts getting darker faster than we expected. The oldest decides we cut straight through the brush to get back quicker because when it gets dark, it gets dark out there. While trailblazing, we come across a small clearing. Tiny ass clearing, maybe 15 meters in diameter. Sun is almost under the horizon and you can barely make out anything. That's when we see it. You can only make out the shapes through the headlights. This small clearing has bones scattered all around it. Mental, wow, that's weird. Eventually, find our way back to the house. Parents are pissed. Parents go with grandma off into town to pick up food and leave us with our grandpa. While sitting outdoors that night, roasting marshmallows, we start telling him what happened. Apparently, the burnt cabin was there on the property when his father bought it. One of my cousins asked him about the boneyard. What boneyard? He asked. I explained to him that we saw animal skulls and bones lying around in the spot. That's weird, he said. I'll check it out with your father tomorrow. His response wasn't reassuring, and I was still creeped out from the whole thing. Lying in bed, listening to the wind fly past the barn. Movement catches my eye in the window. There's a cat sitting on the windowsill, staring into the loft. How the fuck did that get up there? Turn over and go to sleep. Wake up in the morning and the yard gets checked out. Grandpa finds his horse's bones in the clearing. Apparently, my grandfather's horses kept disappearing a few years back and he sold the rest out of frustration. Grandpa, furious, calls the sheriff and they say they'll be over when they can. Bored, so I take a walk with one of my cousins and we were a good distance from everyone else. Casually chatting when we hear a noise like a safety whistle being blown. We stop and there is dead silence. No insects, nothing. Wait a few seconds and hear it again. A short, high-pitched tweet from an emergency whistle. I want to go investigate, but cousin tells me that we are the only ones on the property and the neighbors are all way too old to be out here. I insist, but he just says, no, no, we are going back. Head back to grandpa and dad in the clearing. Sheriff said it was some animal. Grandpa calls bullshit, but they can't do anything about it and just tells us to stay on watch for anything else. Tomorrow is the last day. Spend the rest of the day with cousins and we go back to sleep that night. Fucking cat is watching me again. That was almost 11 years ago and I still remember it vividly. Probably not as spooky as some of the other stories, but was still very unnerving. This. This creeps me the fuck out, and I don't even know why. Something about the nature of just accidentally discovering this fucks with me. Was it a murder? Was the poor bastard sealed in alive? In the summer of 1943, American soldiers were clearing a blitz site at the back of the Methodist Church on Boundary Street East in Liverpool. An American bulldozer uncovered the cylinder while it was clearing building debris. One end of the cylinder was capped with a steel plate and the other was open. The bulldozer moved the cylinder and during the operation, it unintentionally crushed the open end. Building contractors then extracted the cylinder from the building rubble and laid it level. After the summer of 1943, the cylinder went largely unnoticed. A local witness Norman Garner of 278 Great Homer Street stated that he had seen people use the cylinder as a seat and children often played with it. About two weeks prior to the discovery of the body, witnesses saw children 
rolling the cylinder across from some wasteland in Great Homer Street to Claudia Street. On the 13th of July, 1945, three small boys were playing with the cylinder. They were rolling it through the streets when one tried to see what was inside. At first, they saw what appeared to be a shoe. However, on closer inspection, it appeared to be part of a human skeleton. The police were called to the scene, and they used an oxyacetylene burner to cut the cylinder open. The contents were revealed to be a complete human skeleton, accompanied by a number of atoms. Cylinder since 1885 or 1890. Conditions in the cylinder indicated that the body had undergone normal decomposition. Okay X, I need to know if anyone is aware of anything that tries to lure you away or tempt you with gifts that I should be aware of. This all just feels weird. I hope I can explain it. Be me. Grew up in rural New England. Moved away for a bit, but moved back before the pandemic. Lucky me too, because I was in LA. I dodged that situation. Moved to a part of New England I was only semi-familiar with. Used to party around here when I was in college, because it was a small, shitty, rural ones in the middle of nowhere. Live at my current place for at least four years now. Unfortunate happens and I am basically stuck in my apartment, basically only leaving to walk the dog. This gets extended because my wife has surgery and I am basically a house husband for her recovery. We were able to swing that because of the nature of her job and its generous LOA policy. Shit yeah, only have to cook, clean, and get to play with ya. Not going to lie, made me a little stupid for a while. Was also smoking pot because bored and trapped, so I had to escape inward. Start quitting all of that. Go for more walks with my dog. Small terrier mix. Raised in the city, so a complete dumb fuck when it comes to nature, but he loves it. He also never became car smart. Start developing a routine with him. On one of our walks around our apartment complex, I see a bottle. Inner poor guy comes out. I pick up bottles for the five cents. This is something my grandfather instilled in me from a young age. He grew up turbo poor. He graduated high school in the 1910s and was almost disowned by my great grandmother for buying a car for $100. It got him in my grandmother's pants. I am here partially because of that car. Anyway, pick up bottle and continue walk with dog. Have to wash my hands because he has already shit and I have picked it up. Responsible, that JPEG. Get back and put it with my returnable. Think nothing of it. Not a week later, be another one of our routine walks. See a sixer of beer spread out. Shit yeah. My car was parked near it and already had a bag of bottles slated to get returned. Easily put them in my car and continue the walk. We next day see another one of the same brand, in the same area, but deeper into the bushes. That makes seven, and I picked up the cardboard holder. Got unnerved by it for some reason. Think it could be a hobo spot. Ignore the bottle and finish my walk. I can see the spot from my apartment and I didn't see anyone pick it up, but the bottle is no longer there, 20-ish minutes after I get back. Still weirded out by it, and I do not know why. Fast forward a couple of months. Still a house husband, because my wife can't stand for long, because of her surgery, and she cannot drive. I am still a slave to her schedule, and have a different routine. Start taking dog to a couple nature paths around the area, after dropping wife off at her job. Dog loves the woods the most. There is one sanctuary place that has a lot of varied terrain, wide open marsh areas, and also some wooded areas. Some of it is easy, but it tires out my dog because he is an old man now. We have had him for 10 years, and he has a bit of arthritis. Getting old sucks. 
The places we walk are pretty well traveled. See a soda bottle on the side of the trail. Have kind of forgotten about the sixer and its seventh. Pick it up and take the five cents. Next time I go there, we head down a different path, and there are now two bottles of the same soda. One is on the side of the trail, and the other one is a bit further into the woods. Feel weird about it. I do not feel like I am being watched at least, so that is a plus. The sanctuary is still kind of close to the highway, so I can hear cars faintly. Notice that I can hear birds, but they are all far away, like across the marsh and in the other sections of the woods. Noped out and went back to the regular path. A week or two later, my wife is making progress and can go for walks. We take the dog to the sanctuary because of the flat areas. She gets eaten alive usually, and the bugs are not out in that part, and it is good for her rehab. See the same kind of soda bottle sitting in the middle of the trail. It's there like it was placed. It's not laying on its side, and it did not have any liquid in it, so it should have bounced on the hard packed gravel of the trail. We take it, because she is eco-minded, and my poor sensibilities. Nothing was weird about this one, but it was standing up. Next workday, the dog and I go back into the same area, and I feel like I am in that dead bubble zone again. Sounds penetrate it, but there is no life in the small area. Dog never hits on anything, but like I said, he is a dumb fuck, and terriers are pretty stubborn, so even if he did, he might just plow through. This time, the same soda type is off from the trail, by like 10 feet. We leave. Stop going for a week and go back to taking the long walks around the apartment complex. The grass has not been mowed because it is mud season. New England has five seasons. Spring, summer, fall, winter, and mud. Go to pick up the dog's morning dump. Kick something. Small metal can. Cool. Must have been a kid that was waiting around for the school bus. School was not out yet. Next day, take the dog down to a different area. Usually don't go that way, because there is a lot of undergrowth and ticks are nasty. In the middle of the path, there is an old, and I mean old, glass bottle. It has been dug up. There are some clumps of dirt in it and stuck to it. Dog wants to keep going down that path. I free 60 and moonwalk away. This one felt scary for some reason. I was still in view of the apartments, but this was near a bend and was placed there intentionally. This brings us to this morning. Be me. Be today. Out for a walk around the apartment. Do our big loop around the small park here. On our way back, when we approach a big dead tree that is near the side of the road. Call the tree a squirrel hotel because a colony of squirrels has basically hollowed it out. Poor tree. Tree is right next to the road. One of the hollowed branches had fallen into the road in the past because the squirrels so super close. Duck hits on something. Again, he is old and stubborn, so when he suddenly goes after something, it is slightly surprising. Runs around the side of the tree, and just as I yank him back, a jeep comes flying down the road from behind us. I am pretty aware, and I usually hear the electric cars that live around me coming. It's also pretty quiet around here. If I had not yanked Dog back, he would have been made into street pizza. I do not see a squirrel or a chipmunk. Not at the tree, or up it, or even across the road. I see something shiny. It was what my dog was running at. It was a newer, clear glass bottle. No label. Just like the dug-up one. Obviously do not pick it up. Just to add, the road near us is not traveled often unless it is by people that live here or work at an office place in the back. But this was after they were at work. I did not recognize the Jeep. And like I said, I have been a house husband for a while and I have gotten to know other schedules. So am I getting gifts, or are traps being laid for me? Are there any entities out there that do stuff like this? I know the Fae try to lure kids away, but I am in my 30s, 
There is no mistaking me for a child. Both your dog and the local bum have you trained to pick up their shit, and they are both laughing at you. My apartment and the places I walk are a ways away from each other, so this bum would have to know what my mood is before I do, get to where I'm going before I do, and I am driving and set things up. Yes, that little fuzzy dink has me trained. With my very limited knowledge of X entities, I can only give my general impression. This setup is most likely a trap. I can't tell you what laid it, but it's obvious that it's trying to harm you. If it was really nice, why not just give you money rather than five cent bottles? The answer is the same reason you give breadcrumbs rather than chucking the loaf. Now we can argue that maybe it feeds on your negative emotions. Could be why it targeted you after your wife's surgery. So perhaps it doesn't want to kill you, but would be fine with killing your dog to hurt you emotionally. You explained that only your dog would have been harmed from the jeep had you not intervened. This could be a tell for its motivations. Now, why it only uses bottles or why this little psyop only worked on your dog, oddly enough I cannot say. Regardless, I try taking a different route to see what happens. Perhaps it's a localized anomaly. Also, as an aside, you mentioned that you haven't seen that jeep before, which could show that this anomaly or entity has the ability to manifest objects with LOA similarly to how humans can, who is just really good at predicating the future. Don't have to be a kid to be lured away into another world, unless I miss something. The only trap is that the jeep almost killed your dog. Faye will lure anyone. Some spooky OP. Good green text. Well, he mentioned that this one felt scary for some reason. In reference to another bottle that his dog was lured to, much like with the jeep. I'd say he just avoided the other traps, not that there weren't any others. I'm sorry if I was not making it clear. The old glass bottle was on a way we never, ever go because of the ticks. The can that was involved with the jeep was a normal route, and we had walked that way setting out, and I did not see anything there. The side of the tree it was on was the way I was facing, starting our walk. The bushes I found the original sixer, it was Heineken, was on the same road as the tree, but in the opposite direction. Those were all in different directions around the apartment complex. The times in the sanctuary have never been in the same spot, but in this one area, that is like an island in the marsh. The marsh is kind of man-made. It's a filling in a canal from way back when. I do not know the approximate date. There are some small bridges that connect the hard-packed side of the canal, where mules used to pull the barges and the natural landforms. Yes, that was the only one where something happened. Each other time that I have come upon something that felt off, I noped out. I grew up almost 100 miles north of here, and used to go ice fishing way up on Moosehead Lake. I have been miles from other people in the woods, but have not felt things like this. I am not claiming to be an outdoorsman, just grew up in the middle of nowhere. I'd say that you avoided the other traps, whatever they may have been. Unless you're just a nervous type, your spidey senses may have saved your ass. Well, at this point, it seems obvious that to test things, you would need to behave differently. Stop picking up the trash. Yeah, adding on to this, I'd say that you really need to do some experiments. Get a notebook, or just open your notes app, anything to write and just try out some things to see what happens. Observe the properties of the bottle. Notice patterns. Maybe walk yourself and leave your dog. Get a cat and see what happens, etc. Okay, you're definitely in some kind of shit. Whatever this thing is, try to kill your dog. It could just be some bored crazy guy seriously fucking with you. I know that sounds far-fetched, but there are people that will do that. He could have laid bottles all around, and not just that area. Maybe you're not the only one he's fucking with. For now, I'd say it's a malicious spirit. The dead bubble zone thing is hard to pull off. Reminds me of skinwalker stuff. I agree with the other non. Take notes, picks, do things differently, experiment, etc. I am the bottle anon that posted yesterday. Pick related. I said that I would be back tonight to answer any questions. The old thread was just archived if you are interested.
I am a man of my word, for I have not much else. I also made another potential connection. I only made this today because I was driving on the same place. Be me. Be Monday the 29th. Made plans to see my family, because long weekend. Have a long drive to get there. Wife delays me by about 20 minutes. I have to drive about 20 minutes out of my way to get gas. I have a club card, and it is about 30 cents cheaper. I said my grandfather was raised poor during the Depression, and that aspect of him must run in my blood. Also why I was picking up the bottles. The amount of time I am delayed by has me run into a pretty bad accident. Didn't know it at the time, but too dead. Little old lady drove the wrong way down the highway. Not good. I hit the traffic and come to a standstill a mile or so from the exit. The news say that I can get off at. Sit there for over an hour in total. Think about getting out of the car. Right on the side of the road. A bright, shiny bottle. Glass. Did not think much of it, but the urge to get out of the car to stretch my legs during this whole time fades. I had also thought of something. The score of the Sixer. The beer bottles had a food wrapper near them. This one was obviously a homeless guy. I did not pick up the wrapper. Could I be tempted by perceived greed? When I was in the silence bubble, I did say I was levitating out loud and going back the way I came, and it seemed to dissipate, or the sound was less deadened. I can repose my green text from last night, in the thread if desired. OP going to sign off. I will be keeping a notebook and check in in a week or so if anything happens. I have a notebook that I can take with me and use. I mentioned that I had two instances that could have been paranormal in my childhood house. I will tell them for the record and then go to bed. Be me. Be between the ages of four and eight. Be laying in bed in my room. My room is an L-shape with a chunk missing out of the heel. Each of the outer parts of the L have two windows. I am looking from by the bed at the closet and combination table tennis, air hockey, and foosball table with the two windows that face the street at my back. The other two windows that face the driveway have very little light coming in from them compared to the ones at my back. I can only see the shadowy outlines of the table and bookshelf that is over on that side of my room. Pick related. Had a red trash can made of plastic. I think it was a Sesame Street thing or something. It was filled with magnetic backed plastic letters that I would spell things with on the fridge. Outgrew that, but I have a sister that is four years younger than me. So I think that is why we kept it. I see the can. Suddenly it gets hit. There was nothing around it and I know it was hit by something because it made an audible sound of being hit. It doesn't just fall off the game table. It goes up. It tumbles over itself in the air and crashes to the hardwood floor. The top flies off from the impact and the letters all spill out. Hide under my covers until the morning. I did that thing where I don't know how I fell asleep while being terrified, but it happened. I was a kid. This did not wake up my sister or my parents. No idea why. I cleaned it up in the morning and saw that there was nothing that could have hit it or made the sound of it being hit on that table. Stop looking at my table and my closet and sleep facing the wall with the windows. Even move my bed as close as possible. Other instance inside my childhood home to bump the spread for people that have asked questions. Be me. Be 2000, I think. I was in the seventh grade. I lived over just a mile from the junior high slash high school. They were connected. It is spring, so it's not that cold. All the snow has melted by now. Heavy rains, though. My mother works in the grade school with my sister, and they get out an hour after I do. Not staying around. Plus, I have friends that would call me a pussy if I didn't walk home with them. Get home, drenched. Have a dog, a black lab. Get greeted at the door. There is nothing like being welcomed home by your dog. The heavy rain is turning more into a storm. Made it home just in time. 
I hear the door to my sister's and my room opening and closing. Think it could be the wind. It is howling. Dog does not look phased, but is also not looking up the stairs. House was old, too. Pick related. The original wiring, approximately. The door then sounds like it is vibrating back and forth as it shuts. It makes a sound I have a hard time describing. It was like the moan of a creaky door, but I could hear the door shaking back and forth as it was swinging shut. It sounded almost like a creepy autotune before autotuning was widely known about. I can only picture the door acting like a tuning fork, but I did not hear them slam into each other or the wall. They then slam shut. Both doors. The kitchen table was kind of a catch-all. Clean laundry was there waiting to be put away. Papers, bills, and my sister's hockey stick. I grabbed that and my dog. I have to lead him by the collar to the stairs. I also have to verbally coax him up. He's not fighting me hard, but does not want to go up there. He never disliked going upstairs before this or after. We make it up the stairs and both doors are closed. I open my sister's first because you can see the whole room. Like I said in the explanation of the red trash can event, my room wraps back because of the L shape it is in. No one in there. My dog immediately headed downstairs when I let go of his collar to open the door. Thanks a lot. Check her windows. All have the winter storm glass still in them, and they are all shut and locked. These were also old windows. They had counterweights attached to them, in the walls, to keep them from shutting. Pick again related. I then go to check my room. Same as sisters. Empty. All the windows were still set up for winter and locked. I do not know much about the history of the house beyond it being old. We found newspaper clippings from the 20s or 30s, and some toys in one of the walls when we did some renovations in the dining room in the 90s. My father grew up one street over. He is a globetrotter, if you couldn't tell, and the only thing he could remember about our house is that a fat girl lived there when he was in high school. Her nickname was Blip Blip. I talked to my mother this weekend. She told me of a dream she thought was real when I was home from college. Be me. Be home from college for the summer. During this time, I would go out to my friend's house every Wednesday to play D&D. 3.5 Master Race. Would leave around noon and not come back until 2am. Surprisingly, was straight-edged and was just a fucking goof with no talent. Think the guys that could recite Monty Python, but I would only be able to get the first couple words from any quote before stumbling still stands. Be me, out at the house, around midnight. Be my mother. Every now and then, get creepy feelings, and has to call her son to make sure he was not dead. He is a dumbass after all. Wake up hazy. See shadow of sun in her doorway. Doorway faces the stairs to go to the second floor. Think sun is home. Go back to sleep. Be me again. Come home buzzed off dice rolls, pizza, mushroom jalapeno, and pepperoni, salt and vinegar chips, and two two liters of soda. Disgust. PNG. Fuck it. It's almost 3 a.m. Try to quietly go up the stairs. They are creepy as fuck, but I have half gotten the hang of knowing what steps would creak the loudest. Key is to step as close to the wall as I can. Still make noise. Here are my mother. Anon, did you have to go to the bathroom? The bathroom is at the base of the stairs. Basically, there is a little square that has the bathroom in front of it. Parents room to the left and stairs to the right. No, I just got home. You just got home? Yeah. I didn't try to lie because I would have been in trouble for lying more so than getting home two hours before my father goes to work. Oh, don't come in so late. Okay. I remember at least two or three conversations like that, but I did not know she thought she had seen me home already. I pressed her, and there was only one time she remembers 
thinking she saw me home already. OP here. Notes from yesterday. Time, 8.02. Weather, raining. Mood, tired. Dog with me. Dog, mood. Apprehensive, and visibly shaking. So, normal. He hates car rides. First car we were in was a rental that blew a tire. Only my years of bombing black roads with black ice give me the skill to not cause an accident. He puked. Understandable. Starting point was different. Start at the falls because it is raining, and there is tree cover there from the beginning. It started out pleasant. Saw a woman with a lab mix of some sort. Very common here. Said good morning and told her I was having a wonderful day, when she asked and wished her the same. Her face lit up. Good deed for the day. Walk on the white marked trail that I usually walk, but this is the other end. Take a branching path. Pink. Did not see another person on this trail. No birds on this one, but I did not feel the silence bubble on this trail. For the record, the silence bubble is a dark blue. Halfway through the pink trail, it feels like the dark blue to the point where I thought I had spaced out and walked further. Dog does not care. Just likes being in the woods, for him. Pink loops back to white. Head back to car. On the way out, near the falls, see some broken glass that looks pressed into the dirt. Kind of regular to me. Childhood house had some washout from an old dumping site, so I would see glass and marbles and the like often. See the pie plate, or whatever that glass dish was. It was at the end of the bottle glass, and was kind of at the top of the slope I was walking up. It just looks weird, because the top is clean, but the bottom is muddy. Total walking time was about 35 to 40 minutes. I had some health issues, and my aunt is a believer in crystals. I have this chunk of amber that is pretty big for me. My sister picked out a bunch of crystals from her at random, mostly dealt with health apparently. I was told the amber was more for monetary gain. I keep this in a window, because it is pretty, and there was some BS about it having to charge. I occasionally pick it up because Jurassic Park really got to me when I was a kid. Possibility? I think I will take it on my next walk to see if it helps. I am trying to do whatever experiments I can think of. I have gone from different approaches, and in weather I would not usually go out in. Also, there was a weird thing with my dog after we went to the falls yesterday. He got all muddy, and he usually hates water, but the little fuzzy dink will charge right through puddles. Anyway, he let me give him a bath and did not fight me or tried to jump out. This was not a long walk for us, and he was decently not tired. It was slightly odd. I mentioned it to my wife, and she did not believe me at first, but I do not lie to her, and she eventually was happy about it. She knew he had to have gotten muddy, and the fact our furniture was not covered in mud could have added to that. Pick related, with a tape measure. I think I could carry one around for scale with my notebook. I had to sleep. I did have a dream. I am not someone who dreams. I just woke up at 5.50, and it's about 6.30 now, so it is still fresh. Pick up crab thing. It doesn't have claws, only legs. B in car's driver's seat. It was not mine, but looked familiar. Remove a chunk from the top of this creature. It's still alive. Flip it over. Push four pins into it like a square. It is still alive. Take the pins out and stab them in again. Thing is wriggling. Still alive. Woman, think it was wife, wants to look. Start feeling bad and ask her to kill it for me because I am pussying out. Thing starts growing a neck and a head like a turtle. It is a soft, fleshy tub. Eyes kind of look primitive, but also like that newt newt penguin. Have I mentioned I'm stupid? The neck extends until it is halfway up my body and turns around. Mouth looks like one of those sucking fish, tubular, and constantly sucking in and out. The thing is between my legs and raising its neck at me, freaking out in the dream. It then shoots a tongue out at me that lands on my right forearm. It is sticky. It's also kind of segmented. 
It then sprouts legs like a centipede. Wake up with a start. At least I am dreaming again, I guess. <laughs>